audio test. Please stand by. I want to go to the other one. Yeah. Call, please. What is it, Peter? Stand by.
Good morning. Well, I, I must say our registration this year was 100% less painful. Uh, let's give it a round for our uh, volunteers. All right, so uh, this is the clown car of conferences. Oh, I can't even see the graphic. There's totally a clown car there, but. You'll have to use your imagination. Um, so we're trying to pack in as much as we can, um, as usual. So we, this is a two plus one conference. We did workshops yesterday for our elite members. Um, I think we had like five uh, workshops hands-on. Looked really fun. Um, and then we have got two days. And in this two days, we have 51 talks. Now that is sort of uh, created a lot of pain, <laughs> to be honest. But we really wanted to give our community the opportunity to speak and share that knowledge. Um, and uh, you know we fit, fit in literally as much as we could and as much as many people as well. Um, uh, in total, we do have a couple other workshops uh, happening on Tuesday. I think there might be a couple slots available, so it'll be um, first come, first serve to fill those if you hadn't reserved. Uh, but there's one on security architecture uh, hosted by our AV extraordinaire, George Bajari. Give him a round of applause for doing the AV. <laughs> And we've got one, note two, no three, capture the flags. So we've got uh, uh, a red team, one that's uh, run by us, uh, that's you know very offensive, uh, hands-on. Uh, we brought some guys out from Ottawa that uh, do the IoT Village, so lots of hands-on hacking there. And then if you're looking um, for something really outside of the box, the open source intelligence gathering uh, capture flag, which is just around the corner, uh, is to help find real missing people. So uh, if that's something of interest to you, get your hands dirty and start using some of those open source intelligence gathering tools. Um, as well, we also are hosting um, Women at B-Sides, hosted by the Isaka She Leads Tech uh, chapter. So that's gonna be a panel uh, at lunchtime today um, at the, I think the bottom half of the lunch. So if you're interested in being a part of that conversation, please drop by. Um, we do have an after party tonight. Uh, pass a couple details. We did notice that um, the spam gods are angry around this time of year and we're, we're struggling getting emails out to everyone. Eventbrite was really failing us here, but uh, we'll share some more information. Um, and we have a job board, so if you're looking for work, the, there's uh, several sponsors that have posted job postings up there, so be sure to uh, check that out. So a little bit about our community. Um, okay, we can see that image. We've got people from all over North America, and we actually have a speaker all the way from Israel that's uh, speaking, uh, I think, tomorrow, which is really cool. It really shows that people from around the world are coming to Vancouver, um, and uh, we're teasing them with the fake, fake weather that we usually <laughs> don't get. Uh, yeah, really excited about that. Um, so yeah, we have 567 plus uh, uh, registered attendees. There's a plus there because people don't read email and we've had some registration gaps there, but um, hopefully we'll keep it under 600. Um, and 17% of them are women, which I think is awesome. It's some, a number that we've been working very hard to keep raising uh, within our community and, and I'm really happy to see that. And uh, we have over 50, uh, volunteers and board members that have really helped put this thing together. Um, so we'll, we'll thank them in the closing ceremonies more so. Let's make sure they actually do a good job. But um, yeah, we couldn't do it without them. So uh, some housekeeping, uh, some information and schedules we're trying to keep as, um, you know, as eco as possible so we're not printing uh, too much stuff. Uh, there's signs everywhere um, on scheduling and details like that. However, uh, BesidesVancouver.com has a day of button Click on that. All the scheduled details are on there for you, CTF details, et cetera, et cetera. And um, if you are struggling, um, uh, add us on Twitter because the Twitter guy is uh, eager to help you. It's our tech support system. Uh, space is going to be pretty limited. I'm really happy to see this room is really filled out and there's only the popular seats that are empty right now. Um, but uh, day two, we lose one of the big rooms, so it will be a little bit more cramped. Now, our strategy is to have a bit of an open bar at our after party so that people don't show up super early tomorrow. We'll see how that strategy works. 
Um, and uh, if you can't get in a room, you know, we're not trying to be um, as DEF con -y, uh, but tomorrow will be a little bit rammed. Uh, but we do, we do stream these talks, so if you don't, there's plenty of uh, lounges all around this facility to hang out. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, CTFs, again, the open source one is down this hallway, and then the red team and uh, the IoT Village, and actually RFID, um, uh, uh, RFID hacking is upstairs one floor. It's, uh, they, they've actually set it up, it looks really cool in there. Um, uh, there is Wi-Fi. Um, there's signs everywhere to get on that. Please be kind to our Wi-Fi. Uh, we are streaming, and uh, congesting the pipes will only affect everyone outside of our conference. Um, so we have lunch. Uh, we're not catering this year because a lot of you were had a little bit of a problem with the hamburger sashimi sandwiches that we had last year. Um, so we've decided not to cater. Um, there is a food court two escalators down. Lots of options, and if you're an elite ticket holder, you got um, uh, food vouchers. Um, they, uh, if you were attending the workshop and picked up all your stuff, you didn't end up picking up the vouchers. That's our fault. Uh, so please come and see uh, the front desk to collect your vouchers. Uh, it's only for elite uh, badge holders and uh, and whatnot. Uh, let's see what else here. Tons of chill lounges from a safety and security perspective. There's fire exits everywhere. Uh, be familiar with them. There's a security desk if there's any concerns, and we have um, a reporting tool on our uh, code of conduct uh, page if there's any concerns. Um, but you'll see lots of volunteers with the volunteer uh, shirt. If you have any problems, come see them right away. All right, so from a CTF perspective, pretty much went over that. So if you want to break things, go upstairs, and if you want to save and find people, go over there. And the after party details. So again, we had some issues sharing the details, but we are uh, about 100% closer our venue this year than last year. We don't have to bus people. Um, but it does require either a, a quick taxi ride, a quick Uber ride, just kidding. Um, but you can actually take a train right here, uh, and it's like three or four stops to the Main Street. Uh, Main Street, okay. And then it's about a five minute walk from there. Uh, big warehouse, gonna have some DJs, food, a um, uh, happy hour uh, sponsored by Checkmark uh, and uh, some entertainment. So definitely uh, show up there. And then this would not, this event would not be possible with, without our community attending, but also all our sponsors that have been able to support us financially and make this event happen. So please come and see their booths, talk to them, let them scan you and, and, and tell you all about their newest products. Um, they are important to the success of these uh, uh, events, and we wouldn't be able to do it without them. And uh, I guess that's really about it. So, you know, without further ado, let's give a warm uh, round of applause to Rob Fry, who is our keynote. There you go. Sure. Give me just a second here while I pull up my slide. Good morning, B-Sides Vancouver. Um, I've been to quite a few B-Sides before. I have to say this is probably the most impressive one I've seen yet. Uh, definitely thank an organizer uh, if you see them today. It is, I, I've been an organizer at a conference before as a volunteer. It is not easy uh, to get 600 people to Vancouver to do something like this is really hard. So uh, with that, we're going to talk about security as a video game today. Uh, my name is uh, Rob Fry. I'm currently the VP of Engineering at JASC. Um, if you look me up out in the public sphere, I've done kind of a few different things. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look me up, well, most of my work, most of the relevant stuff that you guys will care about, uh, it's primarily around Netflix, that's why it's the biggest one up there. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the different things that I did, I'm just going to get straight to the presentation since we're running short on time. If you want to stop by and ask me some questions about anything up here, definitely feel free. So the agenda, today we're going to kind of go over where this presentation started from. This is like a five-year thing that I've been living through uh, that you guys all get to experience with me now. Um, we'll jump into challenges in security. There's a lot of them. And then we'll do uh, you know, video games. Uh, I, I think we probably have a few video game players in here. I've got data actually to prove that. We'll talk about security and video games. And then we'll talk about some design principles. 
So most of you have actually never seen me present before. Every time I present, I always have a disclaimer slide. I work on a lot of stuff that's kind of like out there. Um, you know, like 10 years ago, I was telling everybody to go to public cloud and people were telling me I was crazy. Ha ha, I was right. Um, but I put a disclaimer slide inside of here because a lot of the stuff I work on is still in progress. There's still studies, there's still research that's still happening. So if some of the things that I say that are based off of current theories that we have and you see me six months or 12 months or whatever from now, and you're just like, well, you said, and I'm like, I got a disclaimer slide, so there. <laughs> All right, so let's visualize this. Um, a lot of problems in security, a lot of challenges in security. What I want you to visualize is what is it that we're actually doing, all right? Now I want you to think about data. Think about how much data we have. Think about the challenges we have with data, all right? I don't care if you're an InfoSec, NetSec, CloudSec, whatever it is that you, you have a, a, a problem with the data. This is where like one of these things kind of kicked off with me. Um, but the problem as it relates to this I don't know if this speaks well of me or not, but most of my conversations either start up or end up at a bar. And so this one starts at a bar. It's about five years ago, I was at an ISSA conference. And at an ISSA conference, you know, the first night, kind of like last night, we had a speaker's dinner, drinks, and we're sitting around the bar and we're talking. And that's, that's kind of where this starts. You know, like what are the challenges? And really what it came down to was two statements and one question. All right, two statements, one question. I'm going to pivot now and I'm going to talk about startups because at the time while I was working uh, both at Yahoo and Netflix, I, I, I do a lot of work with startups, um, invested in them, bought them, helped them get funded, like just all sorts of stuff. And if you go back about five or six years, that was kind of the start. Big data was already a thing and now startups were trying to start to tackle it all sorts of different ways. And I'm not going to use all the buzzwordy things that you guys all hate and I hate too, but data was always a problem. The reason I like working with startups on data is that startups are the most innovative when it comes to these types of things. If you try and go to a big company, a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company around innovation when it comes to these things, they're not necessarily always the best at this. Usually the best at this are the startups. And during my time with them, I got access to some really smart people. And it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, what type of people go to startups? Well, first, they're crazy. And two, they're usually really smart. That mountain of data, this is the challenge, right? Every one of you right now sees this. I don't care if it's Elasticsearch or Splunk or your SIM or your antivirus. If you go back to about 2011, 2011 before that, there weren't APIs in security, right? This is a really kind of a critical thing. Before that, what, what were you actually looking at, right? You were pro, you, it was the security trust model. You know, I got this, trust me. I'm a vendor now, so don't hate me, but like, I actually hated that because they would give you alerts and you couldn't see the data that was behind that to actually understand why that alert came. Now you fast forward to where we're at today and every vendor has an API and you have access to all the raw data. You expect it. Would you ever buy a product that doesn't have that anymore, right? But at the same time, it created this big problem that we have. And so as I'm working with these really smart people, I, I heard this term, I never heard of it before, right? So I'm a back-end type of software engineer, not necessarily front-end. I've done some front-end stuff, but it's not pretty. And I heard this term called design principles. And basically what it states is that when you're trying to display certain types of data in a certain type of way, there's a certain type of way that you do it. And there's entire courses on this, right, like they teach them. And most of these people, they go off to where? Hollywood, financial services, and video games. That led me, after I'm talking to these people, to something called um, cognitive psychology. And if you don't know what that means, I didn't either at the time. It's basically an understanding of how we learn, All right? So if I display something to you, and we'll go through some examples on this, it's, it's really an understanding of how you, and when I say you, I mean everybody, of how you learn. Because there's a lot of repetitive patterns in this, especially from a cognitive learning type of way. And then that led me to universities. You know who does a lot of cognitive psychology? Universities. And so I, I started meeting PhDs, so we've got startups, we've got big data, but I went to them to understand more about cognitive psychology. What was really interesting is that when you start talking to them, what were they using? They were using VR in order to be able to sit down with students and all sorts of, of you know, research lab rats 
and they were using virtual reality. Now, what was interesting about this? Virtual reality, how new is that, right? Pretty relatively new. Anybody play virtual reality video games? Anybody? They kind of suck right now, you know why? Because their design principles suck. They haven't figured out what the, the right design principles are for video games, but for cognitive learning, it was really great because you could put people inside of virtual environments and trick their mind into thinking that it was real and learn how it is that they react to certain stimuli whether it was colors or shapes or repetition or all these different types of things. And so now let's kind of think about security, right? Let's start thinking about what we've been doing, right? A lot of bar charts, a lot of pie charts, a lot of line charts. When you're looking at a massive amount of data, is that really helpful? Well, it, if, you're, if you're a manager, you probably like to look at what your team's doing, but that's not my point. Um, that led to search. So everybody here does search. And most of my conversation isn't about the search aspect of data. To me, that's a use case around you know. It's something that, you know, that's like known and unknown, right? If I know something, if I get a, I, an indicator from wherever, I go search and go find it, right? Search is a really great use case. What I'm talking about is more of like learning and the unknown. How do you find uh, unknown? And typically what we do when we go and we do search, what is, comes back at rows and columns? Um, I'm a hater of rows and columns, by the way. There's a good use case for it, but if I do a search and I come back with 100,000, 10,000, even 1,000 lines, right? How useful is that to me, right? I see some people shaking their heads like, no, nah, man, I hate that. I hate having to freaking like filter and, and reorganize and all this different types of stuff in columns and rows. Do I really need to talk about this one? All right, we'll just let that one die. But you know you looked at it back in the day when it came out. You know you did. Um, so ultimately, after, you know, most of these interactions I had stopped after I joined uh, my, my most current startup. Uh, but I ended up touching each one of these organizations. And it was a lot of fun to kind of see how each one approached the problem. And I had the opportunity to go and interact with the video game industry and introduce them to designers inside the video game industry. I got the interaction to go to universities that were interacting with the, the military. And everybody is trying to work on this problem. This is not a unique problem, right? We all have this problem. And if you think about different business verticals, it's not really different. Our ability to aggregate data this, this, and today is higher than it's ever been. But ultimately, inside of security, the conclusion is we just don't know how to display our data. Anybody ever seen like a well designed UI? Like they're very, very few inside of security. So this is where I'm gonna pause for a second. And I'm gonna say there's no such thing as a silver bullet. I know you guys know this, and I'm not preaching about silver bullets. I'm preaching about the ability to actually do something we're not doing well right now. And there's a whole host of reasons. There's also a lot of things I'm not gonna talk about that are closely associated with this talk, and hopefully you can separate those out. Like, when I start talking about forensics, forensics is hard to do anytime you whether you got a UI or not. Typically, you don't have a UI. So I'm not talking about those types of things, right? I'm trying to solve one specific problem, right? the display of data. Now, why am I trying to solve that problem? Well, let's just real quick say that this conversation, while I'm pretty passionate about it, like there's some tug and cheek inside of this. There's gonna be some fun inside of it. We've already talked and I've only said a few things so far and I've already gotten a pretty decent reaction from many people in the audience. Um, so it means you can relate to what's going on here. But while this is fun, um, it, it's, it's a serious conversation, but it, it can also, we can also have some jokes inside of it. So let's talk about challenges and security. Think about all the challenges in security. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just nail a couple as it relates to what I'm trying to get at. Noise, lots and lots of noise. Now product marketing doesn't help this. You guys all know that. Um, when it comes to the noise out there, trying to figure out what's real and what's not real is a big challenge. So if I go back to that bar conversation I had, what was question number one? Question number one that you can hardly see about the people, it's always been about the people. We can talk about all the challenges out there, it always starts with the people, right? Specifically, let's talk about this thing that's negative unemployment. Everybody knows about negative unemployment, that's where you have more jobs than what you have people because, you know, RSA and uh, ISACA, they, they did a report this year, there's gonna be about two million jobs that haven't been filled. You know, 20, is it, uh, cybersecurity ventures, 3.5 million. You know, problems getting worse. I predict that you know, AI is gonna take over by 2024 and it's gonna exponentially, we're, we're, we're all screwed by then. So if you're not Neo, you better go find him. Which by the way, another thing I like to do in my presentations is 20th anniversary comes up in a few weeks. 
still kind of relevant to the conversation. So problem number one, what these guys were talking about was the resource gap, right? You're sitting around a bar, you're sitting with a bunch of CISOs, what is their biggest problem right now? Can't find enough people, I can't retain them, and when I get them in, there's too long of a ramp. I can't get them up to speed fast enough. Bar conversation number two, what follows this one? So if I, if I don't have enough people, what's gonna happen? I've got the security stack. Problem number two is I'm not getting enough value from my security stack. I pay a lot of money for it. There's a lot of gaps in my network. There's lots of new tax coming out all the time. And I just don't have enough people. Think about that, right? That's attributable back to number one, too. So I'm inside this conversation. I'm just, I'm kind of listening at this point. Um, it's not the first time I've heard it, but some of the points that they have are pretty interesting. And I don't know why, but this, uh, this, this thought kind of jumped into my head. Um, it was a question about hiring. Tell me about your hiring bar, right? And, and people kind of get a little defensive about this, right? Well, my place is special. My hiring bar is up here. Well, I have a sophisticated security stack. My hiring bar is up here. Huh. That's interesting. That seems like a problem, right? Now, there's reasons why, right? We care about experience. We care about intelligence, background. These are all the things that are inside of our, our, our checklist when we're trying to interview people. But what we're basically saying is you've got to jump six feet high in order to be able to get in. That's a problem. And so we're back to the hiring bar. I think that one can probably be attributed to both number one and number two. So it's a problem with number one because there's all these open jobs, but we can't get them in because we expect so much for people coming in. And it's problem with number two, not necessarily because you need that high bar. I would actually come at it from a different angle and say that vendors are not doing enough to help lower the bar. The things that are coming out are too complicated. All right? That's kind of an interesting point there as well. So there you go. There's my theme. That's what the theme is about. Right? How do we solve these three things? So let's go ahead and kind of transition from security to games. Anybody in here not like video games? Because um, you're in the minority. Studies say that greater than 90% of you play video games. And now, ch granted, don't hold me to this second one. Most of you probably have been traveling the last 24 hours, but if we weren't traveling, although you probably have a phone and you were probably playing video games on that. So there's a bunch of video game players at this conference right now. So what's interesting about that is the relevancy of video games. If you go do a search on just Minecraft and cognitive learning or learning or anything like that, there's literally, I don't know, I've read a few dozen, but there's literally tens, hundreds of documents talking. This right here, if you can see it, is Minecraft EDU version, educational version. Every freaking college right now seems to have for kids six to 18 year olds to go and learn Minecraft. Why? Because of the cognitive benefits of it. There's, it's just rampant, it's just all over the place. And so here's this uh, Norton Meyer guy. He's smart, he's got a PhD. And this is basically what he's saying about video games. And when I read this, I was like, huh, that's pretty interesting. So thank you, Norton Meyer. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and rephrase that for security because there seems to be some parallels there that are pretty interesting because it seems like every day of security, this is what we're actually doing as well, right? But I know I'm in Canada. I'm from Texas, so I don't know how the, the Canadian military does it, but the U.S. Army back in the early 2000s came out with this video game, America's Army. What they were trying to do was figure out which kids are the best for the U.S. Army, actually try and recruit them by playing. It's a first-person video shooter game, um, whether you like that or not. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that it's not just me. Like, this has been going on for, for more than 20 years. Uh, the, whole, the whole premise of this is that, you know, if you can go through and, and you can show the character and all the different attributes that the military is looking for, not just that you can shoot somebody, but that you do it in the right way, they were gonna look at you. They were gonna actually try and recruit you, which was interesting. U.S. Navy recently, they just built a submarine with an Xbox controller. Do you guys hear about this? Isn't this crazy? You know why? 
Because I can get a kid out of high school, put him in college, put him inside of there, and the learning curve is super short to get them to learn how to drive a sub, right? And if you go and you search this, research this, I don't care if it's drones, tanks, like the US military, and probably militaries all over the world, they are trying to figure out a way to get the, the learning curve shorter. And what they've figured out pretty much before anybody is that video games are a great analog in order to get them into certain jobs. Why aren't we doing it in security? Two kids on a couch theory. This is a study done 10 or 15 years ago, I can't remember. So you have two kids on a couch, three hours a day for five days. One kid, super expert on a video game. Next kid doesn't really know that video game very much. What happens? By the end of that fifth day, that other kid that doesn't know anything about that video game, he's proficient. He may not be an expert level, but he's pretty good at it. Now there's reasons for this, right? There's patterns in the video game, there's design principles in the video game, there's engagement inside of the video game. That other kid wants to play, but he can learn because of the design principles that are inside of that video game. And you know this, you play like any type of genre of video game, you're able to put one down and pick up the next one, right? That one that you played, it's six months, year old, now I want to get the next one. The next one's coming out, it's got better graphics, better gameplay, better something. You pick it up and you're able to learn it like that, right? It's pretty easy. And so the opportunity here is around learning together and learning faster, right? So if you could design things in a certain way, as it been expressed across different business verticals, your ability to learn something faster and learn something with somebody else is super hot. How many times, are, like, who here likes to hire a new person out of college and train them in cybersecurity? Anybody? I've got one, two. Out of 567, was that how many people are here, right? That's, it's not something that even the tools that we have today, it's not fun to teach somebody to do. It's not fun to watch somebody to do it. It takes a long time. Ramp up is way too long. And so now I'm going to pivot into real-time strategy games. There are some real-time strategy game players here. The ones I have up here on the board are old. But if you think of what real-time strategy games are, specifically to much of day-to-day -day operations inside of security, it's basically a real-time strategy game. One example, Fog of War. So I'm stealing a little bit from Sun Tzu, but Fog of War is basically the premise that when you get into the game, there's kind of a black area around here that you don't know what's there. And even if you spend your time inside a video game to go and clear it out and know what the terrain looks like, you still have to send patrols around there in order to understand what's still going on there. Does that sound familiar inside of security at all? It does to me. I spent a lot of time in security before I became a vendor. This was, visibility was one of the hardest problems to both create and maintain. So if you start going through the list of similarities, this is kind of, I, I don't know, when I first saw this, I thought this was kind of interesting. So RTS game, build and maintain visibility to remove a fog of war. Everyday security life, build and maintain visibility to <laughs> remove the fog of war. Okay, point taken. RTS game, understand the terrain. Security life. Understand the infrastructure. Build structures and units. That's the whole premise of an RTS game. Build structures, build units. Get bigger, get faster, know everything. Security life, build and implement software and architecture. And hardware. Anybody still do hardware? Sorry, I'm a cloud guy. I don't, I don't know what this stuff is anymore. Um, RTS game, prioritize incoming alerts and attacks. <laughs> Real life security, prioritize incoming alerts and attacks. Um, procure more resources. Yep, we got that problem. We already talked about it. And then the micromanagement, the macro management side of a video game, right? One of the whole premises of an RTS game is, is understanding how to manage everything, otherwise, you lose. Security is very, very similar. I think this is really kind of interesting. But if we're going to talk about the similarities, let's talk about the differences too. Learning in video games is usually easy. Learning and security is usually really hard. RTS games, finding others is to play with you, is pretty easy. Like you literally can just hit a button these days and they'll go out and find people to play with you. Security, no, that's hard too. RTS game, you get to start over. Think about that, you lost, what happens? You start over. You're losing, what do you do? You rage quit, you hit the reset button, you start over. <laughs> it's easy. I want a reset button for security life, right? But no, like there's consequences in our day-to-day -day lives uh, when we lose. We all know that. Uh, gameplay, knowing good gameplay, right? 
there's a lot of games out there where it, it might not have the best graphics, it has the best gameplay, right? You're talking about a game and how you interact with it and how you almost bond with that video game, right? How are you bonding with your firewall, or your log management, or your antivirus, right? There's, there's not a lot of uh, divining of the, the good gameplay. And then in, in, in games, there's, there's established uh, design principles and they're pretty much none inside of security. So a survey of 300 managers and 650 professionals. This was done last year by McAfee. What they found was pretty interesting. 92% believe that skills fostered in games would help them actually hire. That would actually be good for cybersecurity, all right? Uh, anybody here hired gamer yet? Not yeah, right. So we're, I got one. So we did it, um, when I was at Yahoo, we hired a guy basically off of his World of Warcraft skills. He basically came in and said, here's why I'd be a good manager. He showed us his World of Warcraft tribe or whatever it was. They hired him. That's the one I've had in my 20-some year career. <laughs> That's it. But if you start to look at the, uh, the evidence, it starts to get pretty compelling around why you would do it, right? Now, we, we look at this, and this is where the tongue-in-cheek comes in. You're just like, ah, oh, it's a security, it's a video game, blah, blah, blah. Like, wait a minute, no, like, this is the real deal. I'll give you another example. I hired um, a lady, she was in accounting. She came over to security, you know what she did? Vulnerability management. She was good at it, you know why? Because vulnerability management's all about numbers, right? The number of scans, the number of things that are outstanding, prioritization. Right? So there's, there's, it's not just video games. This is the example I'm giving, but it, it exists out there in other places. So opportunity number two, make it engaging. If you think about what we're doing on a daily basis, you make it more engaging, and you're going to want to do it more. Side note, good interview question. You should add an RTS interview question. Think of this face when you do it, too. It was me. Um, so let's start talking about some design principles. That's right, I just did two matrix references in one presentation. This is how Hollywood thinks about it, right? So if you think about this scene, this guy's sitting in this chair, how many monitors are there? A lot, and you're led to believe that he can just read every one of them, and it's like, second, like, apparently the brain inside of this movie has evolved to such a point where you can just read 500 screens all at once and understand perfect situational awareness. Uh, except, which one's imitating which one? We do this. This is, our, this is security design principles 101. This is not unique, right? It, it works in Hollywood just, just fine, just to be clear. I'm not banging on Hollywood. They, they do really great things all the time. We don't inside of security. This is something that we should change. And so let's, let's talk about different business verticals, just as uh, some examples. Um, if you go across different business verticals, they take this type of information and use it different ways. So if you think about one, if you think about like a day trade or high speed trading, right? Like if you look at this screen that's really dark and you can't hardly see it, the one thing that you can see is the use of red and green. And then they have really big buttons that are green. And if you start, and I've actually done research, I've gone across most of these day trading applications. It's, it's a very similar uh, design principle and their use of bar charts, their use of color. But if you look at the data, like what they're looking at, it's relatively simplistic. So their design principle can be very, very simple much more simple than security. Westworld, yeah, you're gonna say it's Hollywood, it's not real. Well, the guys that are designing inside of Westworld, they actually spend a lot of time trying to understand the problem. At my current job, I hired a designer away from, uh, World, uh, from, um, from Blizzard Entertainment. And what I liked about it was he has no preconceived notion of security whatsoever. You just tell him what the problem is and what the data is, and he's gonna bring it back to you. That's what the guys in Hollywood do. So while you're looking at these screens saying, oh, this, this will never work in security, I'm sitting there going like, I bet it actually would. There's actually some really cool design principles inside of here. Circles are a really great design principle in security. So let's go back to RTS games. If you look at the screen here, they're very, very similar design principles. It's one of the things that allow you to jump from one game to the next. This is pretty, this, is, this, is, this should like start to ring some bells, right? Like think about what you're doing every day. Think about what your vendors are doing every day. Because the common design principle right now in security, now I love Twitter Bootstrap, all right? Now it, it was advanced forward for a lot of UI development. 
But what a lot of people do inside of security right now, and it's largely based off of cost, is I'm gonna go download Bit Twitter Bootstrap and I'm gonna customize it, which you can, and it's gonna be good enough, right? Um, people won't spend more money on that because the other problems inside of security are harder and nobody wants to tackle the design one because it's hard, right? And where are all the designers going? Not to security, right? So there's a problem even in security from getting good designers. So this is not for the win. So now we're back to that big data thing. Mountain of data, pool of data. What are all the different terms for data? Data lakes, data rivers. I heard data pond the other day. I was like, how many terms can we come up with this stupid thing? It's just data. So what are we trying to achieve? I'm gonna run you through some little thought exercises here. The first one being is the 15 uh, cent experiment. What it basically posits is you put a whole bunch of people, put them in a room, have them look at drawings of 15 coins of one cent. There's only one that's actually accurate. You know how many people actually could find the, that one coin that was, that was the real one? Pretty much none of them. And basically what it says is that people relate better with shapes and colors than they do with numbers, right? I think if you look at a lot of your tools right now, how many times do you have to go back and reference it because it gives you a number or something? and you can never remember it. Now this is important, and what it's basically saying is, is that when you think of coins, when you think of a, some type of visualization, you're thinking of the shape and the color more than the words and the numbers that are there. I'll give you a perfect example. Stop sign. Anybody, anybody not know that this is a stop sign? Hey, go ahead, raise your hand, we'll help you out later. Please don't drive. <laughs> So think about conscious and subconscious thought, right? Think about that for a second. All right, so now we have a bunch of signs here, a bunch of design principles. We even have Canadian versions. Now here's what I want you to think about. I, just, I do this probably once a week. I do one-on-ones with my employees. A lot of times I'll do them. I've got a 40-minute drive, so I do them while I'm driving. Yes, I know that's bad. You know, scold me later. Um, I can drive from my home to work or from work to home and not remember the drive. I'm able to do that because we have design principles surrounding us everywhere, right? This, the, we, it, you, some people, if you're in sports, call, they call it muscle memory, right? You do something repetitive so many times, you don't even have to think about it anymore, right? You do it every day. Every one of you have probably done this in some capacity or another. And that literally is subconscious and conscious thought. It's part of that cognitive psychology that we're trying to learn about. That ability to display data to you so that when you look at a screen, and, and what was interesting for me, it was um, 2012, I think. I sat down 12 threat researchers and uh, had them go through a bunch of different malware. And what I realized was is that um, even though they all, they didn't go in the same sequence and they didn't use the same tools, they basically were trying to accomplish the same thing, which meant you could apply code to it, right? And so we basically were starting to automate SOC analyst type of work. Um, we started to go look at SOC analyst type of work, right? We sat them down. We you know, went to IBM and uh, BP and a bunch of other companies just to try and understand, like, super mature, super immature. Show us how you actually work. What was fascinating for me on that, 25 to 50 data points. That's what a SOC analyst is actually going to try and go look at. 25 to 50. Why? Because they're gonna, they think they're going to have enough confidence to be able to make a decision after 25 to 50 data points. Okay, well, there's also the fact that they're probably needing to close between 10 and 20 alerts a day. There's the volume of alerts that are coming in. And they're only going to look at 25 to 50 because they have to get to the next alert. Do you know how many data points are inside of intact these days, especially as you start to aggregate data all around? Right? So at the, the company I'm at right now, like one of my challenges, a single alert could have 10,000 data points. You ever seen an alert with 10,000 data points? Do you want to, right? If I don't figure out how to display 10,000 data points, I lose, right? Like nobody's gonna wanna buy a product that can do that. But inside of your daily life, as you're looking at data points, you're trying to get enough information to understand what's there. The number of times I saw guys go get 25 to 50 data points and not look at that one critical data point that they needed, and they wasted an hour or so, two hours, sometimes three hours trying to figure that out, was huge. 
because there weren't any design principles. I'm going across all these different things. Everyone has a different design principle. There's no consistency, and that's a challenge. So thought experiment, as my time is, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, we'll go into the thought experiment. Boom. All right, gotta give, everybody looked? Yeah, all right, everybody looked. Eighty percent of you looked at the very center of that screen. I know that eighty percent of you did that because science. Everybody likes science. Science teaches us a lot. The reason I know that is because your eye usually starts in the upper left-hand corner and starts to scan. When it scans, it's going to go after the first thing it catches its attention. Then, because the lines all lead to the middle, and they put something right in the middle, you looked at the center of the screen. It's a really interesting design principle because if I'm trying to display something to you that's super important and it's inside of security, where should I put it? Rows and columns or in the middle of your screen? And what should it look like, right? I don't know. Here's a really cool design principle. I could change it and you still understand what it means. I could change it again, you still understand what it means, right? If I do this, you're gonna hate me. <laughs> this is why design principles are important. This one, it doesn't matter about the location, it was about the color, right? The color was important. If you, I mean, you're starting to go through this, right? Think about, go back to the video games. This is why video games are important. This is why kids and you guys and security vendors should be designing video games for security and not whatever the crap we're doing right now, right? Let's do another one. Red, green, blue. I've actually used this one before in both uh, academia and going out to different customer environments. So let's say this is a ASN, blue line, ASN, outer line right there, okay? The inside ones are cider blocks. Green dots or the dots in the middle are IP addresses, okay? Is this an attack or not an attack? It's not an attack, they're all green. Everything we know about it today, it's not an attack. You're not gonna waste any time on this one, right? Now what's interesting about this is um, I had to work, uh, the opportunity to work with a guy named Dia out of OpenDNS. He's, he's a master at this stuff. What was fun was uh, I was using at one time when I was at Netflix uh, seven different threat intel feeds, a whole bunch of other data, like both of my, my security stack and log management, correlation, all these different things. Just an IP address, if I send it out to like, let's say, who is, right? That's a lot of data. But if you start to go into other like threat intel feeds, if you send them an IP address or a URL, it's going to get detonated. It's going to tell you all the other IPs, the addresses, the files, everything that's associated with it. You throw that back into the machine. You just exponentially increased your data. What we discovered was, is kind of the Goldilocks zone was seven. Like you wanted to do that, like kind of re-putting re data back in seven times. After that, the efficacy of what you're doing would go way down, right? When you start to look at stuff like this, you can start to do real cool things based off of that. All right, number two, good or bad? It's at least suspicious, right? So based off of what I just said, what you're looking at here is suspicious because of the surrounding pieces of information. Now stop and think about, huh, I got attacked. All the things I was looking at were saying it was good, right? And then you start to go around, you start to look at all the other data that's around it, and then you realize, oh crap, it was some type of other attack where actually that thing I'm looking at is bad. This is the easy one. If anybody gets this wrong, you should probably hand in your security card. All right? But what if I did this? All right? You should see this all the time. Guys that would be staging attacks, uh, phishing attacks, that's a common one for phishing, um, different type of drive-by attacks. They're staging all of their information way, way, way ahead of time. Right? What if you had the ability to go in there and look at this data? What if there was a way to actually like, you had a design principle where you're actually looking at it and it made sense? So point number three is make it easier to learn. And so to just kind of put a bow on this, a few more minutes to kind of rant here. I almost feel like Dennis Leary with the, kind of the mic here. I kind of want to drop a few F-bombs, but I'll kind of refrain. Um, the challenges are there's not enough people. 
can't keep them, we can't train them fast enough. Challenge number two is we're not getting enough value from our security stack. Challenge number three is our hiring bar is too high. So as you kind of walk through the entire presentation, hopefully what you are actually starting to see is that there's actually better ways to do this. So what is it that you can do? Well, hold your vendor to a higher standard. Ask for this type of stuff. Look inside of other business verticals that are doing it. If you're actually doing this yourself, if you've lit up Elasticsearch or anything else that is open source where you have the ability to do this, establish what yours are. Like you're helping your own employees, you're helping brand new employees. I know from, from my side, like I spent three-fourths of my career on, you know, in your guys' seats. Right? I've only been a vendor for four or five years now. Um, but I'm trying to take this information, and I've actually done this presentation for other vendors. I've done it for other places. And what's interesting to me is that after you go through this, like, video games are a great analog. There's a lot to learn in security, not just from video games, but other business verticals as well. If you think of the automotive industry, if you think of their user interfaces, if we go back like several years, they were pretty horrible, right? The cars now, like you, you know, I'll mention Tesla. I mean, Tesla actually has a pretty cool uh, user interface, right? Why did they do that? Well, because it's more engaging. People want to actually use that type of stuff. That engaging piece is really kind of critical inside of this. If I said, hey, you could have a security system that was like a video game, would you be more likely to use it? Would you want to use it? How easy would it be to get somebody that's never done security to come in and also want to learn about it for you to teach them, right? All the data exists there that says that this is actually true. It's just, we just have to start working on it in order to be able to make it reality. And with that, thank you. And I will take some questions. Any questions? So, uh, the guy that was hired by Yahoo as a, as a gamer, yeah. how success, successful was he? Is he still there? Uh, Yahoo as a company really isn't around anymore, so <laughs> he might be there, I don't know. Uh, he did actually a pretty good job, yes. So he, it, it did prove to be true. Any other questions? Uh, so oh, wait for the mic so that the people in the other room can hear. Run, run, run. Thanks. Okay, so if you make a security system like a video game, one of the big differences you outlined is that the priorities often aren't well defined and have to be set by the by the circumstance. So how do you imagine building systems like this so that people can learn them easily but actually like also learn like the real actions they have to take or the subtleties of the situation or whatever rather than just, I don't know, gamifying it? And no, it's a, that's a great question. And it's like one of the next big things, right? So I've, I've done different government work where they're around like establishing standards and they're painful and they take a long time. The best way to do it is either through like a community open source project that gets adopted or through getting enough vendors to actually buy into this and do it themselves. So once you do it and you get enough traction, if you think of other design principles that are out there, um, web UIs, like there, there's different ones that have come down the track that eventually got caught on. That's the best way to do it is just do it's It's monetary, but it's, it's better. Now the longer way to do it is to actually get uh, government to step in and start to establish those. In the United States, we have like MITRE and NIST and different frameworks that will actually do that. Those guys take five, six, seven years to do it. It just takes too long. Uh -huh. So one or the other. Got it. Thank okay. you. Uh, let's do one more. How much time do I got? Two minutes? All right. Let's do another one see what happens. So mine's real quick. Um, thanks for the bar conversation last night, by the way. <laughs> cool. uh, yeah, you got to start the bar. Uh, I think there's a flip side to this, right? Because you've got some vendors that let the marketing team build out the UI and you get no data, no, no useful data. It looks really pretty, but there's no data. So that, I think that's another issue. You know, you, you get one, one extreme or the other, which is bad that we need to fix. I think that was more of a statement than a question. I think my comment would be... Yeah, it is a statement, but how do we fix that? I mean, that's the thing. we got to be able to drive the vendors from a community discussion and, and push everybody toward, you know, the gamification, make it easier, uh, lower those hiring standard kind of things, not from a skill level, but just a, to get people into the security field. So, I, I mean, with, uh, I mean, product marketing, I, I think there's a movement inside of the CISO community. Um, I'm lucky enough to be part of the Security Tinkers one. Uh, the CISOs are upset with product marketing right now, and they're trying to force both investors, the VCs, 
and the startups to quit talking about what could be and actually talk about what is, talk about actual real problems, specifically like customer problems. And so that's, that's one way to do it is for you guys to actually put pressure uh, inside of the community and on vendors to do it. And that way, product marketing hopefully will change. Uh, one more question. Hi, great presentation. Uh, I think a lot of your, your principles make a lot of sense, but if you turn it around from a sales perspective, if, you're, if your application looks like a game, will companies actually pay for it? And um, it, I see that as a big issue and one of the reasons that yep. a lot of, lot of uh, uh, applications are not that easy to use. So it's, it, that's such a great point. I was hoping somebody would ask me something similar to that. Uh, where I'll pivot to is actually dark mode inside of a lot of applications. Uh, security companies were starting to do it and it was seen as cool. Uh, I actually knew some of the designers that have been behind it. Uh, there's actually a lot of science behind it. And what's weird is Apple, Google, insert company, Slack, everybody's going to that dark mode. And so to your point, initially, especially from a sales perspective with these types of things, it seems gimmicky. Right? And there's been companies that have done similar stuff like this before, and it was a gimmick. Right? And so what you're looking for from a sales perspective is to get traction with customers because it's based off of results, not off of the gimmick. Over time, that will you know, develop momentum just like dark mode has in a lot of the UIs these days. All right, I think that's probably it for my time. I gotta wrap up. Thank you guys very much.
your mic working? Maybe. If I knew how to turn it on, I would let you know. It's on. It's on? One. It's working. Awesome. Awesome. All right, I think we'll get started if that's all right with everybody. Ooh, that light's very bright. No, not yet. Not quite yet. They said not yet. <laughs> not. That's not even a question. Yeah, pineapple is not allowed on pizza. Well, we're going to rule that out right there. Awesome. All right, I think we're ready to get started. I'm going to do my best today to mic with this hand and click with this hand, but I'm not left-handed, so we're going to see how that's going to go. Good morning. So my name is Shelley Giesbrecht. Uh, I am the managing lead of incident response at Cisco. Uh, for those of you who don't know, yes, Cisco has an incident response team. Uh, and it was really, uh, I'm really excited to be here today because it's my first time at B-Sides Vancouver uh, and I love coming out here so thank you very much to the B-Sides crew for having me. The reason this particular topic for me is really exciting uh, is because I've been doing this for a number of years and when I started in IT, and I'm going to date myself a little bit here, so follow me back to the year 2003. Um, when some of you were probably still at elementary school. Uh, and who else remembers SQL Slammer? Who lived through that? Okay. So that year, I was working on the help desk at WestJet Airlines, one of my first jobs in IT. And they got hit with SQL Slammer just like everybody else. And I'm working the desk. Everybody's in on a Saturday, you know, all hands on deck, everybody. And... Uh, and I'm working the desk and I'm coordinating people and I, about eight hours in I'm thinking to myself, God, I am hungry. So I get up finally, I wander into the kitchen and there are six empty boxes of pizza. Now, first of all, we had 50 people on site doing a response that day. So six pizzas for 50 people, you do the math. Lots of people didn't get lunch. And not only that, the only thing left to drink was 7-Up, and no one ever drinks the 7-Up, right? That's always the last one that's left. Everyone takes the Coke first, then they go to the Diet Coke, and you might have the Dr. Pepper, but nobody ever drinks the 7-Up. So this was really my first foray into incident response back in the day, and one of the things that kind of taught me was we need to think about more than just the technical response. There's a lot of factors that go into what we do. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we should have basically, you know, what the things that we all think that we need and that we have, and then some, the gap between the basics and where we actually need to be. Uh, some really essential roles within your organization that you should have in play if you're going to go into an incident response, and then how we keep things moving as we get into that incident response, as we get started and, and, and keep going, how we keep going. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, hopefully if I have some time, about some stuff that helps. So let's talk a little bit of the, the basics. We all should have some really smart people in our organizations to help us uh, solve the problems of an incident, right? We, and I've never been into, I, I visit a lot of organizations every year now uh, with my job with Cisco, and I've never been to an organization where I've walked in and people are like, yeah, I don't care. People are great because they will drop everything for the most part. 99% of people will drop everything and do everything they possibly can to help their organization recover from an incident. And that's amazing. 
And then we also have organizations that have processes in place to help them deal with an incident, whether that's an incident response plan, whether that's custom playbooks to help them deal with specific threats, maybe associated policies like acceptable use, information security policies, crisis management, DRP, VCP, uh, lots of things, right? Um, but the question is, do they all play well together or are they even in place? When was the last time your IR plan, and I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but for some of you in the room, think back to when the last time your IR plan, if you have one, was updated in your organization. A lot of times we go into organizations, they go, oh, we, we wrote it in 2003 during SQL Slammer. Hey, I'm sure we've looked at it since then. Well, maybe we better have a look at it, right? And, and let's face it, things have changed a little bit since 2003. I've got a little grayer, you wouldn't notice, but I, because I cover it up, but uh, so the last thing here is technology. Our companies go out and buy hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars worth of technology to help us develop that defense in depth. But if it doesn't work well with the people, process, and technology, then how well are we gonna be able to respond to an incident, you know, regardless of day to day, when we, you know, we need it to work, but it's not an emergency, that time when it's an emergency and we really need it to be functioning exactly the way that we, the vendor told us it was going to. I come from a vendor and I still scare the crap out of my salespeople because I say things like, you know what, technology isn't enough. And they go, shh, don't say that. <laughs> no, don't say that. So what's the gap? Gap sharks, it's a thing. Gap sharks are the things that will eat us alive when we get into an incident and we have not thought out the silos that we create between people, process, and technology. We even have silos within people. How many of us work for organizations where there are groups within their IT organization or between IT and the business organization that don't play well in the sandbox together, right? And then you get into an incident. I worked, a, I worked an incident with an organization who couldn't get their network team to come and work the incident because they were too busy. We don't need your crap, you're not nice to us, and we're not gonna help you during this incident. That's a silo within only the people thing. And then when we talk about make sure that the people know what the process is and know how to use the technology and vice versa, all of those things, we wanna make sure that we avoid those as much as possible. Definitely that step, we go back to the, the SANS model, for instance, for instant response, we talk about preparation and that should be our largest thing. This is very much in that realm. So we have an incident. We have, somebody's detected it, we have a first responder. Somebody might be a, might be a user. It might be a, a server technician. It might be a biomedical device technician. I work, a, I work a lot of healthcare incidents recently. And they're gonna do some initial triage. So they're gonna tell us what they saw, what they heard, what it did. And they may or may not have the ability to declare it an incident but they need to have some criteria around that. How do we know whether it's an event, something that we see here, or just happens, and it's actually an incident that is affecting us or has the ability to affect us in a negative way? Now, for the ITIL folks in the room, an incident is very different when we talk about it in the cyber realm, and I uh, definitely have a lot of discussions when I go to different organizations and help them build their incident response plan about how to meld that with an ITIL framework. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a big topic of conversation and a completely different talk. But how do we figure out whether we have an incident? And can the incident responder actually do that? Is the incident responder the right person to actually lead the incident? In some cases it is. If you have your incident response or uh, IS, uh, information security folks, uh, and they detect an incident, they may be the person that steps up and says, I got this, I'm gonna lead this. However, if it's an end user that discovers it and escalates it, or if it's a server technician, they may not be the right person to lead the incident for you. And they need to know what the escalation plan is. So that's, again, those things that should be all built into your incident response plan, uh, but is something that's frequently missed. So who are we gonna call? Who do we need involved in our incident? First and foremost, and this is where this talk really came out of. At Cisco, uh, I spent the last three years at Cisco, and I learned very quickly when we were out doing uh, incidents for our customers that um, one of the things that customers don't tend to do well uh, is actually manage the incident. 
So we developed a group called Incident Commanders. We have a specialized group within our organization, within uh, the, the customer facing IR organization, that just does this. They manage incidents for our customers. This isn't a sales talk, and I'm not, I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm not going there. I just want to tell you that the reason that we did that is because we hear frequently, you know, we're really good once we get started, but it's that first 24 hours that really bites us in the butt, getting from detection into a rhythm of incident response. We're good at the technical piece. We know what the technical issues are, but we don't know how to manage the incident. So the incident commander is that rule. It really should be the first boots on the ground. Once you get an escalation, you want to elect an incident commander right away. And you want to, it's sort of that tactical project management, right? So they need to know how to manage the people, the process, and the technology, and all the pieces that go in between. They not, may not be the SME on every piece, but they need to know the pieces in movement and who needs to get those things done. They need to have the authority to lead. Remember I talked about that network team that didn't come to the table? Your incident commander needs to have the authority from your C-level to be able to point at, I'm gonna point at you and I'm sorry. I'm gonna point at that guy and say, you need to come to the table. And here's the piece of paper that tells you that I have the authority and that there'll be, there may be discipline involved if you decide your team's not gonna to come to the table. And obviously, the flip side of that is we wanna create those relationships and mend those relationships before we get into that problem. But you need to have the authority to deal with it as well. They need to understand both incident response and the business. And I think we've all been in a situation where security uh, loses out when business is impacted. Business still needs to continue and security needs to understand that there needs to be a good balance. The same thing in incident response. We're trying to get back to business as usual when we're doing an incident. And so we need to make sure that whatever is still working is still functioning and that as the incident commander, you understand the balance between those things. What do we need to get up first? What's most critical? Where are our critical services, our critical accounts, our critical customers? Who do we need to make sure is up and running first to make sure that the cash register of our business is continuing to run? And they need to follow the flow of, of, the, uh, of the incident. So they need to be right up to date that leads me into the next thing. Uh, well, I actually will mention really class, gravitas. That's a big word at the bottom. Uh, the incident commander uh, has a lot on their shoulders. They need to be able to handle everything that comes at them uh, with a great deal of gravitas. They need to be calm. They need to be able to deal with people who are going to scream at them because in incidents, people get upset, uh, particularly your customers, your business partners, and your executives. They want to know that something's being done. And sometimes it takes longer than they think it's going to. We need to keep up with that, and how we keep up with that is we also elect an incident scribe, or more than one. These are the folks that follow kind of behind the incident commander. They are also equally well-versed in the business and incident response, but there's the folks that are going to document everything for us. All the action items, who's doing what, who's done what, uh, and so that we have that stuff going forward for the reporting. Uh, as well as, they're, you know, so they're going to be slightly behind. They're going to maintain that timeline for you, so you've got a visual timeline of what's going on. But again, these two roles are really important. We want to make sure that not only do we have one person that we can elect, that we have more than one. Because when we get started, it's that first 24 hours that are really important, but it might go beyond that 24 hours. So let's talk about those first 24 hours to start with. In the first few hours, we need to understand things like, you know, where are we going to meet? Do we have a place to meet? Who's on the call bridge? Do we have a call bridge? How do we declare an incident? What priority is that incident? There's a number of things that we need to know, and we need to establish rhythm for communications, escalations, notifications. And those are three things I'm going to talk about a little bit more and explain what I mean by each one of those. So how do we keep on keeping on? How do we move through an incident? When we talk to a lot of organizations, as I said, they say, when we get into the technical piece, when we're containing it, when we're eradicating it, when we're, we're re-imaging systems, and we're getting back to business as usual, we know how to do those technical things. We talk about uh, different incident priorities. So if we look, talk about the low and the medium, 
We do those on a regular basis every day. We feel good about those because you know, the, the one-offs of, of malware. In fact, you have a small case of ransomware that uh, you know, is affecting one system and maybe one file server, and there's a lot of people in this room that go, yeah, that's day-to-day. -day. We can do that. That's not a problem. Although, when you say your, that to your CISO, it scares the pants off of them. But you know, a small amount, we can deal with that, right? It's when we get into those high and critical incidents that there's much more complication involved around notifications, again, escalations, communications, but also day to day. If the incident goes on for more than four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, in the case of something like the Sony breach, months, how do we handle that as an organization? So that first 24 hours is really important to establish who's involved, the cadence, uh, where we're meeting, how we're meeting. And then we have to feed people. Because just like me, eight hours in at WestJet, we get hungry, right? The good news is, is, is that people tell you when they're hungry, right? People will tell you when they're hungry. What they might not tell you is when they need rest. Brain fog happens when people are tired and then mistakes are made and the incident may get worse. So we want to make sure that people not only get sleep, but they maybe get a little bit of downtime. We create war rooms, but do we create a relaxation room when we're, built, we're doing an incident? Having a room that people can just go sit for a few minutes and collect their thoughts. Maybe they're not going to go have a nap, but they just need 25 minutes or, or a half hour just to like sit and just not think about the incident and just get themselves back into the headspace, right? But also, day-to-day -day lives, right? Like when as an incident's going on, we have people who have kids or need to pick up their pets or take care of their parents. We have stuff, people going on vacation. In the middle of an incident, I had somebody who ended up having a baby. Stuff happens. Uh, people get sick, people get injured when, uh, unfortunately, things like that happen. And we also have the day-to-day -day stuff, right? An incident happens, but that doesn't mean that our lives don't keep turning from a business perspective. We need to keep the lights on. There's projects ongoing that, uh, the, that the different teams that are involved in, a, in an incident still have to uh, support. And so we want to make sure that we are able to move forward with that. And the incident commander team has to make sure that they're aware of all of those things. How do we move forward and keep an incident running, keep our business running, keep our lives running? Here's some things you might not have thought of. How do we feed people? Do we have a budget for that? Whose credit card does that go on? Does our team have credit cards that we can put stuff on? And how about if it does go overnight, or it goes over, or we need somebody to travel to pick up a drive, or to do some forensics, or to help contain an incident at a, remote, at a mobile uh, or remote branch? Do we have budget to put them in a hotel, to put them on a plane, to give them a rental car? I don't know. How do we pay overtime? What about in the situation where our organization is also made up of contractors or unions? Do we have budget for overtime? Uh, do we have budget to keep folks on site uh, you know, over their eight hours? I've had people walk out to say, I've done my eight hours, I'm done for the day. In the middle of an incident. And we need to talk about prioritization as well, right? So that's a constantly evolving thing. From a, uh, is it a medium incident? That became a critical incident. And we have to revisit those priorities. We want to make sure when we're going through and, and we talk about the, the, the NIST model or the SANS model for, for incident response, that if we are into containment, are we really into containment? Do we miss something? And do we have to circle back to identification? So we want to make sure that when we are, are building our, out our plans to go forward and do those things, that we're doing it in a very methodical way. We need to make a plan for each phase. We need to get approval from that. So for instance, we may, in a containment phase, say, we are going to go out and shut down every server in the data center. And then, we send, our t we send our plan for approval up to the business unit, and they go, no, you're not. Figure it out. And we have to go back to the drawing board. And so we have to have that plan approved. And then we have to go out and execute that plan. Now, all those people doing those things might not be the same person. So we need to make sure that it's well documented within the plan. 
Once they're done executing, we need to validate that it's done properly to make sure that the thing that we thought was done was actually done. And then we need to document it to make sure that it's in our report, that what we did is what we thought was done and that we can tell people later on that that's what we did. Because cyber insurers these days really want to know that you did what you did and that you're sure that it's gone. I feel like I just went back there, there we go. All right, the need for SMEs. This is my takeoff of Top Gun, thank you very much. The incident commander needs to know who their subject matter experts are. They need to know who to call, what names they're gonna, which means we need call trees, we need to identify those people in advance, and again, people go on vacation, so we need backups for those folks. But you need to be aware of all of those things and have those in your mind. We have technical folks, so we might have tech, you know, we have the folks that are identified as the core incident response team, but what if we need a specialized skill that's not usually what we might need for, for an incident, that it's very specific to that incident? We wanna make sure that, again, we've identified those folks, we know where to find them. We also have non-technical SMEs uh, from internally, legal, communications, uh, PR team, those are folks that we may also need if there's an inter insider threat or we have, uh, you know, we need to ask some questions around whether we're actually gonna go to law enforcement or not, which is one of our third parties. We need to have those discussions, know who those people are, and again, the incident commander, that single point of contact for all of those folks. How about third parties? I've listed a couple. One, obviously, law enforcement. We wanna have those relationships in place beforehand. IR support, we want to have a, some sort of retainer or otherwise in place with one of the IR firms to make sure that we have help when we need it. Vendor support, IT people are, are ridiculously bad at asking for help. We have a problem, we go, no, I can fix it. Just give me another 30 hours, I've got it. But we also have things we need to talk about now like cyber insurance. When do we call the cyber insurer? When do we get them involved? because they are highly involved in the process these days. As well, external legal counsel. More and more organizations are, are keeping external legal counsel on retainer to help them when a cyber incident happens because their internal counsel are not cyber experts. So we wanna know when do we get those involved? When do we invoke attorney-client privilege? That's a big one these days. Uh, you know, protect our work product, protect our communications. We need to know when does our legal team want us to do that? So our incident commander needs to know, not necessarily when we're gonna do it, but they need, that they have that conversation. I need to have that conversation. All right, escalations, communications, and notifications. When I talk about escalations, I'm talking about who needs to know right away in the chain of command. Who am I escalating to to make sure that the next person and the next person and the next person knows? And as an incident increases in priority, that is very, very important, and those escalations obviously get bigger and higher. Notifications are who needs to know broadly. So when we have a data breach, do we have notifications that need to go out to regulatory bodies, for instance, or to our customers? Do we have SLAs, SLOs with our customers that says, if we aren't up within four hours, eight hours, 24 hours, that we need to send a notification to let them know? And then communications, obviously, from a broad perspective, both internal and external. Who are we communicating with, letting them know what's going on as much as we possibly can? So from an escalation perspective, we start off, and I'm hoping this is gonna work because this is very tiny. All right, so we talk about initial escalations, right? They're gonna come from a number of places, and this is an example of, of a chart that we've used. So we might have an escalation that came in from a web interface, from chat, phone, call bridge, email, walk-ups, from your SIEM or from tech services, right? We might get a number of inputs for an event. And then how do we get from, come on, there we go. We report it to the service desk. They say, hmm, this maybe meets the criteria for an incident. I might declare an incident. If it doesn't, they're just gonna say no, it's gonna follow the normal ITIL incident management process or they're gonna identify, log it, and classify it as maybe a medium incident. We're gonna decide whether it's P3, P4, medium, or low, and if it's not, if it's that sort of P1, P2, high, or critical, they're going to escalate somewhere. They are going to put it up to the next person in the line, for instance, your, in your information security team or your incident response team, so that they can appropriately deal with that. So that's sort of like initial escalations. Beyond that, when we talk about notification, who needs to know, we also need to make sure that the people who need to know 
are going to keep our secrets if we need them to. So do we need NDAs? Do we know who's under NDA right now? If we need to put someone under NDA, do we have something in place that we can easily use that's already templated that we can get them as quickly as possible? And as we move through an incident, we may need to revisit the priority, as I said. Something that was medium may become very critical, depending on lateral spread um, or, or the virulence of the particular malware that you're working with, if you have an active attacker on your network. And so maybe that becomes critical, and now your escalations and your notifications need to be revisited. Now who needs to know? The incident commander, again, needs to keep all of those things going in their brain. What do I need to think about now? What do I need to revisit now? What's our next steps? Communications. I talked about this. We want to talk about this early. Getting the cadence in place, not only for internal communications, daily updates to our, uh, to our executive, making sure that everybody on the CERT team understands what's going on, that whole document, validate, uh, execute your, your plans, make sure that they're approved, all of those things. But from a content perspective, we want to make sure that when we create content, that the person that's creating the content is approved to be an author, right? So we want to make sure we identify who's allowed to author particular communications. Then who approves those communications? Maybe you're doing an external communication and you need to make sure that your HR or legal team is okay with the content that's going out. So you have to identify an approver for that. And then who's allowed to send it or who's allowed to actually say it? Having identified folks that are allowed to actually be the uh, in intended speakers for that message from your organization and having the, all those things. Again, the, the incident commander needs to be aware of all of those things. Doesn't need to be the expert, but needs to be aware that those things need to be thought about. Handoffs are an interesting one. We worked an incident where uh, a managed SOC was involved. And in the middle of the incident, some at some point, they did a shift handover. And we didn't notice because it was so smooth. We said, when did you do that? And they go, oh, we did it at 3 AM. No one noticed because they did it so well. Shift handovers are huge because when incidents go on for more than an hour, 24 hours, weeks, months, we need to be able to, again, change over. Another reason that we need multiple incident commander uh, uh, candidates, multiple incident scribe candidates, we need to be able to follow those over because the incident commanders, believe it or not, also need to sleep. Most of mine are vampires, they're fine, but everybody else needs to sleep. So what helps? Checklist. Have a checklist. We want to break down what needs to happen into small units, and I'm not talking about the technical things. Um, these are very tiny. But what you'll notice is some of the things are a little technical. We want to do event triage and validation and false positives and declare an incident. But also, we need to contact all the right people, get a war room ready, activate our cert, take attendance, making sure that some people may not be invited and shouldn't be there. Uh, we worked an incident where the organization used a email to send out the call bridge, and the attacker was in their email system and attended the call bridge. So we want to make sure that we know everybody that's on the bridge. We want to set up shifts as quickly as possible. If we think this is going to go over eight hours, we need shifts set up. We need people to know what their expectations are for shifts, and the people that are going to be taking the next shifts, they need to go home and get some rest and get their lives in order because they're taking the next one. So we need to get all of those things in order, communications cadence. If we can document all of those things, get them into a checklist, figure out who's responsible for them, what sort of category they go into, it's going to help us respond better, faster, and get to remediation that much faster. Having matrices, a little bit different from a checklist, this is a communications matrix, a little bit of an example of one. And it's the idea of making sure that you know when you're going to communicate something, how you're going to communicate something, who is going to do the communication. Like I said, we need to know who's providing the content, the author, the approver, who's sending it, what format are we sending them in? For instance, do we have a template for that? Are we sending them via email? Is it going on a blog post? How are we doing those things? Blocking that out beforehand and having the incident commander, again, 
completely aware of these things, having that to hand is going to help you be more successful from a logistic, tactical project management perspective. Timelines, this is where our scribe comes in. Why do we love timelines? Because timelines gives us a visual reference of what is going on in our incident. And for me, I'm very visual, it drives understanding. And I find, I'm sorry for the executives in the room, executives love pretty pictures. It helps them understand something that maybe is way more technical than they are, they are at a level of understanding. And we can show them what's actually happening uh, with, with a visual. We can do that in software, or we can do that on a whiteboard. I prefer actually both. I like to do it on a whiteboard in real time and then transfer that into software so that we can put that into reporting or into status updates. And we need to, tra to, to practice and train this. Incident commanders and scribes are not born, they are made, and that's for with experience and with time. We don't want to have to train our commanders and our scribes on real incidents. Uh, it's, it's, it's an easy, easy way to level up very quickly. It's not very much fun. Uh, so we want to do more than just your annual tabletop. The annual tabletop that we all do tends to focus on the technical problem quite a bit and making sure that our technical teams know what they're doing. If we do more often do uh, sort of a, a tabletop exercise or uh, some sort of small exercise that we focus on the logistics. We did a... Uh, uh, a tabletop exercise with a large financial organization where we focus completely on the logistics. Every time they went to the technical, we went, I don't know, who's your incident commander right now? Where's your scribe? Did you do a shift change? Did you feed people? And we hit them like that constantly. And it was that constant reminder that you're not doing the technical piece, you're the incident commander. You have people that are doing the technical piece for you and coming back to you with those answers. A great practice and a really good way to level up those folks that you want to be able to step into the incident commander role when you have an incident. We want to practice those coordination and logistics, make sure that everybody understands chain of command, that that one person is the single point of contact for escalations and notifications and anything going downwards as well. So, what are we taking forward today? First of all, Success is really understanding what your organization needs. Everyone's gonna be different. We can download a template from the internet that gives us a list, but the truth is we need to sit down and really figure out for our organization what does success look like from the beginning to an end of an incident and not just the technical pieces and not just the people or process pieces either. How all those things go together and how we can fill those gaps with a role like the incident commander. We want to make sure that we're feeding people because, but the problem is, is starving people will tell you that they're hungry. They will not tell you that they're tired or that they need to pick up their kid because they want to do the best that they can for our organization. So we need to think of all the things as we go forward about that we have the right amount of staff, that we can staff for the week, for the month that this incident is gonna go on. And we want to identify that talent as, as folks come up, as instant commander and scribes, and be developing that and practicing that because those folks are, are the, the way to make sure that our, we are successful in our incidents and, and that we can get from incident declaration into those first 24 hours in a much more successful fashion. Uh, there is a phrase that says, practice makes perfect. That's not actually the phrase, it's practice does everything. It's from a Roman commander named Periander. And it's sort of the same idea, but practice is, it will get you to where you need to be. So what I'd like you to do is to head back to your organizations and start talking about incident coordination. How do we get better at the entire process? The nice part about this is that this isn't just about cyber incidents. If you have good incident coordination within your organization, if you have good incident commander candidates, they can handle any incident. It can be a safety incident, it can be a cyber incident. It's the sort of the same pieces, just slightly differently applied. So from the perspective of, uh, of an overall sell to your organization, it's actually an easier one than you think because we're not just talking about cyber, we're talking about instant coordination as a whole. I wanna thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm really pleased again to be here and, uh, and I'm excited. I will be taking questions I think maybe if I have time right now. Uh, and if not, then uh, in the hallway afterwards, if anybody wants to ask questions. And this is where you can find me online.
Thanks, Shelley. Enjoyed it. We were talking here about uh, the incident life cycle models. Which one do you like better, the SANS Pickerel or the uh, NIST one? I would say I don't really have a favorite. Um, and I would say I subscribe to a little bit of a hybrid. Um, I, I tend to, I, I think my inherent difficulty with some of the frameworks perhaps is that when we go to organizations and do an incident response with them, uh, identification is a lovely f phase. Uh, uh, but um, more likely organizations have to start containment faster than, than we would like as incident response professionals. So I think um, the, the containment piece is, tends, to, can, tends to actually you know, leapfrog. So I think, uh, I would say it depends. The, the, the DFIR answer is it depends. So my question is on the commander, specifically that position, how that, because a big part of it you said is creating relationships beforehand in that planning phase. Uh, how does that look differently from an internal uh, IR team and an external IR team, specifically with the external, how are those relationships built beforehand? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, I think the, the internal one is obviously a lot easier. You know, you're, you're, you're embedded in an organization. You can go out and, and build those relationships, hopefully, and, and build those bridges and make sure that the people that you need to come to the table will. Uh, for our organization, when we go out and actually have to uh, engage with a brand new client and send an incident commander on site, it's one of the reasons that we send them in first. Um, and make sure that they, you know, f first of all is, I say it's 70% uh, patting on the back and 30% actually technical. Um, I last year had my first CISO cry on the phone with me. Um, and it, it's not pleasant, uh, but you feel for the folks in the, in the moment. And I think that's what I'm talking about when I say that incident commanders are, are really developed because it's not just project management. It's not just technical. Uh, it's very much uh, uh, an individual that has a number of different skill sets, including a massive amount of empathy and, as I said, gravitas, being able to handle that situation. Um, and, and so I would say from a perspective of going in, it's a matter of we don't want to send somebody in who's not ready, uh, which is why we develop that team and make sure that our folks are, are you know, as, as ready as they are to go in. But um, internally, you want to, again, identify those candidates and, and, and make sure that uh, they are being developed in a, in a way that allows them to gain that experience. Thank you very much for the point on practice. Um, the question I have for you is with respect to um, working with a scribe and so forth, if you're working for a much smaller team, is it fair to say that maybe your SME should take on that role if you are working with like a resource crunch of that sort? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we talk about, you know, um, smaller teams and whatnot, we have to fill those gaps where we can. Um, and again, it's a matter of, uh, you know, the, the scribe may be also be an SME for, you know, a, a, another vertical, if you will, or silo. Um, we, we need to work with what we have, and, and sometimes very much so we have incident commanders who are also scribes because the resources just aren't there, so uh, it, it's a matter of, and, and, but sometimes it's also just pulling somebody in and just saying, just follow me around and just write everything down that I say. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Um, uh, just two questions. Uh, one is, um, uh, what are the key things that you watch for for an effective uh, handoff um, between the shift teams? Uh, second one is, uh, if the inf incident is a significant and large one, do you establish um, uh, shift teams uh, at the beginning and establish two sets of uh, incident response teams uh, as well? Thank okay, you. so first question, um, handoffs. Um, the successful handoff is one that, first of all, happens. Um, you know, it's the end of my shift, bye. You know, um, you want to make sure that it actually happens, but we want to sit down and, and, and discuss what a handoff looks like. So a successful handoff is one where we are recapping what's going on, that um, they under, so that the, the folks coming in know what the action items they're taking over, what, things, what has happened, and make sure that they can go forward. And as I said, the, the best handoff is the one that everybody doesn't notice because it happened so well. Um, but it's a matter of planning. It's coming down to planning and making sure that, that you know, that's planned in advance. So if the next shift is coming on at 8 p.m., you probably want to start the handoff at 7.45 or, or earlier just to make sure that, that, that given that time to actually do that handover. Um, second question around shifts. If it looks like you're going to be going for more than eight hours, I absolutely 
look at creating two shifts, two teams, and try to balance those out. Look at the skill sets. Um, I don't know if anybody in the room has read uh, The uh, Phoenix Project by Gene Kim. Um, fantastic book. I would highly read it if you don't. It doesn't apply. If you don't think it applies to you, it applies to everybody in IT. And it's that idea of having one person who everybody depends on for their project. So when we have, you know, well, we want this guy on our first shift. Well, we want him in our shift. We want to make sure that we balance those out, that we've got a, a talent pool that we can pull from. And that comes down again to those incident commanders, knowing uh, what, uh, what skill sets we have, where can we apply those, and how can we find those best synergies to make sure that if we have to have shifts, that they're balanced appropriately. Cool, all right. Um, thank you very much to everybody. I really appreciate Besides Vancouver for letting me come again. You can find me online here. I'm at Nerdiosity, nerdiosity.com, and also the Cisco Security Blog. I will be around for the next two days, um, so feel free to uh, come up and chat. I love to uh, network and make some new connections, so thanks very much, everybody.
All right. <clears throat> Excellent. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me for my talk on a safer way to pay. I'm Chester Wisniewski. I'm a principal research scientist at Sophos and former board member for B-Sides Vancouver. I, I left the board last year after the event as my work got a little too busy, and you can tell how much better organized it is this year now that I'm not on the board. So <laughs> um, I th I, I please find some time to thank our volunteers and the organizers because this is an incredibly difficult thing uh, to put on, especially here in Vancouver where finding space like this is so difficult, the costs are very high for us. And to pull together all the sponsors um, in order to make it affordable for the rest of us to be able to enjoy this is an incredibly difficult job. And uh, Alex and Darren and Farshad and everyone did an amazing job and uh, please, uh, please thank them with me. Uh, when I, another thing I'm going to mention is over lunch to remind everybody the, uh, the women in tech group will be having a panel in here and especially to remind the, the men in the room, we really want everyone to participate. This isn't just for women, so just because it's called women in tech doesn't mean that the guys should not come into the room and that it's some secret club. Um, we as men need to be allies in helping uh, support the women in our community and help uh, make them feel comfortable and help them grow and, and a, a lot of the workshop I think in the talk this afternoon will be or this over lunch will be about uh, being allies so please uh, everyone is welcome and we encourage you to participate and I think um, the fact that you know Alex pointed out that you know we're up to 17 percent of our attendees being women is still a pretty sad number and sadly that's that's a big improvement from the past but we have a lot of work to do and if you want to be help uh, be part of the solution uh, please join us over the lunchtime period. Now, uh, I spoke at B-Sides 2014 in Vancouver, it was five years ago, and I did a talk on a very similar topic. Uh, this is some screenshots from that particular presentation. Uh, a few of you may have been in the room at the time. I was showing how a lot of the, at the time, stripe skimming, magnetic stripe reading malware was stealing credit cards left and right. We had just all heard about the target breach uh, that at the end of the previous year. Uh, RAM scraping malware and stealing uh, mag stripes was all the rage and I did a bunch of demos on stage kind of talking about how that malware worked and a lot of the ecosystem behind it and I thought it might be interesting five years later to say well you know how, how far have we come what's changed where are we at now and what's the current state of affairs with regard to payment technology not just credit cards but also uh, other payment technology but my apologies my voice is a little bit weak I think I have bronchitis and so uh, I'm a little less energetic than usual. Usually I'm a, I'm a very energetic speaker, but uh, I'm doing my best to, if you can't hear me, let me know. <clears throat> so uh, we have come a long way from this. Fortunately, uh, this, this was a tweet I had in my slides at the time. Uh, people, people are still tweeting out pictures of their credit cards, which is just astounding to me to think that that's, uh, somebody thought that, thinks that's a good idea. So not all these problems have been solved. Now, uh, how many, are there a lot of Americans in the room? How many Americans? Do we have some Americans? There's at least one or two. Uh, I apologize, but like usual, you folks are a little different than everybody else in the world. You're special, and not necessarily in a good way. Um, not everything I'm talking about, most of this in fact, doesn't apply to America. Uh, but the rest of the world, uh, I'm going to talk quite a bit about EMV and how all this stuff works. And where I know things about the US, I will point them out, because most of us, whether we're American or not, are shopping and buying things in America frequently, even as Canadians. And it's uh, uh, interesting to know the differences. So. Uh, some progress, we've made a lot of progress uh, with regard to EMV here in Canada specifically when we cut over to, in 2008. So as of 2008, the banks weren't allowed to issue cards without EMV chips anymore. EMV is the little chip on your credit card, I'll get into some more details. But uh, some pretty amazing things, right? I mean, fraud has dropped 72% since the introduction of the chip. Uh, and it's an even bigger number than that in Canada. So that 72% drop still inclu um, uh, includes all the Canadian cards that are getting skimmed in America. So the 72% drop is more like a 92% drop in Canada, 
uh, but it's only 72% because we're still getting scammed when we travel outside the country where people aren't, haven't adopted the chip as much. Uh, but there's consequences to this, which is all of our online purchases. So uh, fraud is up 211% of card not present fraud. So the, when merchants are looking at fraud calculations and looking at how you make purchases, there's card present where I have the ability to cryptographically verify that card, maybe collect a signature, collect a PIN, those types of things uh, so I know the person physically possesses a valid thing versus card not present, which is telephone, fax, mail order, internet, uh, all those types of fraud. So the, we expected to see this, and, 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 in, and in numbers, it's still not too bad, right? Because we've gone from $245 million worth of credit card fraud down to $67 million worth of fraud uh, just by introducing these chips onto our cards. So it, it certainly seems to be worth the pain of buying some new terminals, issuing some new cards, teaching people some new procedures to uh, dip instead of swipe, um, that kind of thing. And 11% um, uh, of cards in 2017 were due to fraudulent cards. And so you can actually make fraudulent chip cards. And I'll talk a little bit about that. There's been quite a bit of research done in the UK uh, primarily at Royal Holloway University and Royal College of London on uh, ways to bypass the, the chip. And uh, I find it, you know, some pretty interesting things in there. And we're up to 93% as of 2017. These numbers are really hard to get reliably. There's like a smattering of stuff all over the place, so it's really hard to collect the information. Now, here in Canada, we use Interact for all of our debit. Um, unlike in the US where you may have Visa debit or MasterCard debit cards, uh, we have a, uh, our system in Canada is Interact, and this shows, again, a very similar um, uh, number and pattern for the amount of fraud. In fact, we're down to under $4 million in 2019, as expected. Less than $4 million, entire country, for ATM and debit fraud. Um, it's really an astounding change to the process. There are, this is about half the number, these are this is maybe half the acronyms I'm going to use in the next 40 minutes. Um, so if you're a former military member, you may be comfortable with acronyms, you may not know these ones, but I'm going to be speaking like I just m marched out of the Marines. Um, just a few of them to familiarize you with some of the terms I'm going to be talking about. Um, you know, the number on the back of your card will be referred to often as a CVV or CVC, card verification value, card verification code. We already talked about CNP, card not present. CVM is specific to Chip cards generally, which is called a cardholder verification method. How did you verify that I own the card? Did you check the signature on the back? Did you put a PIN number in? Did you not do it at all? Did you just let me tap and walk away? Uh, what, what method do we use to validate it? Um, the number we're usually worried about protecting a lot is the PAN. That's the personal uh, primary account number. So that's that 16 digit, typically 16 digits. It's not actually, it can be up to 20. but. Um, typically, there's 16 digits on the front of your card. That's the thing we're usually worried about having stolen. Um, authentication methods, DDA, CDA, SDA, uh, which are all different types of authentication. Uh, the little chip itself is called an ICC, an integrated circuit card. It's the exact same chip that you have in a SIM chip inside your phone. Uh, it's the same technology, um, made by the same companies generally, Jamalto. Uh, what else do we have in there? MSD I may refer to, which is magnetic stripe data, which is what we're trying to get rid of. Um, EMV itself stands for EuroPay, MasterCard, and Visa. CPP is another thing we use commonly in fraud. So when, it, when you hear about one of these breaches and they go, oh, you know, Wendy's hamburgers got uh, breached and we, uh, you know, notified that 37 Wendy's uh, in the chain had credit card stealing malware. The reason we know that is through CPP, common point of purchase. A big bank like uh, RBC will see lots and lots of customers reporting fraud on their credit cards. They start comparing them all and they go, ah, they all shopped at the Wendy's on 33rd Avenue in Calgary. So clearly that's the common point of purchase. Everybody that has fraud on their cards, they must have an, uh, an issue or an incident. And uh, that's a very common method of discovering these things. So modern cards. Uh, uh, that's a picture of my expired Marriott card. Uh, down below it, this is one of the problems. This, I mean, because this technology is universal and open, it's very easy to acquire. So I was able to buy uh, a dozen uh, blank cards that I could screen print with any bank logo I choose uh, on the internet for about $6 uh, because they're just standard smart cards. If you use smart cards for authentication in your business, it's the same chip again, right? So you can reprogram these very easily to do anything you want. There's actually an operating system running on that chip. Most of the operating systems are, are, are Java, 
And literally, there's an operating system with applications and code. And uh, I, I read that particular, that's a tap chip there. I read that chip with a, a reader on my Android device. And you can see, in addition to the PAN number and the expiration date, you see this card AID here. And if, uh, if I read that card AID, I end up getting this. Uh, that is an application ID. So there's an actual application running on the operating system on that little chip. And when you put the chip in the reader, it literally boots up the OS, runs the application, and starts communicating to the terminal, uh, computer to computer. So really, we don't, we call it a chip, but it's pretty much just a computer uh, running a very lightweight Java, <laughs> lightweight Java operating system. <laughs> Oxymoron. <clears throat> so this is kind of the beginning of how this works, right? So you stick your chip in the reader, it does what's called a call to reset. Uh, initially, which uh, t resets the chip, makes sure it reboots in case anything's stuck in the memory, anything like that. Uh, and then the first thing the terminal does is query those application IDs. What applications are on this chip? And those applications will be well-known identifiers for things like MasterCard, Visa, Interac, Amex, Diners Club, etc. And that's why if you have, use an Amex card, you'll often notice when you go somewhere, you put the thing and it'll go uh, application error or no application found. It means that terminal is not programmed to talk to Amex. It's looking for the, the card is going, this is my application ID, and the terminal is going, huh, I don't, ha I don't know how to talk to this application ID because I don't support Amex. <coughs> so then, uh, of course, the terminal will do an application selection. Most cards that are credit cards just have one application on them, MasterCard credit or Visa credit. But uh, in the US a lot, you have credit cards that have credit and debit. So if you've got a credit debit card, the terminal will put on the screen. Do you wish to use this credit or debit? Because you've got to pick which application on the operating system you're going to talk to. And the debit application obviously works differently than the credit application. So once the uh, consumer chooses that, you, you, it reads something called the application file loader, which is literally a directory of files, uh, which is what we saw on the previous screen. So this here, those are different files in the operating system or on that file system in the chip. It reads those files, and they tell the, the terminal all kinds of things about the chip that it may use to decide how to use it. It may say, this is a prepaid debit card with a maximum of $100. It may say, this, uh, there's a transaction counter. This is the 398th time this chip's been used. There's all kinds of data in these files that the terminal can use to make a risk assessment about the transaction. Um, then we, uh, we kind of end up in this situation where if we're doing online, meaning the terminal's connected to the internet, we don't really need to trust the card data very much. We don't need to validate it necessarily because we can verify the PIN directly with the bank and cut the card out of the transaction entirely. Uh, if we're offline though, we need to do data authentication. This card says the PAN number is this 16 digit number, but what if somebody just stole somebody else's number and put that number in the application? Right? We need to try to verify, is this really the PAN number? Has this card been tampered with in any way? Uh, is this uh, card being emulated? Is this just an app on an iPhone or an Android? Because of course this is also applies to when you tap, not just when you dip the card. Uh, so we have to do some data authentication. And then we do cardholder verification based again on what files are being read on this card. So that card may say, I'm only, I only support online PIN verification. Most all of our cards these days, sadly, support four card verification methods, including none, which we'll talk about in a second. So if we look at that, again, if I, I, I took a picture of a couple different cards here. This is an Amex. This is a Visa. We can see that the app tells us different things that this card has in its file system. So we can see this one lists the cardholder verification methods it supports. It supports terminal risk management, which are things like uh, allow purchases below $250 without a PIN, but require a PIN if it's more money. Well, those types of risk management decisions. Uh, and also issue authentication, which means there's a, a certificate that allows you to valid, uh, you know, the certificate authority, you can validate the certificate authority is digitally signed correctly. It's, uh, I've got a question. If we, do you have a mic for a question? Well, uh, this gentleman over here. In the previous slide, uh, you have one box that says data authentication in slide 10, and that says offline only. So how do you do offline data authentication for a payment system? For some reason, this, oh, there it goes. Um, I'll, I'll go through that in a couple slides. Uh, so the question was around how do you authenticate the, 
the chip when you're not on the internet, right? Like an offline terminal, which the most common thing, if you're like me and you fly a lot, you run into this on the airplane, right? You put your card in the reader on the plane to buy some chips and a Coke. And obviously, uh, up until recently, most of those readers were offline, right? And you, there's it's very rare to run into offline terminals in the US and Canada much anymore. Uh, almost everything is online, but uh, I'll go into some of the details in a moment. This is not, oh, there we go. Maybe I'm just, I may, my battery might be. Uh, so here's where we talk about the authentication methods, um, starting with the, the top one. So the oldest one, which is being phased out, is called stata, static data authentication. And in essence, um, each bank has a certificate issued by a central certificate authority. And the terminal reads in all the data from the card. So it reads in the PAN number, the expiration date, all the different things that are available. And when that information was put on the card, the card issuing bank digitally signed it with their certificate and put the signature on the card. So all the terminal does is read that hash, basically, and then takes all the data it got from the card, hashes it, and sees if they match. And if they match, it then checks that the signature that generated that hash was from one of the CAs that it trusts. And uh, it, it's, it's very basic, which, the problem with that is it's vulnerable to replay attacks, right? So if I can get your credit card, I can copy all the data off that chip, I can copy the signature, put that on my chip, and it's still as good as your card. And there's no way for the terminal to know that it hasn't been copied. It prevents tampering, but it doesn't prevent copying. Mostly everything these days is ended up being CDA. The next thing they introduced was called dynamic data authentication. And in this case, the terminal generates a, and they, the, the, um, my apologies for the industry. Credit card technology has developed over the last 60 years. And it's been a hodgepodge of people and processes being smashed together in this unholy mess that is what is in your pocket. And so they use a lot of terms that mean the same thing but they use different terms because in the 1970s we called it one thing, in the 1990s we called it another thing, and in this case they call it a 32-bit unpredict unpredictable number, which I might call a random number, or for any of you that are coders, we would probably call a nonce. But they don't call it a nonce, they call it a nonce in different areas. In this area they call it an unpredictable number. So the, what happens is the terminal generates a 32-bit unpredictable number, and it sends it to the card, the card then adds the unpredictable number to the card data and then signs it with its own certificate, which has been issued by the CA at the bank that the terminal trusts. And then the terminal can verify that that public certificate was issued by a trusted CA and signed the data for real right now. It hasn't been replayed because that unpredictable number changes every time the card is put into a terminal. So the unpredictable number needs to match or the hash won't validate. And bizarrely, again, um, the, the technology it's using there is it SHA-1 hashes it and then signs it with a 200, the specification literally says 284 byte RSA key, which is 1984 bits. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out the other 64 bits, where they went. There must be 64 bits of memory on the chip that they need to use for something else, and so they just reduce the RSA key size by 64 bits. Um, but that's how it does it. Um, so it ends up being pretty much the same as SDA, but it's replay resistant because of that unpredictable number being put into the hash. Mostly things are now doing cryptogram data authentication. Uh, here in Canada, I believe SDA is no longer allowed in any of the terminals issued. But that doesn't matter because I still have to be able to use my card in Croatia or Alabama. And that's where SDA is still used commonly. So if I don't have it in my card, I can't use my card there. So I still have it in my card, just like the mag stripe on the back. Um, but this is much more complicated, of course, because then the car, this time the car is generating a 64-bit nonce, because we stopped calling it an unpredictable number. And then the terminal, um, or sorry, the card generates a nonce, sends it to the terminal. The terminal generates an unpredictable number. <laughs> combines it with uh, some padding, the original nonce, and all the data headers about the transaction, encrypts it using the card's pu public key, and then that allows the card to then decrypt the message it got from the terminal. So you're, you're getting non-repudiation here. We know that the terminal has a valid certificate that we trust, and it's, it's signed it, you know, it sent the message to our public key, so now we've got a full interaction between both sides of the conversation validating one another that they're, they're um, uh, they're genuine. 
then it goes to the next step. So if, 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 if it needed to do authentication or, or it does that, now we go on to cardholder verification. So uh, the most obvious and secure thing, maybe, we'll talk about why it might not be so secure, but is online PIN, right? You, you enter the PIN in the PED, another acronym, the PIN entry device, the terminal. Um, and then it's enciphered by the issuer using online PIN verification process. And I put that there because that's a whole separate thing. I have another slide for that. So how that PIN gets transferred to the bank uh, is not well documented. I made some educated guesses combined with some knowledge of ATMs and I put the two together and it fit what happens. So I think that's what happens. And I'll explain it. Um, the next, of course, is offline PIN encrypted. And this is uh, interesting. So the card has the PIN and the bank has the PIN, usually. And uh, the PIN is collected by the PIN entry device. It grabs the card's public certificate, enciphers the PIN using the card's public certificate, hands it to the card and says, is this the right PIN? Does anybody see the flaw in that process? I can just say yes. I don't need to know the PIN. <laughs> Um, and this is what some of the research that's been done has shown how you can bypass this quite easily. If you can force a terminal to be offline by, say, connecting the telephone wire from the back of it, um, or maybe messing with the Wi-Fi and doing a, uh, you know, bump, uh, uh, an attack on the Wi-Fi to knock the terminal off the Wi-Fi so it's offline, and it falls over to offline verification instead of online verification, now if I'm able to tamper with the chip, I can just say yes to any pin doesn't matter if the pin is right, because the terminal doesn't have any way to validate it. It's just sending me the pin and going, is this right? And the uh, researchers at uh, Royal Holloway, uh, Ross Anderson's team, if any of you have read the, the book Security Engineering, the best book in our industry by Ross Anderson, his team of students did some research on this a few years ago. They were able to build a shim that was a millimeter thick that they could put on the chip on their credit card and then go all over campus with other people's cards and make purchases at the canteen and the, at the quickie mart and all this kind of thing without knowing the correct pin by just saying, yeah, that's the right pin. Um, so there's a lot of problems in the system still, but that, that's how it works offline. Um, the other method of offline pin is offline pin not enciphered, where the terminal literally just unencrypted hands the pin to the card and goes, is this right? And you can still just say yes. Um, you just don't have to mess with that whole digital signature stuff. And uh, the other two methods are signature, uh, which is the still the most common method in the United States, although that's quickly, um, it's, it's bizarre, uh, really, in my opinion. Um, it's, okay. it's one thing that the U.S. issued non-PIN cards. Uh, that's a decision for the banks and the risk management people in the U.S. to deal with. But what's weird is when we're traveling there with our cards that do support PIN, 50-50, even if it's chip, it still asks us to sign because <laughs> the terminal only supports signature verification, which is pretty weird because they all have a number pad on them. I don't know why it doesn't let me just put my pin in. Um, maybe it's a good thing considering the pin's either not enciphered at all, um, but it's just kind of weird. But um, the, the, the cardholder verification method is a, a mash of what the card and the terminal support. So obviously the most preferred is online pin, and then offline enciphered, and then offline not enciphered, and then signature, and then the last verification method is none. Um, and that's there for a good reason. Uh, there's a lot of times where, uh, when you're at the Coke machine, you put your card in, like there's no way to really verify who you, you know, if it doesn't have a pin pad, um, you can't sign. So none is a very valid thing to have. It's also valid for a tap and pay where you want quick transactions and people to move on without having to monkey around too much. The signature stuff just still feels very 20th century to me, but um, it is, uh, it, the terminal gives its list. It's very much like a, a HTTPS TLS negotiation, right? I support these ciphers, I support these ciphers. We'll pick the best one of the two lists that match, uh, the highest common denominator, if you will. And uh, it's just for some reason U.S. terminals are setting their highest common denominator to signature. Now, online pin verification is a dog's breakfast. <clears throat> These are research, uh, some images from the Royal Holloway research I was talking about earlier. Um, if you're really interested in this stuff, uh, it's very easy to find. If you just Google the name of the paper, Enhancing EMV OPV, where they pr propose how to fix uh, online pin verification, which suggests that it's broken, because it is. Um, this is kind of how it works, right? You've got the pin entry device here. 
which generally talks to a payment terminal operator, which is not necessarily a bank, it's the companies that sell and lease out or manage these payment terminals that, that restaurants and merchants buy. And it then, uh, in essence, needs to get the PIN from here to the card issuing bank. So that's what CIB is card issuing bank. Schema operator is MasterCard, Visa, Amex, JCB, Union Pay, Diners Club. Um, and these are unknown intermediate nodes, like all different banks and part of the payment processing chain that all link one another to the scheme operator. And this is literally how we believe it works. The card sends the pin, on a, the, the, the card is in the terminal, the terminal gathers the pin. Because we're online, it doesn't send the pin to the card, doesn't trust the card, which is good because the card just says yes. Um, the pin instead is enciphered with a key that it shares with the company that manages that terminal. And then they, encipher, they decrypt it, and they encipher it with another symmetric key for their provider. And then they decrypt it, and they use another symmetric key to send it to their provider, to their provider, to their provider, to the card issuing bank. And it's all symmetric keys that are hard-coded in the terminals and, and baked in ahead of time uh, as part of the process. And if any of those keys are compromised, the, all bets are off for uh, pin collection from the, um, and this is one of the, so if you ever have a pin, chip and pin transaction that's a fraud on your credit card, I highly recommend you fight it and you give me a call. Because there's so many ways to prove how broken this is that there's no way they're going to be able to hold you liable than go, oh, your pin was used. You clearly shared it with the criminal. Um, if you didn't share the pin with anyone, it's highly likely that one of the 27 things that could go wrong in this process did and somebody's been collecting pins at an intermediate operator for the last eight months and we don't know it. Um, and this is still being litigated with CIBC Bank uh, in Ontario. There was an $81,000 car purchased on a credit card. I'm not sure who allows people to buy cars with credit cards and who has an $81,000 limit on their credit card. And there's a lot of questions in this whole case, but um, the Canadian courts have not yet uh, made a decision to my knowledge. I was not able to find any evidence that the Ontario Supreme Court has ruled on that case yet. Um, but there's so many, so much brokenness in the way that this validation is done that I would not, um, I would not like to be held liable if something went wrong. So then we go on to what's called processing restrictions. Uh, these are things like maybe this card only supports online verification. Um, these are all things that are in those files on the file system. The most common ones you're going to see are things, uh, what's called a floor limit. Uh, I'll allow you to be offline if the transaction's under $200, but if it's over $200, I won't allow this transaction to proceed unless I can verify online. Um, other types of floor limit might be the way you have on your tap card where it's under $100, you can tap and buy whatever you want at the grocery store, but if it's over $100, the floor limit says, no, you can't do tap, you gotta insert the chip and verify your PIN or uh, signature or whatever. Um, the uh, after the, uh, the uh, processing restrictions, the, the terminal has its own risk management that it goes, oh yeah, no, it's okay that I'm offline, I'm on an airplane, that's normal here. Whereas maybe uh, something that does debit or ATM transactions has to be online or it won't allow it to proceed. And then the terminal does its own analysis of that and goes, right, I've decided that this can proceed with a signature. And then it goes to the card to do its own risk management, does the exact same process again. The card has its own maximum and minimum limits, whether it's online, offline, whether a pin was used, et cetera. And the two are combined to decide if they can proceed with this from a risk management standpoint. Do I need to go online? Can I stay offline? Uh, what, what needs to happen? And then if, process, if online processing is needed, we proceed to the magic of what the chip actually does. So this is how EMV actually works. Uh, what will happen is the card, has to create what's called an application request cryptogram. That's what this ARQC is. And so it uses a triple DES key. Yes, a triple DES key. That's what we're still using in 2019. Um, it uses a triple DES key and it grabs this data from the card. So it takes the, the primary account number, the name, the expiration, all that stuff, the amount of the transaction that it got from the terminal, $100 say, uh, the unpredictable number that the terminal gave it, um, what currency it's in, there's currency codes for each, you know, is it US dollars, is it Canadian, is it, is it uh, Australian pesos, uh, whatever it might be, uh, the date of the transaction, all this stuff, it signs it with the triple DES key, 
And then it sends all this data unencrypted with the signature. And that's what this cryptogram is, or what we call an application request cryptogram. That application request cryptogram is sent from the card to the terminal, from the terminal to the issuing bank, through all those intermediaries we saw earlier. None of those encryption keys are necessary. All of this is unencrypted. It's just the hash with the unencrypted data. It goes to the issuing bank. The issuing bank has an HSM with a different triple DES key for every credit card they've issued. So they go in their HSM, they get the triple DES key for that card based on the PAN number, and then they, they do the same calculation the card did. They take all the information they have, the unpredictable number, the date, the transaction amount, the PAN number, all that. They hash it with the triple DES key that that card's supposed to have, and then they compare the hash to the application request hash. Do they match? If they do, it must be that card that sent me this request, because only it has that key, that triple DES key that we, we know about. So then we craft our response, which is called an application response cryptogram, which is the ARPC. It makes crafts its response, does the same thing. It hashes the response with the key that the card has and sends it back to the terminal. Terminal can't read that, doesn't know what the key is, doesn't have the, the, the key. Terminal just sends it to the card and goes, here's the cryptogram. Is the transaction approved or declined? And if the transaction's approved, the card signs a transaction certificate with its public key or with its private key, and sends the transaction certificate to the terminal, and the terminal goes, ah, it's approved, and that transaction certificate is actually what they submit to their bank to get the money. If it's declined, they get what's called an AAC, an application authentication cryptogram, which makes no sense at all, because it only is issued when it's declined. Uh, but the application authentication cryptogram tells the terminal, nope, failed, you know, take the milk and cookies back from the customer. Got it? <laughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> so, next payment method, tap to pay. You may know it as PayPass, PayWave. For about three minutes in history, Amex was called Express Pay. It's not anymore for some reason. Uh, if you do debit, you may have Interact Flash. Um, one comment on debit uh, for anybody in the world uh, I do not ever recommend using debit for anything. Um, you are protected, this, similar to the way you're protected with your credit card transactions, except while you're arguing with your bank about the $81,000 car, you don't have $81,000. That money is tied up until you resolve it. You do not get your money back until the bank goes, yes, that was fraud, here's your money back, and that you comply with all the things you needed to comply with. And if you need to pay the rent, that might be a problem, if it is actually fraud. So I'm, I'm nothing against Interac. Their system's great. I've looked into it, and it's actually a, a reasonably sophisticated, and uh, I think they're doing all the right things. But the problem is on the liability side between you and your bank. Um, uh, you need to, I, I, I'm, I, I was unable to confirm, but it's my understanding with a credit card, you have 30 days from the statement to issue a dispute. And of course, during those 30 days, if you're disputing it, if you're like me, you don't pay the bill until the dispute is resolved. I have the uh, power in that transaction with the credit card company to say, no, I'm just not paying it until you take this fraudulent MacBook off my credit card. Uh, whereas uh, in the case of debit, of course, that money's gone until you can get the bank to refund it. And it's my understanding you have to report it within seven days of the transaction. So you don't have 30 days, and uh, it's the transaction, not the statement. So you have much more protection uh, with zero liability on Visa and that type of thing than you have from debit. And uh, I just, I, I get comfort in knowing I can just not pay the bill. <laughs> um, I, I'm willing to take a credit hit over somebody else buying a MacBook with my credit card. So uh, sadly, uh, America's done it a little bit to us again. In the US and Canada, we have, our cards generally support both what's called MSD and EMV. MSD is magnetic stripe data. Because America decided not to roll out EMV terminals until yesterday, um, we couldn't use EMV when we rolled out tap to pay 10 years ago. So we had to emulate magnetic stripes to make tap to pay as insecure as magnetic stripes uh, to be compatible with American terminals. So almost all Canadian terminals, um, the, the drop dead date, uh, did I put the date in here? I don't have the date in here. The drop dead date, I believe, in Canada is October 1st this year. 
the uh, terminals are no longer allowed to process MSD transactions. Um, but in the US, it's still the most common method used for tap to pay. So because we like using our cards in America, our cards have both. Um, MSD, yeah, it, just here, you can't use it overseas. Um, it's converting along now. So most of the terminals in the US that accept Apple Pay are using EMV uh, simply because they had to update the terminals in order to do Apple Pay. And when they did that, most of them by accident got updated to being EMV compliant, uh, which is really good. Uh, it's not totally insecure. All the card data is sent in the clear, except, well, all the card data is sent in the clear, let's be honest. But the CVV, unlike the three digit number on the back of your card, is dynamic. So that CV, it's called a CVC3, and it's a combination of that triple DES key that the bank had with a transaction counter and an unpredictable number. So this card's been tapped 111 times. Okay, we'll throw 111 in with the card data, and the terminal gave me that unpredictable number. I'll throw that in there. I'll sign it with my triple DES key, and then I'll take the last three digits, and that'll be the CVV that gets put in the MagStripe data that gets sent to the terminal. So it's hard to replay it or do anything with it, right? Because unless you've got the triple DES key to know how to generate that number, um, you've got everything else you need to do to rip the customer off, because you've got enough information to make a credit card now. Uh, but you don't have the CVV number, so you can only use that stolen card information somewhere where they're not validating that the CVV is correct. Uh, oh, there's the date, 19 October this year. It'll be, um, you will no longer be able to process any transactions for Visa if your terminal supports MSD. They're making you turn it off. Uh, EMV is the modern new way to do things. It's the exact same process we just talked about for when you insert the chip, except I don't want to have to hold my card on the terminal until the transaction goes all the way to the bank and comes back. I want to be able to tap and move away. So they've thrown out the uh, application request uh, or the application response cryptogram. So the application request cryptogram is the same and it goes all the way to the bank to bank. So the bank knows it came from that card, just like it did when I inserted it. But the response cryptogram does not come back to the card because the card is probably not on the terminal anymore. So the bank just communicates directly to the terminal and says accept or decline. Um, because it's asymmetrically validated, we have non-repudiation. Uh, it's the global standard for tap to pay. Uh, adoption varies. If you travel a lot like me, you'll notice everything in Poland, Australia, New Zealand, uh, UK is like everybody's tap to pay for everything. Whereas in France and Germany, it's quite rare. You don't see it nearly as often. Uh, in the US, it's really hit and miss whether it works or not, partly because of this MSD EMV stuff. Um, uh, here in Canada, it's incredibly popular, obviously, I don't know. I'm a big fan of the tap to pay, to be honest. There's really no security downfalls to it when it's in EMV mode, uh, and it's quick and easy. And that's really um, why it was introduced. If you are a merchant or you do work with merchants, I encourage you to make sure your terminals have it turned on. I notice a lot of terminals around Metro Vancouver have it disabled, which is really strange to me, because if you look up the MasterCard interchange rates chart, uh, that shows how much you charge for credit card transactions. If you use a chip, in general, it's 1.5% for most merchants is the bank interchange rate. You may pay more because your company that services you may add on something, but 1.5% in general. With tap to pay, it's five cents for under $50, six cents for 50 to 100, and seven cents for over 100, uh, flat, flat, flat rate. Uh, so at the five cent mark, I can accept credit cards for a pack of gum and it doesn't really hurt me. Um, and it's so cheap that it's, uh, in Canada, I believe the break-even rate is $3.47. So if the transaction's over $3.47, it's cheaper to tap for the merchant. If it's under $3.47, it's cheaper to pay the interchange rate. T TMI, too much information, More, another acronym. Uh, Apple Pay and Google Pay, I'm a giant fans of this because all Apple Pay and Google Pay do is implement EMV with tokenization in essence. So uh, there's a few things that are unique about it compared to just tapping your regular MasterCard. One is your phone can communicate to the terminal that you biometrically validated or that you entered a PIN. And so some terminals will allow you to have a higher transaction amount if you validated with biometrics or a PIN. So it might be $100 for a tap to pay credit card, but $200 for tap to pay Apple Pay because I, now, I know that you just face ID'd or that you just uh, whatever the fingerprint touch ID uh, kind of thing. Same with Google Pay. Uh, another difference um, is it uses tokenization, as I mentioned, I'll explain that in a second. And uh, the, another nice thing as a consumer is it can communicate directly to you 
without you holding your thing against the terminal, that it was accepted or declined. Because you've got an internet connection and it can send you a message and say, hey, by the way, approved. You were just charged $86.12. Um, and I, I like that feature on my phone. I use Google Pay and I'm quite happy with it. Um, this is how the tokenization works. Uh, the, you, go, you want to enroll a new card in your iPhone or your Android, uh, you take a picture of it or you type the numbers in whatever way you do. You put the credit card information. So the credit card information gets sent to Apple Pay. Apple Pay doesn't keep that. They don't store it. They don't do anything with it. All they do is encrypt it and send it to the tokenization service provider, which is provided by Amex, Visa, and MasterCard. They each have their own. They then generate a token mapping going right. This PAN number, I'm issuing this token that represents it. They store that in a database, probably an HSM, I don't know, and they generate a token. They send that token back to Apple or Google. They don't keep it. They just send the token back to your phone, and then your phone stores that token in a secure element, which is a, a, a chip for storing uh, encryption keys that's tamper-proof, that's imbe embedded in your phone, in the, in, in the NFC chip that does the wireless uh, tap reading and writing. Uh, yes, the, if, if you're paying close attention, that's a Chuck E. Cheese token. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of a token. Um, so that's how that works. And now your phone has this secure token. Apple does not have it. Google does not have it. They are not able to track your spending or sell uh, your purchase information because they don't have it. When you go to a merchant, you tap your phone and start sending your pan. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm wavering on battery, but somebody's going to fix that, right? <laughs> um, so. Uh, when I tap my phone, it sends the token instead of my PAN number. And the token goes directly to the token service provider. They look up the, what PAN that's associated with. They then send the transaction to the bank, say, hey, this credit card's buying this. The bank goes, oh, yeah, it's approved. Send the approval back to the tokenization provider. And then the tokenization provider sends a terminal approval message. Your credit card number was never sent to the bank directly. The terminal never saw your credit card number. It only ever saw the token. And the only people know what that token is matched to is the tokenization service provider. Apple doesn't know. The terminal doesn't know. The merchant doesn't know. So it provides a high degree of an anonymity um, relative uh, to other methods. New stuff, I'm running out of time. And these aren't actually that interesting. Um, so I'll touch them lightly. I looked into Venmo a little bit. It was a hot mess until about a year ago. Um, they finally settled uh, uh, violations of the gremlich Bliley Act and other consumer acts that they were in breach of in the U.S. last year with the Federal Trade Commission. PayPal bought them a few, uh, a couple years ago, and since PayPal bought them, kind of shored them up a bit. What's interesting to me about it is it's really, really weird. You should never use this with anybody you don't really, really trust that you think has maybe got a lot of money in their bank account because it's a ledger-based system in that I send you $1,000, you, your Venmo account shows you have a thousand and I don't have a thousand, but until you cash that money out to your bank account, it doesn't actually take the money away from me. So I can double spend it, triple spend it, quadruple spend it, and then when you go to actually withdraw the money a month later, there is no money. Um, so, yeah, you know, buyer beware. Um, there's a, if you do use these kinds of things, uh, this is some good advice from Investopedia explaining some of the features. Another problem with Venmo is by default, it's a social network. So it shares all of your purchases with everybody that knows you every time you use it, unless you turn it off. Um, so there's a lot of privacy issues there. Um, here in Vancouver, we see a lot of Alipay and WeChat Pay these days. Uh, we're not able to use these services because they're generally only available to Chinese residents. But merchants here are accepting them in payment because we have a lot of people from China coming here and spending money. Uh, so we are seeing them. They're also quite messy and questionable. Uh, the idea that I can scan a QR code to pay is kind of nice until I realize I don't know who put the QR code there um, and that anybody can make them. Um, and the privacy implications are staggering. There's a great report by um, uh, Citizen Lab in Toronto. And uh, I recommend you read it if you want to know more about this. They've deep dived on all that stuff. And so in conclusion, uh, for me looking at all this stuff, I love my privacy. So I'm a big fan of Apple Pay and Google Pay from that perspective. If I'm going to pay with something electronic, I don't want uh, middle parties uh, tracking my spending. And it really uh, does disguise everything quite nicely from a lot of the 
people in the middle. So I'm a big fan of that. Uh, in the end, cash is king. Like, if you want your privacy, don't use any of this stuff. Use your head, go to the ATM, and, and get some of our lovely plastic money and uh, do that. But uh, I'm also, uh, 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 I think the, the, the wireless payment stuff is really where it's at. Uh, it's the most secure and the most modern of all the standards used. It makes the most sense. Uh, and it has the least uh, ability for uh, fraud and risk. So on that, I'll conclude. And if you have any questions, I'll be around for uh, a little while during lunch. And uh, I'm happy to answer them then. And I appreciate your time. Thank you.
is Carl Willis Ford. Uh, I work for a, a little company called General Dynamics. You may have heard of them. Um, three years ago, I was actually with a small company, but we've been acquired twice since then, and now I'm part of this huge conglomerate, so it's kind of dizzying. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, talks at this conference about hardware, a lot about software. I like to talk about wetware, which is kind of a cyberpunk term, but it's, it's the brain. Um, I like to talk about how people interact with security programs. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is the third phase of insider threat. Um, first, a, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, there's a lot of tools out there and more every day that um, use behavioral analytics to um, look at activity and to detect insider threats. Great. But this is a problem that's not going to be solved by technology alone, okay? Um, because the kind of talk, the kind of actions I talk about don't get detected by behavioral analytics. Um, so we have to have multiple modes to manage the threat. And what I'm going to be talk, talking about, and I'm sorry, I have to, I have to walk as I talk. Um, so we're going to be talking about people, not just technology. All right. So um, I'm from the States, if you couldn't tell. Uh, and US CERT is kind of the think tank for the federal government for um, information security. And they classify um, insider threat as either malicious or accidental, OK? Everybody kind of knows what malicious insiders do. Oh, and these slides will be available um, on the, the uh, conference website in a week or two. So um, and my contact info is on the last slide if you want to reach out and give me a shout. So malicious IP theft, IT sabotage, basic idea is they're trying to either harm the organization or benefit themselves, right? They're going to steal data to sell. They're going to steal data to take to another company and give them an advantage there, something like that. Then there's accidental. You know, the, ah, I can't believe I left that USB key in the taxi cab, right? Or I lost my laptop, OK? The problem is that those two categories leave a huge gap. And that gap is what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Non-malicious insiders, they're intentional, which makes it different from accidental, right? The accidental insider doesn't mean to violate policy. The non-malicious insider knows they're violating policy, and they do it anyway. But they're different from malicious in that they're not trying to line their own pockets with cash. They're not trying to harm the organization. They're trying to get their job done. So your morning humor break. How many times has that executive been talked about as far as you know, shoulder surfing? So non-malicious non -malicious insider was coined by research in 2011. And they define it as intentional, self-benefiting without malicious intent. So here again, they're not trying to harm the organization, but they are benefiting themselves because they think they have to violate policy to get their work done or to make their job easier. Voluntary rule breaking, nobody's making them do it, and possibly causing damage or security risk. And I'm going to go through a lot of different examples of what you're going to see every day in your organization as far as non-malicious security violations. But I'm also going to go through three major examples where harm was caused to organizations, and it was started by non-malicious security violations. So the most common reasons for non-malicious, make the job easier, to make the job even doable, or to help a coworker. And one of the most famous examples I'm going to talk about was all about helping a coworker. So common non-malicious security violations. Employees don't lock their screen when they walk away from their computer. In their heads, they go, oh, well, it's going to lock automatically, right? 15 minutes, boom, my screen locks. Big deal. If they're at Starbucks and they go to the bathroom, it is a big deal if they don't lock their screen when they get up and walk away, OK? I work in a very competitive industry. I work in federal consulting for the US government. People would love to see what's on my laptop because I do solutioning to win contracts. So trust me, if I'm at a Starbucks in DC and I walk away from my laptop, there's going to be people wanting to see it. 
Post business related items on social media. Yep, we all seen that. Forward work email to personal email. Do they even understand the risk of that? Use personal devices for business without approval. Constantly see people in a solutioning session to win work. Drawings, system drawings all over the whiteboard. And you see people grab out their phone, take a picture of it, and then use Gmail to send it to their work account, right? Taking notes on a non-authorized tablet. If your company has a BYOD program, is there any way to tell if that tablet they, walk, they pull out to take notes during a meeting, is that on BYOD, or is that their own personal tablet and they're using Evernote? Allowing someone to tailgate through badge doors. Yeah, we know that. And then using cloud-based note apps. So these are things that I've experienced working with other federal contractors in the DC area. So network maintenance, was, network maintenance was announced over the weekend. The corporate email was actually gonna be down for two whole days. One guy responded with, well, I'll just use my Gmail account, right? So if you look at why he chose to do that, the company did not offer an alternative. He wanted to get his work done. He knew he had to work the weekend, so his knee-jerk reaction was, I'll just use my Gmail. Business sensitive document review, I love this. We're working in SharePoint, corporate SharePoint, and I have someone send me a note saying, I had trouble getting my, doc my comments in Google Docs to transfer over. I'm like, um, Google Docs? Employees in a workshop needed to move PowerPoint. So I'm at another company in their conference room. They want to do a presentation. They need to get the PowerPoint from their machine to the machine they're using for the presentation. It was secure because it wasn't connected to the network, right? So they say, um, let's see, we're supposed to use a, an encrypted USB and we don't have one. And then they asked me if I had a USB that they could borrow. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll take that home with me. They had no idea what I was gonna pull out of my briefcase. So here's major example number one. A lot of people know Mr. Snowden's name. What a lot of people don't know is how he got the data that he released. He had access to this much data directly. He released this much data. How did he get that extra data? He's not, trust me, he is not a hacker. He is not a technological wonderkind. What he did was he went to his coworkers at the NSA, highly cleared contract employees, and said, they gave me this job to do, and I can't get it done because I can't get to the data I need. Can you help? Not sure how many, but up to 20 fellow cleared contract employees either gave him their account and password to log in on his machine, or allowed them or allowed him to be on their machine while they were logged in. And that's how he pulled the data. That's how he got the data he released. Simple social engineering. They knew they were violating policy. No doubt in anybody's mind that they knew they were violating policy. But they were doing it to help a coworker. He wasn't seen as a threat. They had been told anybody who, anyone who holds a clearance in the United States hears about social engineering constantly but they talk about it from the outside. They don't talk to employees about social engineering from within. If one of those coworkers had raised their hand and said, yeah, you know, this doesn't seem right. I don't know that we would ever have known his name. Example two, FBI had a conference call with the Serious Organized Crime Agency in the UK talking about how to deal with Anonymous, the big hacktivist group. Within two weeks, Anonymous posted a complete recording of that conference call. And people are going, wow, these guys are good. How did they know what trunk line to tap? You know, how did they, like, how did they do that? Well, it turns out that one of the Irish Garda officers didn't want to drive into his office that day for the phone call. So he forwarded it from his work email to his Gmail account. Policy violation, right? Somebody, not anonymous, had already hacked his Gmail account. They saw the invite pop up and went, huh, I wonder if anonymous wants to know about this. 
forwarded it to them, they dialed in, and shazam, they recorded the call. No intent on that police officer's part to help Anonymous or to hurt Soka. But the result was that Anonymous knew everything they talked about. So again, he knew he was violating policy. He didn't understand the risk. And last but not least, this is um, a little older. Um, this is Robin Sage, by the way. Uh, the researcher pulled the photo from an exotic dancer's website, created false fa Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn accounts so they all matched each other, and then called himself a cyber threat analyst and started making connections. And this research paper is out there if you want to read it. Um, it's linked in my, uh, one of my last slides for references. Made connections with men and women, mostly focused on security professionals, NSA, DOD, Global 500 companies. She had senior deployed troops talking about troop movements, or I should say he had, right? Um, Robin was his persona. Sent business sensitive documents for review, had job offers from major tech corporations, and people just, you know, as we all know from Facebook, you know, all the quizzes, you don't answer all the quizzes because the old way of resetting passwords where you answer personal questions, those answers you know, are to those questions. Um, but he was able to pull data from asking questions and having conversations with her, his, her connections online to be able to do password resets. Um, and that's, uh, Robin Sage is actually the name of a SOCOM, a US SOCOM exercise, and that's where he got the name from. But, uh, So all, th all three of those examples, again, people knowingly violated policy and caused damage to their organizations. One of the concerns those of us who talk about non-malicious security, security violations have is that it's largely an unrecognized problem. US CERT combines accidental and non-malicious into unintentional. The Verizon Data Breach Report categorizes insiders as either malicious or errors, right? So back to accidental. So it doesn't get the visibility it needs because you cannot treat non-malicious security violations the same as accidents and be successful in helping manage the problem. So why do users choose, or why do users choose not to comply with policy? Um, and there's a, it's actually a really interesting little book. I think it was published in 2016. Um, called The Psychology of Information Security. Um, and he gives a good taste of several different topics. Um, not deep enough, but it makes you want to read more. Um, so I highly recommend the book. Um, so he does kind of a root cause analysis on people not complying with policy. And he basically comes up with three related ideas. One is no clear reason to comply. Cost of compliance is too high, right? where policy is seen as an obstruction or a barrier or a hindrance, and then inability to comply. They just, they can't figure out how to be compliant. So no clear reason to comply. Why should an employee care about complying with security policy? Do we give them good examples? I can't count the number of times I've been in an executive meeting sitting around a table and looking at the VPs and senior VPs and none of them are showing a badge, right? Great example for the troops. Doors propped open, um, and I've got some examples in the next slide. Internal bad certificate errors. Check the box awareness programs, where we build our awareness programs based on someone else's idea of what topics are important. Not that we ever actually talk to our employees and find out where their weaknesses are. Poor understanding of the risk of organization. Surveys over and over and over again show that employees think that their company's security posture is stronger than it actually is. So they, they think that what they do doesn't matter. So, and here's pictures from um, contracting companies that I, that I work with. You can see badge door propped open for construction, nobody standing door watch. Every employee that walks by a propped open badged door their concern about perimeter security goes down one notch, 
right? Because, hey, the security folks aren't worried about it. Why should I be? The one on the left there is a network closet. To get into that network closet, you have to swipe your badge and enter a key code, unless it's propped open with a cable box, right? Again, people walking by there, their estimation, and these are, you know, your company's full of non-technical users, they walk by there, in their heads, not important. This is one of my favorites. We all know what that is, right? That's a bad certificate error. This company was working on their VP, working on their VPN for six months. Every time any employee logged into the VPN, that's what they saw. And the direction from their company was, go ahead and click on continue to this web page. But it says not recommended. Oh, that's okay, click on it anyway. So here again, they're training their users not to worry about those kinds of errors. That's a dangerous thing to do. Here's a survey of employees of US government agencies. What they talked about is, they asked them, is your organization prepared for these kinds of attacks? The blue is the end users, the red are the actual cybersecurity employees. And you can see, international cyber attacks. Well, every one of them, the end users thought that the agency was more prepared than the actual people who have to be prepared. And the, what came out of this survey is that people actually thought that their agency's security posture was so good that it didn't matter if they were compliant or not. Basically, it's, I'm just one person. Nothing I do on my computer is gonna affect the agency. So, we have to walk the talk. And that's everybody in the security business. We have to get executive management on board. We have to bring culture change to the organization. And it has to start not at the top, it has to start everywhere. Every security person has to be willing to walk that talk, as well as management. We can't just rely upon management. We have to lead from above, from the side, from below, from everywhere, right? I, I am absolutely willing to call out a senior VP if they're not showing a badge in my company, even if I know them, because hey, they could have been fired. Awareness programs, and I, I've had senior security professionals tell me well, awareness programs, why are we even spending money on those? Because you know that no matter how good our awareness program is, someone's gonna click on a link. That's true. But if we can keep 95% of the people from clicking on a link, we have that many fewer problems to deal with. And then I ask him, so let's talk about your security hardware stuff. How much of it is 100% foolproof? Are you gonna get rid of anything that isn't? And he kind of went, fair point. So, you know, it's the, we have to hit all the bases, right? We have to have the hardware, we have to have the software, we have to have the wetware. Everything has to be hitting on all cylinders to get, to, to get our security posture where it needs to be. So, each individual company needs to target its most often abused policies. We don't need to take our awareness program topics from the, what the industry thinks is important, right? We need to talk about, we need to talk to our users, find out where they're weak, and deal with them. We have to, and so many, I, I review so many awareness programs, and it's all about the what. This is our policy, this is our policy, this is our policy. There's nowhere near enough why. Why is that policy important? And even less, do we ever talk about how? This is how you can be compliant with the policy, right? We're talking to non-technical people trying to figure out how to be compliant with your security policy. They need help. From the research in 2011, the three significant indicators for people violating policy for non-malicious purposes are relative advantage for job performance. That's a fancy way of saying it helps them get their job done. Perceived security risk. They do not perceive their actions as increasing security risk. And then work group norm. Aha, that's a fancy way of saying, well, 
they're not following policy, why should I? Right? So it's, it, it becomes a herd mentality. That's why you have to work and it takes effort to get them heading in the right direction. So, and treat awareness campaigns as a, as a marketing, or awareness programs as a marketing campaign. So many companies, um, I won't say mine's one of them, but so many companies, awareness programs are once a year, we'll send you a slide deck. You click through the slide deck, don't click through too fast. Right? You click a slide, you go get a cup of coffee, you click another slide, you do some work, you click another slide. As long as you don't go too fast, you don't have to read any of it and hey, you're certified, you did your security awareness training. Right? We can't keep doing security awareness that way. You know, and people will talk about, well, what's the cost of security awareness programs? Well, what's the cost of breaches? Right? And Act like your organization's future depends upon your employees following policy. So what about punishment? Almost every company I work with has something in their security policy that says, if you violate policy, the, pen the penalty will be up to and including termination. Does that actually work for anybody? Uh, the answer is no. Right, if you look at general deterrence theory, which is what this is based on the three rules are certainty of detection, all right, and so many non-malicious security violations go undetected. One of the companies I work with, their main floor is actually kind of the, you know, it, it's built on it, the building's on a hillside. So the front door is up here. They have a security receptionist, badge door, howdy, howdy, happy. In the back is the parking garage. You come in the lower level, and you have just a badge door with nobody watching it. And it has one of the, the um, handicap access buttons, right? So I stand there in their lower lobby, just waiting. Somebody walks up, badges, hits that handicap access button. They're in, hit the button to the elevator, in the elevator before that, do that door goes shut. Anyone standing in the lobby could waltz in without them ever knowing it, right? It's awareness. Where is security in that person's head? Is it back here or is it up here? So we aren't detecting it. Certainty of punishment. Do employees ever hear about other employees being punished for security violations? In most companies and most organizations, it is a privacy violation to talk about someone getting punished for a security violation. So as far as your employees know, nobody ever pays a price, right? Now, I'm ex-Navy, in the Navy, they were very proud to talk about people getting punished. They did it all the time. But you don't see that in private organizations. And then speed of punishment, right? Just like, you know, your puppy dog craps on the floor, you bap it on the nose, two days later, he's like, what was that for, right? Well, if the employee never hears about someone being punished, there is no celerity of punishment, right? They don't see that happening. So the real answer is that phrase in your policy about sanctions up to and including termination is to keep the lawyers happy. It isn't to have any actual impact on your employees. So the issue, cost of compliance is too high and inability to comply because they're, they're related. Employees want to get their work done. This is shown over and over and over again, right? It's a bell curve. Most of your employees are in the, in the peak of that curve and they all want to get their work done. Security, if it gets in the way, they will happily go around it. Security policy viewed as a hindrance, hindrance or an obstruction. Um, the path of least, resistant is, least resistance will always be the one they choose. And we aren't helping, right? Company after company after company if they can even find your security policies, they can't understand them. Typically, what I'm, my experience is that security policies are written by security professionals for other security professionals to review and approve, right? How many, how many people are in companies that actually bring in non-technical users to review security policy to see if they understand it? We do that for software, we bring in focus groups, right? 
Why don't we do it for, for security policy? So policy is not covered by our once per year training. And I even, I know companies that do like major overhauls of their, their general acceptability or general usage policy and never inform anyone, right? I worked with a company last year. They were so proud of the fact that every new employee had to sign saying that they had read the general acceptable use policy. Great. How often do they have to reread it? Oh, they don't. They just read it the once. So I've been with my company 21 years. So if in that case, I would have read it 21 years ago. You think it's changed since then? So for example, astounding number of companies still don't have single sign-on, right? So we force employees, and this is everyone in this room knows this story. We force employees to remember multiple complex passwords. We make them change them every 90 days, every 60 days, right? And it just becomes an impossible. So what do they do? We all know that. They start writing them down, right? Or they put them in their phones, or they email them to themselves, or they do something, right? Not providing a method to transfer large sensitive files. This file is too big to send in my email. Like I think the biggest thing, the biggest uh, file my email will send is maybe 15 meg, right? And I work in proposal land. Proposals are routinely 50 or 60 meg. So how do I get that to this guy? Well, I whip out my trusty USB key that I promise has never been put in a computer anywhere else and transfer the file. And of course, the company policy says that I can't use a personally owned USB storage device, but they don't buy me one. So um, this was a classic. So they, they realized that people were putting PII in email. And they said, oh, new policy. If you put PII, personally identifiable information, in an email, you have to encrypt the email. And I said, great. I read through the policy. Actually, it wasn't a poorly written policy. I, I was impressed. And then they had a link to the process to actually teach me how to do the encryption. It didn't exist. So, and the policy that people can't use personally owned USB storage devices, company won't buy them, there's no other way to back up a laptop. Everybody is buying USB storage devices, whether it's a thumb drive or you know, a, an SSD or something. They're gonna back up their, they're gonna protect the data on their laptop. If you don't give them a way to do it officially, they will find a way to do it on their own and increase the risk to the company. So we have to provide a balance between the cost of compliance and the need for compliance. And this is, this is my radical concept, okay? I've worked a lot in software development in the past. As a solution architect, um, I'm kind of a foot deep and five miles wide. Right, because I will write technical responses for scaled agile framework, for virtual networking, for supercomputing, for you name it, right? But I'm not really deep in any of it. But what I can say is that I've done enough software development work to know how seriously we take the human computer, well, back in the day it was called human computer interface, then it was called user experience, and now I'm hearing people call it human experience. Whatever we call it, we take that stuff seriously when we're developing websites or applications, right? We bring people in, we have them walk through wireframe models, we see how long it takes them to find something on a portal, and we track everything they do as they search for that, that um, item. We don't do any of that in our security program, right? It's almost as if we don't care about the Significant number of employees. So my company has 40,000 people in it. Maybe 2,000 of those are internal InfoSec people. So we're ignoring the other 38,000. It's almost like we don't care if they know how to use our security program because it's really for us, right? So why not test people's understanding of policy? When we make a change to a policy or we introduce a new policy, why not bring in a group of non-technical users and see if they can understand how to comply? First, do they understand what it's telling them? Second, 
Can they figure out a method to comply with it? And third, what do they think is wrong with it, right? You'll get some astounding insights if you do that. Find out what our users need. Get out there in the spaces, a Navy term when you're, you're talking about, you know, getting out into the spaces where people are working in the ship to find out what they're doing. Get out there, talk to them. What's their frustration with your security policy? What can't they do? What, are, what workarounds? Hey, asking about workarounds, you'll find amazing things that they're doing to get around your policy that you'll never know otherwise. And provide a channel for feedback. I'm still surprised that we aren't doing it. I mean, every company out there has an HR number. I guarantee you that they advertise a number that you can call if you've got an HR problem because you know, we attach big lawsuits to HR problems. But we don't do that for security. Where can we automate, right? We can't take, we can't fully remove the burden of compliance from our user's shoulders, but where we can automate like single sign-on and things like that, well, we can make it that much easier for them. And people will go, oh, but that's too expensive. You know, a small company will say, that's too expensive. Well, again, what's the cost of a breach? What's the cost of business sensitive data that you're relying upon for your next innovation getting into the hands of others? So the goal is culture change. Managers have to provide a strong example of compliance. Security professionals are there to help, not to mock and be condescending, right? I mean, I was in IT back in the 80s, and you know, it was popular to refer to users as losers. And I see a lot of that in today's security industry, right? One of the examples I was talking with someone about last night, on LinkedIn, someone posted an Amazon, uh, a link to Amazon for a, it was called a password logbook, right? Where someone could write down their account and passwords. And it's for home use. And they're like, oh, this guy's, anyone who buy that's an idiot and yada, 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 yada. And I jump in there and go, okay, so explain to me real quick, guys. You're security professionals, you know how to do risk assessments. Right? At a very basic level, a risk assessment is what's the probability of something happening and what's the impact to your business of that thing happening? So let's do a risk assessment on this password logbook that Ma and Pa Kettle are going to have at home. Well, if someone's breaking into their house, are they looking for a password logbook? Probably not. They're looking for their television, they're looking for their silver, they're looking for cash on hand, right? Maybe credit cards, if the purse or the bill folds there, but they're not looking for a password logbook, right? So when we think about our security programs at work, security programs at home, different story, right? So when we talk to users in our employ, in our organization, our company, we have to remember that you know, they're looking at security from a different context than we are, and we have to help them understand our context. We have to understand their context. So we have to get employees to feel responsibility for the organization's security. We can't do the sky is falling scenario, because they will get tired of hearing that, right? I sit through security awareness programs. I'm uh, part of a NIST, um, technical working group that puts on an annual program, an annual conference for uh, improving security awareness programs and role-based training. And I sit in there listening to presentations to us telling us about how dangerous cell phones are. I'm like, okay, so wait, if you're giving this to your users and you're telling them that cell phones are too dangerous to use, what are you giving them as an alternate? What are you doing to help them manage the threat or manage the risk of using a cell phone so that, because I guarantee you, nobody's just gonna go, oh, well, fine, I'm not gonna use my cell phone anymore, right? That's not happening. So again, if we know they're doing something in our organization that increases the risk to the organization, we have to give them an alternative. We can't just say, don't do that anymore, right? Take the time to find out why they're doing it. Why is that workaround established? and then work backwards into 
probably changing what we're doing so that they'll change what they're doing. The security awareness program goal moves from compliance to security becoming part of how everyone sees their workday, right? We have to take security from back here to up here. And the way we do that is that we help them get their jobs done with security here. User engagement is really, really, really the key to the success of, you know, in managing non-malicious security violations. If you don't understand why your, why your users are not complying, you'll never solve that problem. So human factors, I don't care what you call it, human factors, human experience, human computer interface, you name it. Go through, and, and this is a project that I'm, I'm just now starting, but I'm gonna take the security program writ large, right, and all the piece parts that are in a security program whether it's the firewall, a VPN, security policies, awareness programs, you name it, and identify everywhere in that program where a non-technical user interfaces with it. And then look at that interaction through human computer interface or UX lenses to see how we can improve that interaction. I'm not gonna say it's easy or not gonna say it's, it's, not, it's gonna be over fast, but um, I think that's what we need to do is we need to look at places, you know, and bring in HX experts to help you with your security program, help you with your policy. Prioritize the end user experience. We're too busy prioritizing our experience. We need to, again, consider the end user in this. Think about the end user trying to follow your policy in their daily work rhythm. Find out what they're doing. Avoid overly technical descriptions. Test policies for internal paradoxes because you'll, you'll see them a lot. And the best way to test them is to have someone who doesn't know the technology read the policy. And nine times out of 10, they'll go, you say to do this up here and then down here you say to do that and we can't do both. And it's like, oh, okay. So, non-malicious insiders are the biggest chunk of the insider threat problem. The malicious insiders get all the attention, right? They're the ones that, do, that can do direct damage to your organization. The non-malicious insiders, nine out of 10 of them will violate a policy and won't impact your organization. That 10th one is gonna violate a policy and open the door, right? whether it's an internal malicious insider like Snowden or an external malicious insider like Anonymous, it's gonna harm your organization. So educate people on risks, get them, give them a better understanding of why the policy is there and how to comply with it. Think about the end user trying to follow policy in the daily, daily work, bring in anyone who's doing software has HX people in their organization. Bring them in, have them, have them talk with you, have them work with you, and don't rely upon threats of punishment. Don't point to that and go, well, that's gonna make sure people comply because it doesn't. So, and all this really wraps into security awareness programs. And if your only goal for a security awareness program is check the box compliance, that's all you're gonna get. You're not gonna manage this non-malicious security violation threat. So, like I said, the slides are available, um, and that's me. Uh, if you want to get hold of me, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, and also, the slide deck um, has a list of references for where I pulled a lot of this material. Um, the Robin Sage uh, paper was presented at a, at a DEF CON way back in the day. Um, and that's it. I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. Hi, uh, so what do you think about the concept of incentivizing uh, security? So like, you know, giving people a hundred bucks to the, the first person to find a phishing email or something like that. Um. I like the idea to an extent. Um, 
you run into or you can run into the same problem, uh, and here again, this is, uh, this is a shared experience with everybody in the room, where you, know, you, get the, you, you see the ad of, of you know, come in and, and buy this and you will enter your name into a drawing for some fabulous prize, right? And you're one of 50,000 people, so what are the chances of you really winning that prize? Right? If you, if you say everybody who finds this will get this, then you'll get more of a response. But if, if it's the, you know, if you're the first caller, right? Well, how many, what's the chance of you being the first caller into the radio station to win the prize? And it's the, it's the same problem. If it's a general phishing campaign and 5,000 people get that email, the chances of you being the first one to report it, you know. So you, typically what I see there is you get a, a jump in interest and then it rapidly drops. So does the threat model on remote, on, uh, on, does the threat model change at all for remote only teams? It changes, yes, it, 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 it does change because, um, ah, five minutes. Uh, the, the way they impact and interact with the security program differs greatly. For instance, I am now, I just last summer moved from Washington DC, um, working in headquarters to um, this little fly speck of a town called Linden, just south of the Canadian border. Um, and so I'm remote, I'm 100% remote now. Um, so I'm not going to be, you know, letting anybody tailgate, um, but I can still circumvent certain things. I can still go around my VPN, right? And believe me, um, there are days when I want to because the VPN drops, you know, six or seven times a day. Um, and we use, internally we use Skype and our network isn't set up correctly because we just got acquired by somebody else. So it's a challenge. And, and it would be easy for me to say, hey, let's just have our meeting on Zoom. Right? Um, so definitely the model changes, but the threat is still there. So the question I have is, uh, based on what, uh, what we have seen in uh, like when we rolled out security awareness is, is more about how does security helps you while even at your home? Now, it's not only about company. But what about you protecting your family and friends at home? And those are the devices, especially if you're talking about the remote users, these are the devices connected to your enterprise network. So if there's something in for them, not only about company, then I think there's a generally a very well accepted uh, security awareness that goes out there. Yeah, so the, the question was about um, security awareness for, it, for your employees at home. And, um, one of the things I do is I'm a regular presenter for NASA's um, agency-wide security awareness program. And one thing I admire about their awareness program is that they intersperse sessions for um, work and home. Um, like I've, I've talked to their employees about um, social media security at home, right? And they get a really, really good response. You just need to make sure that you clearly delineate, right? whether you're making recommendations for home or, or recommendations for work. But yeah, employees generally respond really well to that because now there's a study, and I'm not gonna remember who did it, but it was way back in the 40s. And they were trying to decide whether, uh, I think it was autom automobile plant employees worked better with bright lights or dim lights, right? So they would change the lights and measure productivity. And it turns out that the productivity increase they saw was because the employees knew the study was happening and they felt like, hey, they care about us. The light level didn't make a difference. Just the fact that, hey, my employer cares about me increased productivity. To your point, right? Hi there. Um, you talk about this third phase. How, how do you, do you, is there a, a good sort of methodical way to go about identifying how big it is? 
yes, it's a third face, but is it like 10%, is it 30%, 33.3% of the, of, the, of the issue? Because ultimately you still have to um, focus on getting the most value out of your security awareness. So right. I would imagine there's a bunch of sort of uh, environmental items related to determining whether this is a big deal in this company or not. Like, uh, did they just did we just take away their local admin rights and they had them for 20 years, or right. uh, is it a lot of team collaboration in this company, or uh, is there a lot of uh, mobile workers? I mean, all, all these items must sort of play into that, right? Yeah, and so. The short answer is no. Um, I have not seen that yet. Um, what, in order to do that, you need to, I mean, you'd have to deploy an incredible number of sensors, right? You'd have to be able to detect if someone was tailgating through a door. You'd have to be able to figure out if someone, and you know, some companies do this, they, they can detect if someone is sending a business-oriented email to their Gmail account, right? And, and filter that. Um, but that's the kind of stuff you'd have to do, and you still won't catch all of them, but you would be able to measure the size of the problem. Right now, the research is just saying, you know, anecdotally, you walk around your organization, you see people doing these things, you know it's a problem. And then the big stories that we, we see where it was obviously a non-malicious breach or a non-malicious insider that allowed a major breach. They point to those, but I haven't seen any actual metrics. I think that's it. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's it. Um, if you have any other questions, please give me a shout. This I love to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, have a great rest of the conference.
Hello, everybody. Are you enjoying the conference so far? Everyone having a good time? They do a pretty good job here, right? This is a fun conference. I was here last year, and I really like it. So my talk today is about, are you ready for cloud pen test? My name is Terry Rudickel. I have a company in Seattle called Second Sight Lab. And I do a couple of things. I do some training. Um, I used to train for Sands Institute, and now I wrote my own class, which is a little different. And I also do some pen testing, because it's fun, right? And some other consulting. So I'm going to talk to you today about, are you ready for a cloud pen test? Pen testing is cool, right? It's fun. Every time I talk about pen testing or I tweet about pen testing, everyone's following and liking it. Um, many people aspire to be a pen tester. Even my friend who runs a, a restaurant, he talks to me about how I should have been a hacker. I'm like, OK. So it's just really cool. But the thing is that attacking things and breaking into them is so much harder than actually defending them. So I just want to call that out. Um, we should really be in awe of the defenders. But pen testing is good because we check our systems and make sure there are no vulnerabilities. So I just wanted to set the record straight here and give you some expectations. If you came here looking for the latest and greatest ways to hack all the cloud systems, this is not really what this talk is all about. You may pick up some tips or things you didn't know, but that's not the core focus of this talk. The focus of this talk is, are you ready for a pen test? Because I've been doing a lot of pen tests for customers, and I just think, wow, if we could have done this a little bit differently, maybe we could have had better results. Maybe you could have optimized the use of my time. And also, sometimes it took a long time to get things kind of set up. Some of that just got easier. I'm going to talk to you about that as well. So why, in first place, why do we need a cloud pen test? Or why do we need a pen test at all? Well, first of all, there's compliance. And there are different types of compliance that require you to have a pen test. And this may be explicit. Um, you can't read this, obviously, but the PCI compliance requirements are very explicit that say you need a pen test. And why do we need PCI compliance? Because if you don't have it, you could lose your ability to process credit cards. So we need a pen test for that depending on what level different types of testing is required. Um, other types of compliance, like HIPAA, will say you need to test your systems to make sure they're secure. Well, how are you going to test your systems? Probably it's going to be a pen test. Um, you're going to be looking at the security and testing it to try to figure out if someone could break in. And the other thing is, even if you don't need compliance, you may choose to do a pen test because you want to prove that someone could get into your system. Maybe you want to prove to your developers that there are problems, or you want to prove to your executives that, you know, look, we need to secure these things because here's what someone could do. That's another reason for a pen test. It's not to prove that someone won't be able to attack your system. Now, what do I mean by that? Attackers have years. They have years to plan and look at your systems and analyze them. They have years to try out different things. They also might just get lucky. They're scanning the internet for everything, and they catch you on that day that your ports are open. A pen tester usually has days or weeks, maybe longer, but not years to go and, and try to attack all your systems. So it's a limited time frame. So in that time frame, chances are they won't be able to find every single thing about your systems, but they can definitely find a lot of the major vulnerabilities that you have out there and a lot of things maybe you didn't know about. OK, so um, what do we have to do pre to prepare? So we need to do some documentation, first of all. And some of the documentation that we need to do first is a mutual NDA because the pen tester will have things that they're using to test your systems that might be proprietary, and you have things that you don't want to get out and be public. So you usually start there. The next thing we'll do is we'll define the scope of the test. So we'll be talking a lot more about that and how you do that in the cloud, how that's different from on-premises. The other thing that we need to do is our rules of engagement. The rules of engagement are you know, when are you going to test? What time of day are you going to test? Who are, do you call if there's a problem? Um, just sort of the rules of the road when we're going through the test. 
And then finally, um, we have the contract. So the contract is going to define, you know, the time and the amount of money and things like that. If you're doing this, obviously, if you're doing this internally in your own organization, you might not have a contract, but you will still have, you know, some of this documentation to talk about how you're going to go about that pen test. So um, what you don't have to have anymore used to be that the cloud providers, especially AWS and Azure, would require you to submit a request before you did your pen test. And uh, you would have to, in the case of AWS, for example, go get those root credentials they tell you never to use and pull them out of the safe or wherever you have them and go submit this request. And the other thing I was able to work out was to do an account to account pen test because I was having discussions with various people about at Amazon how fixed IP addresses in the cloud were kind of anti-cloud. And so I was able to do some things like that, but you still had to submit a test and you still had to submit DNS and, and other things. And that changed recently and it's kind of funny. So I'll tell you about my last request. Um, so I was doing a class and I do a pen testing exercise, and so I wanted to submit all the students' account numbers, and I forgot to get their account names. And I was like, oh, man. So I submitted this test, or this request. I said, can you please approve it without the names? If I have to go get them, I will. But some of the people in this department know me by now, or I think some of the people do. I don't know how many. Um, and I was just crossing my fingers that somehow this would magically go through. And then I got back this email which is interesting, and they said, you now need to submit a pen test request, and I had never heard this before, and, and there's some, still some rules here. I was like, wow, cool, that's awesome. And I had been talking to people at Amazon about this, so I was really excited. I also had it on, there's something called the AWS wish list where you can put in you know, requests, and they'll sometimes grant them. So I went and put it on Twitter, like, hey, cool, you know, this, look, this happened. And then I went off to teach class, and I came back, and uh, you can see here I had like 1,300 likes and um, 836 people talking about this that actually got written up in GeekWire. Um, it wasn't on the AWS website yet when I got the email and I had posted it. And uh, some VP at Amazon and some other people confirmed it was legitimate. So uh, that was kind of funny. But the moral of the story is you no longer have to submit these requests. So you are allowed to go ahead and go up there and test whenever you want. Um, but you still need permission, right? You, that doesn't mean you can just go test anything you want, any way you want. And it was kind of funny, I had a guy contact me on LinkedIn and said, I don't understand, does this mean that I can just go attack everything now? And I was like, no, 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 no. That's not what that means. And so I just want to clarify, you still need permission. You can only attack your own things. Um, and you can only test systems, either you have permission or you are the owner, right? Um, you can't test anything that's off limits per the cloud provider, so they have rules, and we'll talk about some of those. But for basic testing, you don't have to go out and fill out that form. So you still may want to submit a form. Um, even on Azure, it says, you might want to let us know. Now, why would you want to do that? Um, well, you may want to test something that's on our, their list, so you may have to put in a request for that. Or in the case of Azure, you may want to say, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm doing a test because they have a lot of auto automated systems that might just shut you down if they don't know you're doing a test. So it's nice to do. And um, I did a, a podcast, my first ever, with uh, Tanya Jenka, who's doing the keynote tomorrow. She's awesome, you should all go listen to her. And uh, we did a, a talk on this, and she actually walks through how to do this on Azure. So if you wanna go uh, see that, you can take a look. So, What's different in the cloud? We don't have to fill out these requests anymore so much, so what are the differences that you need to worry about? Well, first of all, there are dynamic resources in the cloud. We don't have those fixed assets anymore, right? We don't have a server at a specific IP address that never changes. And that was one of the things that was difficult about these scoping um, kind of forms that you had to fill out and put in IP addresses. Because if you have, if you guys are familiar with auto scaling groups, you can have servers go up and servers go down and IP addresses change. And every time a developer stops or starts a system, um, the address will change. So in the cloud, we wanna, we wanna handle that differently. Um, also, we have layer four and up in the cloud. So there are some things you might be used to doing 
in a pen test that you just don't have access to anymore. We have a lot of new technologies and configurations. We're going to talk about that as well. And some underlying architecture differences in the way the clouds implement things. So they're not exactly like you're used to. That affects some of the attacks that you're used to doing, and we'll, I'll show you some of those. So for the dynamic resources, what do we do? That the IPs are always changing. You know, things are going up and down. So when you're doing a cloud pen test and you're getting that scope from your customer or when you're the customer giving that scope, you really want to focus on domain names, right? Because those are going to be more constant. You know what those are. And then as the test is going on, you want to constantly verify that you are uh, using the correct IP addresses associated with that domain name. Because what could happen is you're testing a particular IP address and systems go down and you know you go take a break and come back a couple days later, you start testing that IP address, uh, P address again and suddenly you're testing out some server that doesn't belong to that customer and that could be a problem, right? And then we have these things like Lambda, Azure and Google Functions, serverless, right? They're always coming down, up changing all the time. So those IPs are going to be constantly changing. So we're going to have to use those domain names to track all these things. The other thing we have is layer four and up. So pretty much everything you have access to in the cloud is layer four and up. Um, so anything that you're used to testing below that, routers, switches, things like that, inside the cloud, you won't have access to. I just took an advanced pen testing class from SANS Institute, and it was all about how to attack VLANs and switches and routers and all these things. I'm like, that's cool. But it doesn't help you inside the cloud. It helps you outside the cloud. And it still could help you, as I'll talk about, but not in the cloud. Um, and then your web applications, if you think about it, it's mostly the same because it's layer four and up. They're hosted on, you know, except for if you're doing a Lambda function, you know, it could be up and down really quickly, you got functions behind the scenes, but a lot of the testing is the same, the same type of attacks, the OWASP top 10, things like that, they're pretty much gonna be the same. And why is it layer four and up? Because when you're in the cloud, there's something called the, the responsibility model, and all the clouds pretty much talk about it like this. And this is, if you guys are familiar with the OSI model, and there's kind of the seven layers of you know, networking that packets go through. And pretty much you have the top part and you're responsible for that top part. You have to look at your contracts, obviously, to understand this in a lot more detail. But the cloud provider will be responsible for everything below that. So you're kind of not allowed to, to um, test their stuff. And on that note, only what is allowed you can test. So every cloud provider is going to have some pen testing rules are gonna tell you here's what's allowed they're going to have terms of service, acceptable use policy, the, they all have a pen testing page, and they kind of walk through, here's what you're allowed to test and here's what you're not. And generally, you're not allowed to cloud, test the cloud platform itself. And um, some of the other things to consider are what actions you can take. So there are different actions that pen testers usually take, and a lot of times the scope document will list out all these actions, and the customer will say, yes, I want this kind of test and that kind of test, and go down a list, and there are some things that are disallowed by the cloud provider. So when you're doing that scope document, you need to understand what you can and cannot do in the cloud. Um, additionally, resource sizes, I think they used to be more restrictive, if I'm remembering correctly, on AWS. I was just looking at this page again, and it looks like it's a suggestion now. They used to say, you can't test nano instances. Now it's more like, hey, if you're, we want your test to be successful, so you might not want to test these small instance sizes, but it didn't look like a mandate anymore. But you want to understand those sizes and those things you're testing and make sure that your scope documents state that if, if you don't want people testing that smaller size. So here's just an example of AWS and what is just loud, uh, DNS zone walking, uh, denial of service, port flooding, pretty much anything that's going to overwhelm the systems because as you know, in the cloud, it's a shared environment. So what you're testing on a shared infrastructure may affect the other customers around it. So they don't want you to do that kind of thing. And Azure pretty, just, pretty much just says no denial of service attacks and it talks about that a little more. So um, there are different types of tools that you can use in the cloud, and some of them are called pre-authorized on AWS, 
and they are already set up to follow the rules. So if you use these type of tools, they will already be you know, following the rules and they've already got approval from AWS. And so you, if you're not sure about all these rules, you could just use one of those. And here's an example, so Nessus, you can see here that it says in the title pre-authorized. And I think this really relates back to the days when you had to submit a form for any type of scanning. But you, you can still use these tools and know you're pretty safe and not going to get in trouble with the cloud provider. Uh, the other thing we have in the cloud are new types of configurations. So have any of you heard of an S3 bucket? <laughs> we had a few problems with those, right? Um, they're not something you have on premises. So you have, that's just one example of something that has a configuration in the cloud. It's different. It's this newfangled thing with the funny name. Every single service in the cloud has documentation and configuration, and you'll want to understand it. You want to know what it should be. You want to know the caveats of when it's done wrong, and, and those are the type of things that your pen tester will be looking at. Then um, we have uh, new technology stacks. So, you know, there's just a talk on serverless. We've got containers, container management systems, and uh, new types of storage. So we have all these different things, and uh, there's definitely a lot of ways that these can be misconfigured. And there's also been malware that has affected, for example, DNS Mask um, is a service that got impacted with a vulnerability, and it's part of Kubernetes. So understanding those vulnerabilities. Additionally, there's a lot of problems with people misconfiguring containers and giving them too much access, basically root access um, to the container, which ends up being able to take over the whole server, um, port misconfigurations, so there's a lot of problems. And I think some of these technologies are new and people don't really understand fully how to configure them. So we'll be looking at some of those and trying to you know, see if there's a problem there to break in when you're pen testing. And then uh, you also have the cloud provider tools. So the cloud, when you're talking about Amazon, Azure and Google, it's really one big programmatic platform. Like to say it's a big configuration management platform. They come with tools, and their tools are awesome for developers, right? Developers can code things, they can write code that automatically changes the cloud platform, they can automatically patch things, um, they can go in and do all these cool things in an automated fashion over the network. So can malware. <laughs> So can a pen tester, right? So if you can get handle, handle on those credentials and you can use these same tools when you're pen testing and just want to be aware of that. So before you do a pen test, you might want to take a look at how you have these things configured and, and am I doing it according to the best practices. Um, some other things are the platform differences. So in Amazon specifically, they don't do networking in a normal way. Behind the scenes, they don't do ARP. It will look like ARP to you potentially if you're doing a packet capture on an instance, but under the hood, there's a whole long video about how they have this mapping service and they actually wrap the packets when they leave the NIC in their own custom headers. And so as they're going through their network, there's like three different checks to make sure that packet is allowed and can go the right place. So what does this mean to a pen tester? One of the pen testers' favorite things to do is ARP, uh, ARP spoofing, right? It's not going to work because it just doesn't work that way on Amazon. So people go out there and try this. It won't work, and you'll also probably get a nasty gram from Amazon saying, don't do that. Um, and I have an article a little bit more in depth. On, um, I have a blog out here where I explain kind of this mapping service. And um, as I mentioned, there's also a, like an hour-long video from AWS reInvent and you can find on that topic. So we have different kinds of tools. And you have your old tried and true methods. You have Metasploit, um, BERT, things like that. And they have some cloud modules built into them. I find them, find them kind of limited, but they're out there. They have some tools. And then you have some new tools coming out, like a company called uh, Rhino Security Labs in Seattle. And they built a tool called Paku. Um, I was talking to them when they're just starting building this tool. They're like, what can we do? And I told them a bunch of things that I'd seen maybe misconfigured at a prior company I worked at. And so they went out there and they built this tool, and they really work on 
being stealthy. So there's a page on Amazon Web Services that tells you what doesn't get logged, and they use that. And they also use the, the tools out there, um, the, the Amazon tools to break into your account, things like that. So there are new tools coming out. Um, in some cases, I just find it easy to use the AWS CLI. It's very powerful. Once you understand it, you can do almost anything. Um, Azure has you know, CLI or PowerShell as well. And if any of you are familiar with the term living off the land, that's kind of what you're doing in the cloud, right? A lot of pen testers will go out and they'll use Bash or Command Line and they'll be able to do all kinds of things without installing any tools. And the cloud platforms are the same way. A lot of times the VMs will have privileges to do things. And if you can get a handle on those CLIs and things like that, then you can do a lot in the cloud. Oh, and at the last part I just want to mention, um, whoops, the last point I wanted to mention was also you probably use a combination of these old and new tools. So you'll be using the CLI, but you may also be using your old techniques. So you're breaking into a website and you're kind of using your standard web attack and once you get in onto that instance, then you will be using the AWS CLI to navigate through the system. So it's probably a combination of things. And there's a lot of resources out there, so I just listed two here. There's a great, um, Tony Blicks is a person that has posted a bunch of tools, so he kind of tracks a whole bunch of tools in AWS that you can use and includes Paco and a whole bunch of other things. And then uh, Microsoft has a pen testing uh, website as well. You can take a look at it for more information. So lots of good resources out there. And so how does that all affect your pen test? What happens is when you understand all these things, um, it will affect how you scope out your pen test. Um, you're gonna wanna hire someone who understands the cloud, right, to, to do this. You're going to want to define domain names instead of IP addresses. Uh, you wanna understand the cloud provider requirements. And then the last one here is um, get someone technical in the scoping process. Because all these things like gobbledygook to a person who is not technical, right? So when you're trying to define the scope of your pen test, get you know, someone on your security team or someone on your IT team to help with that scoping. Otherwise, it's just, it takes a while or you might miss things. So here's some of the things you can look at for scope, right? Now, sometimes companies will say, well, we're testing in the cloud, so we're just gonna test the cloud itself, and that's it. We're gonna look at the cloud platform, we're gonna look at, I told you about the CLI and the configurations, and that's it. But as I mentioned, sometimes a combination attack can be used where someone will break into a website, then they'll get onto a system. You might wanna think about that. Um, and there's another, a lot of other components here, so VPNs, um, exposed databases, is happening a lot recently, exposed Elastic Cache, um, MongoDB, things like that. Um, you have a lot of you know, GitHub credentials being posted online or internally, whatever source control you use, is that part of your scope? Um, you have your, uh, there's a lot of other DevOps tools as well. So Jenkins has had vulnerabilities and things like that. Um, your credentials are very important. You wanna take a look at that. And then if you have internal servers that have access to the cloud, you know, maybe if you look at the cloud alone, it seems fine, but when you go take a look at these other servers, maybe there's some way to break in. So all these things play into defining that scope for a pen test. And maybe all you want is the cloud, and that's great, but maybe you want to expand it a little bit. So for network access, you have, as I mentioned, uh, it just took an advanced test where we're looking at routers and VLANs and things like that. And so you may want to include network resources in your pen test and find out if somehow they could be leveraged to access cloud resources when you know, networks are supposed to be segregated, but really they're not. Um, and you have developers calling APIs all over the place, all different kind of networks, calls, and where are those going? Are some of those going to the wrong place? Um, people are logging into the console, right? Are their browsers secure? Things like that. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the network equipment. Um, you also have a, a mashup of the connected things, right? So sometimes you'll have like a Slack server and it'll be, uh, something will happen and it will trigger an event and it'll go to Slack server or it'll go to PagerDuty or some other type of service now, something like that, you know? So you have all these different connected tools. Do you want to include any of those that are kind of connected and triggering events? 
um, in the cloud and uh, third party systems, I just mentioned that. Um, anything that you want in or out of scope should be listed there. And then the cloud platform, as I mentioned, is definitely out of scope. So anything on the cloud platform, um, you cannot test and you will probably get a message saying, what are you doing if you are testing it? Um, and you should definitely respond right away and apologize and stop doing it. Um, <laughs> this is a good idea. Otherwise, you could um, lose access to your account, potentially. And the other thing is some, is some services are just completely off limits. So for example, Cognito is a service that is used to log into applications. It started out as mobile, but now it's also used for web applications. And I was testing for a client and I was like, where is my request going? Because typically you define the scope and you make sure you're not hitting the wrong addresses and so on. And I'm testing their login page and then I realized, oh, it's going to Cognito in between and that's off limits. So I can't test that. So at that point, you're trusting the cloud provider that they have secured that particular service. Um, so then you have your web applications, and I'm a big fan of testing those web applications when you do a cloud pen test, because as I said, there's a lot of mashup attacks, and there's a lot of ways that getting onto any uh, cloud server will then be a doorway into the cloud. It will also potentially be a point of exfiltration. Um, they can be used for pivoting. So there's a lot of good reasons why you will want to include these um, in your tests. Another thing to consider with web pen testing is you may want to not only test, you know, let's say you have that login page with Cognito and now I'm stuck because I can't really test that. You may want to give your pen tester credentials to your systems that you're testing. And the reason you want to do that is because once they log in, there's a whole bunch of other pages that can be breached. And this was the starting point of the target breach. A lot of people think that in target there is the HVAC system was attacked, but it wasn't. It was a vendor who would log in to a vendor system, and that vendor system, once the attacker got credentials, got access to a whole bunch of other pages, and then it was able to either escalate privileges or somehow pivot throughout the network. So when you're doing your web, and it's not specific to cloud, but think about testing not only the login page, but beyond that, and make sure there's no way if someone got in, they could pivot throughout your cloud. Um, so, optimizing your results. So, um, one of the things you can think about is have you had an assessment? So, assessments and pen tests are two very different things. Um, an assessment is not going to try to break in, but it will be more broad and look at things, um, you know, maybe in a broader way, looking for all your vulnerabilities to a different level, depending on what you're doing. But maybe you want to do that first, right? Because if you've never had a pen test, maybe you just want to find out about all those vulnerabilities and get those fixed before you take the next step. Um, one thing you can think about is, uh, are, are you able to do some pen testing yourself? So if you go out and look at Burp, make sure you have permission like I mentioned, but if you go out and look at Burp or Zed Web Attack Proxy, which is free, it's really easy to run these scans. So maybe you could do some basic scanning yourself so that I don't have to write a 60 page report of a bunch of really simple stuff, right? Get that out of the way and go ahead and um, find those things and get them fixed before you hire a pen tester so they can focus on the, you know, the tougher attacks, the harder things, the logic errors. Um, another thing you can do is make sure you're following the best practices. So just go out to the cloud provider, read those be best practices, make sure that you are following them. And another thing to consider is giving a pen tester read-only access to the account because if you do, um, one of the things a pen test typically starts with was I'm going to scan all the network and I'm going to find all the open ports, right? And if a pen tester is still, they're going to find all the open ports. It's just going to take them a lot longer to do it. If you give someone read access, only access to the account, um, they can quickly scan that network and find out and, and do some queries in a lot less time and figure out what are the open ports, what are the things they need to focus on in the test that could potentially be vulnerable. It's a choice. You can either say, I want this to be like, you know nothing about the account, go after it, or you could maybe save them some time that way. Um, and again, assessment versus pen test. Assessment, we're not going to actually break into the account. We're going to review everything for best practices. And in some cases, I've found more problems because you can go a lot faster in assessment. You have 
a lot more access to information and you can quickly find a lot of problems versus a pen test, you're kind of black box looking from the outside trying to find problems. So um, it's just a, something you want to think about. Um, do you follow best practices? I mentioned that. So there's a number of best practices out there. AWS has the well-architected framework for one thing. They, ha they can walk you through a lot of questions. And on Azure, they have Azure Scaffold. Um, we've got CIS, which is the CS best, best practices. I think I have those on the next page. Um, and you can look through those. Another one is, oh, do you, if you have a network team, have they um, reviewed the network as well? So I just mentioned the CIS benchmark. They have a whole bunch of different best practices that you can look at, and they'll cover things like Kubernetes and Docker and Azure and AWS. There's a lot of information out there. So before you do that pen test, why not go out there and, and make sure that you're following those best practices as much as you can? Um, and then you can uh, fix the issue before a tester comes in. And then uh, are all your cloud security services enabled? Do you have all the services turned on? A lot of times when I get into account, I'll find, and maybe some customers don't want this, so maybe you could tell your pen tester up front, yes, we don't have this logging turned on, we don't want to, it costs too much, we have something else. But a lot of times I find that a lot of the services don't have logging turned on, something to report on, so you could go make sure you understand all the logging and, and turn it on in your system, or know what you don't want turned on. And then um, the mobility scanners, you guys can run those as well. It's not rocket science. You just go out and get a vulnerability scanning tool, run it through your system, make sure you know your CVs and patching are up to date. Probably most of you are doing this uh, anyway, but it's just something you want to make sure you probably do before your pen tester gets there. And then a big one is thinking about how you use credentials. So um, in some cases, credentials are just wide open and everyone has you know, a lot of access, and this can be a problem in the cloud. So maybe you want to think about, you know, before you do a pen test, think about how you can limit those privileges and segregate duties with your account, right? Um, because people should not have full-on admin access. Um, I actually know one company, that a person at a company I used to work with who had the special keys, who could do anything in the account, and the red team basically broke in and put a cron job on his system. And he's like, that's not fair. I'm like, why is that not fair? The attackers could do that too, right? So if you have someone with really broad access, or a lot of people with really broad access, you might want to think about, well, before I have a pen test, maybe I need to figure out this, how I'm giving people access to the system and narrow down the use of those credentials. And then definitely, you also want to have MFA everywhere you possibly can, right? Doesn't always solve every problem, but uh, you do want to try to make sure you have limited those permissions. Um, and so the standard credential attacks are going to work for the cloud. They may not be in the cloud, but if you think about it, the, I just mentioned the a person who had the special keys, right? They have a lot of access. The same type of attacks to get those keys, um, depending on how your system's set up. In some cases, the keys are in a text file, in plain text on the system. In other cases, they are rotated. If you're using uh, AWS STS, for example, they're rotated, but they're still there. Um, and so if someone can get a handle on those, they could use those credentials. Um, just the same way, you know, in Mimikatz, you grab credentials. If you're using AD, um, same thing works in the cloud. So all that still applies. And so this goes back to you know, your scope, and do you want to do that kind of testing outside the cloud, or are you just focusing purely in the cloud? Um, phishing and, and social engineering still work, right? Any way we can get those credentials, if I can get ad admin credentials to your cloud, I'm pretty much game over at that point, right? I can do whatever I want. So we want to try to prevent that. Okay, and um, developers and networking, special note, uh, there are a lot of developers that just got into networking in the cloud because they wanted to use the cloud. They're really excited and they got out there, maybe before the IT team or the security team or the networking team. And so they're building the networking, and I've seen a lot of you know, default networking in that case, where there's no knuckles, or um, in most of the clouds, the default networking is not very much locked down. And so they'll just use the defaults. And so that will give your pen tester a lot of options, right? So it's something you may want to look at before a pen tester comes in, how I properly seg segregated my network, and um, if you are a pen tester, something good to look for, right? 
the wide open outbound access definitely helps with pivoting. It's very nice, thank you. Um, so yeah, you wanna look out for those things. And then, this is funny, but is your system complete? Um, because if your system's not complete, it's, it's really good, I, I'm torn on this one because I like the idea of getting out there early and testing early. But on the other hand, if your system's not complete, then sometimes an error can occur that just blocks and takes down the whole system. Um, and, or it's, it's, you can't get very far in the system. So how do you know how effective your pen test is when the system's not complete? So maybe you wanna wait till your system's in a more complete state. You can still do an assessment, a vulnerability scan, or maybe you just want a preliminary quick pen test for obvious problems, something like that. But uh, if you do that, just make sure you come back again after you know the system is complete because there could be problems that are just blocking testing from getting past a certain point. And I have experienced that as a matter of fact, so that's why I mention it. Um, and then uh, I talked about the basic pen test here with um, Burp and Z Attack Proxy. You can go out there and get those tools. They're easy to run. Uh, there's probably a million videos on them for the basic scanning. You know, get out there and run those scans yourself or get, in some cases, you can even integrate Burp Suite. They have some automation now that you can integrate into your DevOps pipeline. So maybe you just wanna run those basic scans up front, get some of that stuff out of the way. Um, oh, and I already mentioned this. So you can give uh, your testers read-only access and there's a lot of information that can, vary. It can be checked with read-only access, so um, it will save time. It will probably help you get a better pen test in a shorter amount of time. It depends what your objectives are. If you want a black box test and you don't want to give them any information, that's fine. Um, if you want a more thorough test, then uh, giving those read-only credentials will help them get farther faster. And then um, assessing best practices. So, if, uh, you know, in addition to pen testing, I like to do other things with the pen test. It depends on the customer, but, you know, looking at those best practices and telling customers, like, hey, notice you're, you've got all these open network ports or, you know, your, you know, other things besides just, hey, I, I hacked into this thing, but it's things that could lead to a problem as well down the road. Um, and that can be helpful. Another thing that sometimes I do is a, a cloud architecture review. And so you can consider before you do a pen test, do you want a cloud architecture review to say, hey, we need to segregate our network better um, and we don't know how to do that or, you know, or we want someone to review it and tell us if we're following best practices. So uh, an architecture review might be a good thing to do before you do a pen test as well, right? So you can find out if you kind of have a good setup there. A pen test is gonna go in and maybe find a path and attack one thing, but it's not gonna look at your overall architecture and say, hey, that looks good, or you know, you might want some more segregation or something like that. Um, for the architecture review, I've had the case where the customer says, just log in and look at our stuff, you know, read only in the account. It's better if you can provide some documentation or you know, interviews with, with uh, developers and things like that to understand it better. But it's just a recommendation because sometimes the pen testing, it's really fun, you get to run a lot of tools and scanning and stuff, but sometimes I wonder, would the customer be better off if I just gave them an architecture review initially and, and kind of help them get set up? These are choices you have. And so, in summary, our, our, the other thing is, are you ready to fix it? Um, a lot of companies will get a pen test and the next year they'll get a pen test and they'll have the same results. The next year they'll get a pen test and they'll have the same results. So when you're planning for your pen test, plan for your fixes, right? Does someone have time to go out and look at these things? Does someone have time to assess the risk? You may choose not to fix some things. You may say, we accept this risk, but make sure when you get the pen test, you have the time and the resources follow on. And of course, you're just trying to get done for compliance, whatever, but if you have this set up, you know, make use of it and go fix the things after the fact. And so, let's pen test. <laughs> so after all that, let's go pen test. So we've got, you know, you've defined your scope, you've, you've thought through all these problems, you're like, okay, I want an assessment or architecture or I want pen test or I want all of the above. And then uh, maybe you just want a pen test because you have to do compliance. But whatever the case, um, at this point, 
hopefully you're prepared and you've thought through all the issues. And, uh, and if, you do, if you do think about these things up front, and the kind of the purpose of this talk is hopefully for the amount of money you're spending, you'll get more meaningful results on your pen test. That's my talk. <laughs> and I can take questions, but I was told that you have to get the microphone, otherwise you don't get to ask. Uh, yeah, that works. Um, so I don't want to kind of give an orthogonal comment, but um, have you ever uh, tried using um, a tool by NCC called Scout2? That one is, I haven't personally used it, but it is on that list of pen testing tools that I put up from Tony Blux. I was just looking at it going, oh, I should try that one. Yeah, I that, have, I mean, that one is excellent for uh, finding things in cloud configuration that are incorrect, like say, for example, EBS encryption not enabled or things that are like the S3 bucket stuff as well you were talking about. I've, I've had really good success with that recently, so I just wanted to shout out that. Yeah, that one's good, and also um, um, Prowler does the same thing. It goes through all the CS best practices. It tells you all the problems, and then it also has like its own little bonus problems that it tells you, so all the same stuff. Great, I'll check that out, thanks. Yeah. I think there's like number one and number two on that list. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Um, for objective-bound uh, pen testing engagements, um, what type of common objectives do you see um, in these type of engagements? Um, okay, so what are the objectives that customers have? So it could be different. Uh, it could be I want to find out if someone could get my developer credentials and use them in the cloud. It could be I want to know if someone can steal my sensitive data. I've also had someone say, I want to know if someone could get to our Bastion host, which was completely locked in the network. So I spent a lot of time, this is where the scanning the network thing came in. I spent a lot of time scanning the network, and it turns out after I got access, I found that it was all blocked off inside the network. So it just depends, but those are the types of things that people may be looking for. They may be thinking about a specific type of access, or they may be thinking about a specific like, if we lost this data, this would just be devastating to our company, right? So it's usually something related to the company objectives that is highest priority. So the question I have is about defense in depth and testing that in cloud penetration testing engagements. One thing I found is if I'm able to breach one of their cloud accounts, it's game over for all of their infrastructure. What are some common, one, what are some common points for defense and depth steps for your cloud infrastructure? And two, how can we as penetration testers really show that value? That's an excellent question. I think that gets to the heart of why I'm saying some of the things I'm saying in this talk, because sometimes um, in cloud accounts, they're like, oh yeah, we just trust our developers to go in and do everything, or they haven't really thought through their networking strategy or something. They have a lot of really open networking. So I think, you know, potentially doing an architecture review or an assessment up front to say, hey, go fix all these things, then I'll come back. You know, maybe put in that network segregation, put in some MFA, limit your privileges so you have different teams. You don't have like one super admin, but you have different teams with different. So when you get those credentials, you're only getting so far. Thank you. Have you, have you ever encountered any situations where uh, your client has asked you to perform more, let's say, advanced attacks once you've got a foothold, like a, a side channel attack or hypervisor escape that could be particularly risky in a, in a cloud environment? I haven't gone that far, and also you'd, I think you'd have to check with the cloud provider, because I think at that point you may be testing their infrastructure, so you might get into a little trouble there. I know some researchers have done that, but the tax, there was a recent vulnerability run C for containers, but some of the other tax are much older. So I haven't heard about a lot of VM escapes lately. Anyone else? No, I think we're good. All right, thank you everybody.
All right, hey everybody. <clears throat> My name is Ben Wiley. Uh, I'm an associate consultant at uh, Mandiant's Denver office, uh, Denver, Colorado, where I do uh, incident response, digital forensics, and uh, general security consulting. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, a stock analyst for a couple years at a major energy company uh, in the US. Uh, and for fun, enjoy traveling, spending time with my family, spending time outside, which is why I'm really, really happy to be in Vancouver right now. It's, it's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so today's topic is going to be uh, a case study on SHIM database persistence and then um, techniques for detecting and hunting uh, malicious SHIMs. So a little bit about FIN7, um, the threat actor behind our, uh, our case study here. Uh, they've been active since late 2015. Uh, FireEye's been tracking them since that time. Uh, they're financially motivated, hence the name FIN7. Uh, and their primary objective is typically a point of sale compromise. So they want to infect the systems that, that uh, process, you know, you, when, you were, uh, when you swipe your credit card at a restaurant or a grocery store or wherever. Um, so far in the US, they've compromised over 100, uh, 100 companies in 47 different states, uh, primarily targeting the restaurant industry, gaming industry, hospitality, but really anyone, any, any company that, that uses point of sale systems a lot, they're, they're, you're, a, you're a potential target. Um, <clears throat> the U.S. government announced in August of last year that three members had been arrested. Um, they'd been arrested all, you know, all over the world, but they're being extradited to the U.S. Uh, but since that time, we really haven't seen any like downtick in activity because they're, they're so well-funded. There's, there's so many people in FIN7 uh, that there's been no difference. And interestingly enough, uh, at that same time, the U.S. government released information about uh, Combi Security, which was a... Uh, basically a front company for FIN7 that they use to hire like legitimate uh, uh, coders, people to like um, receive packages and send off packages for them. Um, they might have even hired like offensive folks uh, through the company who they, all these people thought was a legit, legitimate company doing, you know, penetration tests on these actual victims. It's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. I would listen to a presentation just on that, honestly. Um, <clears throat> so this is a targeted attack lifecycle diagram. It's basically, um, uh, this is a framework that Mandiant built over looking over uh, you know, hundreds to thousands of um, compromises, um, breaking them into like different stages. Uh, <clears throat> the thing I think that, that you should really get out of this particular slide is the interesting mix of uh, custom built malware, that's all the malware up there that has weird names like bird dog and textmate. And then the, the, the over the counter stuff like Cobalt Strike and Metasploit and Mimikatz and uh, stuff that you would, you would kind of not necessarily expect to see with like an advanced actor, I guess. <clears throat> but the thing about Fin7 and why they've been successful for so long is because you know they will elevate their game when they need to, and they will build custom malware, and they'll find like unique ways of hiding it from you. But they'll also just drop a drop, a, you know, a reverse shell via an interpreter, uh, and have no problem with that because it's if they know it probably won't be detected. So, you know, this little story here is based on an, uh, uh, a breach that dates back to 2017, but we can't really you know, tell you who it was, uh, what the company was, our customer was, but, but uh, let's just say it was, a, it was a restaurant chain, right? And that they received a uh, common point of purchase notification. Basically, what that means is like a credit card company like Visa um, probably called them up and said, hey, we've got you know, 10,000, 20,000 cards credit cards that all had fraudulent activity on them, and the one thing they had in common was they were used at one of your stores. Uh, and so that's how they found out about, uh, about this malicious activity, right? Not because they found it themselves. Um, and, and you know, it's a pretty big company, let's just say 5,000 plus actual point of sale systems. Um, the clients, any virus never detected anything, uh, but the, the client themselves did detect a, a system 
um, that was beaconing out to uh, you know, some C2 traffic, command and control traffic, um, and it just came from the one system. But the client wasn't able to identify any single process that looked malicious, nothing seemed out of place. So as an incident responder, um, what do you do from here? What, you know, how do you figure out what's going on next? Uh, so, you know, the first thing you want to do, you know, as you dive into that single system is identify what, what's that C2 traffic, what's originating, uh, what process is that coming from? So you look at running processes. Didn't see anything weird there. You look at network connections. Um, you look at antivirus logs, but like I said, AV logs did not detect anything. AV didn't detect anything. You look at evidence of execution, kind of the typical uh, incident response um, uh, forensic artifacts that would tell you, hey, this is, this is executing here, prefetch, shimcache, shimcache. In this case, uh, you, we didn't see anything. Uh, you could look at uh, process creation logs. If you have process auditing turned on, that didn't show us anything either. And the, the client didn't have any sort of EDR or no advanced logging at all. And from a persistent point of view, where would we look on that system normally to say, hey, you know, this malware is, is running and, and this is why it keeps coming up back in, you know, time and time again. Run keys, startup keys, scheduled tasks, window services, oh, those are all like the standard places you check. And diving even further in, you know, DLL, DLL search order hijacking, DLL injection, file path modification, WMI persistence, not, none of this stuff uh, you know, resulted in us finding any malware. So that's where the application compatibility infrastructure comes in. And I didn't know about this until I came to Mandiant and um, actually got to see this stuff firsthand because, you know, I was a SOC analyst. I thought I knew a good bit about malware and where it hides, but I clearly didn't. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the ACI basically is a system that uh, resolves application compatibility issues with the Windows code base. So one of the reasons uh, Microsoft's been so successful over the years is because um, stuff, I mean, applications that were designed for Windows XP can still be run on Windows 10 in a lot of cases. And a large part of that is because of the ACI. So um, just to get a little bit of terminology out of the way, uh, a shim is basically an alternative piece of code that's injected into a process, okay? And a fix is a single change that that shim, um, you know, configures differently uh, through that process injection. And then a mode, it would be a, like a bundle of changes. For example, if you want to take uh, a Windows XP design application and then have it run in Windows 10, it's going to take quite a few changes to, to, to enable it to run properly. So that would take a, like a mode. Uh, uh, so shims are stored in databases or SDB files, and you see the, the default Windows ones up there uh, listed. And those are the ones that come with Windows right out of the box, and uh, we've yet to see an attacker modify those. But that does not mean it's, it's not possible. Um, but we have seen them utilize custom SDB files, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about soon. So that the shimming process um, begins when a, the parent process uh, actually starts creating the child process. Uh, and the parent process checks a couple registry locations to see if that process should be shimmed. If the answer is yes, then the child process verifies that. Um, and then the uh, child process will parse uh, the SDB file that's that referenced in, in the registry and then the shim engine will hook the import address table uh, with that shim. So the import address table, I'm sure some of you know this, uh, is basically like a, a table within a process that, that has all the functions that it needs to import from Windows in order to work, and then the DLLs it will, will use to, to import those functions. Well, what a shim does is it kind of intercepts it. It sits between the import address table and Windows to intercept and manipulate those Windows API calls, and it can manipulate basically like what the uh, application, what the process running like thinks it's getting back from Windows. So legitimate shim uses, um, one is Microsoft fix-it patches. 
those are no longer supported in Windows 10, but basically what they did do was uh, if a patch came out, but you couldn't, uh, didn't, you couldn't wait until uh, Patch Tuesday, uh, but you wanted to go ahead and patch for that, that particular uh, vulnerability, then Microsoft had fixed the patches that you could um, you know, patch ahead of time before uh, Patch Tuesday. And what it would do, it would inject into the process and then patch just that particular place in memory, not on the binary on disk, but in memory to, you know, to change it however Microsoft intended. Uh, another use was uh, Emmet, which was also end of life last year. It would um, use a, a shim to inject the Emmet DLL and then enhance the uh, security features of that running process. For example, you'll see a fix right there, a set process, DEPP, which would actually turn on uh, uh, DEP to um, basically protect the process from process injection. Um, shims are also really common in third-party software, like com really common for the video game industry because, you know, if you did create a game that came out for Windows 7 but you want it to run on Windows 10, like you, you're, you're invested enough, you're going to create a shim to make sure it works. Also, if, uh, if you go to your grandparents' house and somehow they're still running AOL, you can probably think a shim. Um, here's one I pulled off of a Windows 7 machine for AOL setup.exe. And you see at the top, that's the actual name of the shim. Um, towards the middle, you see uh, the section that says matching file. And that's actually the filter that um, is used to determine if uh, that particular process should be shimmed. So you can use filters as wide open as uh, just going off of a company name, or you could, uh, like, there's so many options for different filters, it doesn't have to be that specific. You don't have to say, I want to only shim processes with this name. Like, you could just go off of a vendor name, or you can get, that's kind of interesting, and, and I think there's ways that could be interestingly used. And towards the bottom, you see um, on the shim section where it says win XP SP2 version lie. Basically, uh, this shim is designed to lie to AOL setup to tell it uh, that it's using a particular version of Windows XP, even though we're talking about a Windows 7 box. So, shim registration and installation. Um, stbinst.exe is the default shim installer that comes with Windows. You see it when a uh, shim is registered, it uh, uh, is registered at those two uh, registry keys. Um, SDB inst also copies the SDB, your custom SDB file, to one of these two file locations, depending on if it's 32 bit or 64 bit. And then uh, it will also add the application name, the shim name, uh, to the add or remove programs. Um, and then also, the modification of those two uh, registry keys requires admin rights. Um, SDB Explorer, which we'll talk about later, actually doesn't add to the add or remove program section of the control panel and doesn't copy um, the SDB to the default custom SDB location, which is uh, pretty good to know, pretty important if, if you're trying to use this uh, offensively yourself. And then anyone can build a custom installer that just uh, modifies those two registry keys manually. So let's get back to our FIN7 case, case of the missing Carbonac. Um, so as the Manning consultants got on site and, and started timelining this box, um, they saw that a custom Base64 encoded PowerShell script had been executed. Um, and that around the same time they saw this, um, this SDB E376.tmp um, file had been created. Um, and then you can see from the little snippet here of that, of that PowerShell script that um, SDB inst had been used. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, so upon execution of the script, uh, the following changes were made to the system. This is kind of how like, you would see it if you were timelining a system, just one at a time, right? So you see um, uh, a shim was registered, which shimmed to services.exe. You can see that's the standard registry location. Um, again, another. Uh, you can see the GUID that represents the uh, SDB file, the custom SDB file uh, is registered there. And then there's the actual custom SDB that matches that GUID. 
And then here we have a mystery registry key. So let's take a look at that uh, STB file parsed out. So you can see at the top, um, there's a Microsoft KB number. So that Microsoft KB just does not actually exist. It's pretty ingenious. It looks real. If I saw that anywhere, I'd think, oh yeah, sure, that's a vulnerability. I knew that. Uh, but it's not real. <clears throat> um, you see that uh, there's a section there called patch. And we'll talk about that more in a second. But this shim doesn't actually have a fix. It has a patch, like Microsoft Fix-It patches do. And then again, as we move down, you can see uh, services.exe is the target, company names of Microsoft. Um, so let's take a look at that patch. Um, you can see the module name services.exe, the RVA, which is the relative virtual address. You can see that listed. That's the actual point in that process is memory space that will get patched. That's the starting point, and that's important here in a second. And then you can see in the actual contents of this patch how that weird registry key is referenced. So what happened here? When, what, what would happen when that, that shim we just saw get installed? What would happen when, when services.exe actually starts up? Well, we see that that RVA that we just referenced in the patch uh, is actually the, the uh, point in memory where the, the function SC register TCP endpoint exists. What, that, what happened with that patch is it completely overwrote that function. This is the stage one shell code that, that wrote over that function completely. Um, so all that stage one shell code really did though was reference that registry key that I had mentioned. And it uh, pulled down additional shellcode, stage two shellcode, uh, and loaded that in memory. Well, contained in that stage two shellcode was um, a, a bit, uh, some compressed data that doesn't look recognizable in the, this moment, and then um, some instructions uh, to decompress it using uh, the RTL decompressed buffer API call. So what happened when we decompressed that uh, stage two shellcode that was compressed? You know, it expanded, of course. What was that? That's the Carbonac DLO. But we, didn't, we don't stop there. Um, after that occurs, that Carbonac DLL is, is, is expanded and loaded in the memory. Uh, services.exe takes a, a little, little nap and then spawns SVC host.exe with Carbonac DLL fully loaded and ready to go. And that was the malware that was actually beaconing out to that C2 uh, C2 server the whole time. But if you looked at the running processes of this system, would you suspect, just, just purely uh, not knowing anything else, that SVC host, that, that's what was doing it? No, you wouldn't. So a quick look at that, the contents of that registry key. I mean, you can see towards the bottom there that it says what decompress buffer. Um, and then the copyright at the top, it's just a bit suspicious. And then again, you can actually see in the control panel in the add remove program section, that KB is actually right there, where you could uninstall it from right there if you wanted to. But who would look at that on its own and think, yeah, that's bad? I wouldn't. So just to recap, um, you know, as services.exe is loaded, uh, its parent process checks to see if this process should be shimmed. The answer is yes. It sees that it, it references the good and the, the actual shim database that, that is to be loaded. Uh, the first stage uh, shell code is, is injected into services.exe from that, uh, that, and that shell code is actually stored within that SDB file. And then it then loads the second stage from that uh, registry key, um, decompresses it, takes a little, little sleep, and then boom, that's, uh, that's our malware. So Carbonac capabilities, um, fully functional, backdoor, over 40 different commands. Um, something interesting about that disk, desk, desktop video recording is that it used a custom um, codec um, that had to be reverse engineered by uh, FireEye reverse engineers um, so that we could actually watch some video that we had captured from Fin7. Not sure how we got a hold of that, but um, they were actually able to watch Fin7's own people uh, like testing Car Carbonac out or, or something like that. But they'd been recording themselves and we got a hold of it. 
So in this same engagement, uh, this same method of persistence was used uh, for Fin7's point of sale malware, which is called Pillow Mint. Uh, Pillow Mint's used to scrape card data right out of memory, um, but it also has some uh, backdoor functionality, uh, you know, can communicate via C2, uh, download additional executables, stuff like that. But instead of being stored in um, DRM4, that registry key, like Carbonac was, this was stored in DRM2, which also begs the question, is there a DRM1? Is there a three? Are we missing something? Anyway. So what else can shims do? This was just one example. Um, these are a, a bunch of different fixes that are just, uh, were created by Microsoft for, for legitimate purposes, but um, can obviously be misused. So inject DLL, it literally just enables you to inject a DLL, no questions asked. Um, redirect DXC allows you to, to just, you know, if you click on an uh, uh, executable, um, but it has this, shim, this fix, um, it'll just redirect and execute whatever one is the shim is designed to execute. No, again, no questions asked. Uh, virtual registry does something very similar with registry, just pointing to a different key. And then you see disable Windows Defender. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Um, also, some weird ones in there. Red pill. I don't know what that means. Kind of, uh, I don't know, metaphorical. Alien versus predator. I'm, I'm curious about that. Like, what, what does that do, Microsoft? <laughs> Probably, but I'd like to think it's, it's not. <laughs> it's some secret code. I don't know. So uh, other examples in the wild. One is red salt. Um, so red salt is um, a backdoor used by the platinum group. Not much is known about the platinum group because they're extremely uh, stealthy, great OPSEC. Um, and so they've been around since 2009, but we know nearly nothing about them. I, well, I'm sure people know things about them. I don't know much about them, but that might be my fault. Um, but mostly they've been active, I think, in Southeast Asia, targeting uh, nations. Uh, but uh, Red Salt maintains uh, persistence via shimming Cisco VPN.exe. At least that was the case in, in one particular uh, engagement many consultants were in recently. And it used that inject DLL uh, fix to load one DLL, which is heavily obfuscated. Um, but that, ref that then uh, loaded a second DLL, which you know, within the resources in the header PE header had a um, packed an encrypted payload, which that second DLL then decrypted, and that was Red Salt. So how those consultants were able to figure out what was going on was by looking at the event logs, and you can see right here, this is the, I think, the application telemetry event log. Um, you can see Cisco VPN.exe is right there, and it actually tells you the fix, inject DLL. And via that event log, they were able to trace down all of these uh, malicious DLLs, which I think are like really well, uh, really well hidden. Like, I don't know, genius, but I wouldn't have guessed, right? Another example uh, is Black Energy 2, which is kind of near and dear to my heart since I was in the energy industry. And Black Energy is, is, uh, was used during the 2015 Ukraine power grid attack. Um, it used shims at two different times. Uh, first was upon installation. If the user was not an admin, it um, shimmed uh, SND vol.exe, which controls volume, but it also auto elevates upon execution. And uh, it was able to shim that with a redirect exe fix in order to do a UAC bypass. Um, and then it also used a disable NX show UI fix uh, to disable uh, data execution prevention, DEP, which I mentioned earlier. So this would not be a, a legitimate conference talk if I didn't mention the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, so here we go. But uh, yeah, application shimming right there. If, if, if you didn't believe me that this is a real, a real thing, then um, please believe MITRE. So the application compatibility toolkit, this is a, a a two-minute download from Microsoft.com. It's their uh, proprietary software to handle, like create and install SDB files with a GUI. And it uses that native installer, SDB inst, 
to do its uh, actual installation. Um, and because of that, it does copy STB files to the default location, and it does add the shim name to the control panel. So I'm going to do a, just a really quick demo um, just so you can see how easy that is to use the application compatibility toolkit um, that even I could do it. So this is it loaded up. Um, we're going to create a new database and then create a new application fix within that database. We're going to call the, well, we're going to say that we're going to fix AOL. We're going to say that that's our target. But in reality, we're going to shim putty. So this, this is, oh, small. Uh oh. Mm. I don't know what I can do about that. I'll just try and narrate it, I guess. But uh, anyway, we're going to choose uh, inject DLL as a fix. It's just listed there in a whole bunch of different fixes that are available. And then um, we're actually going to tell it what DLL to inject uh, with this shim. And that is uh, shell.dll, which you'll see is on my desktop down there. And that's just a interpreter reverse shell in DLL form, but shell code. So I'm going to save that, um, save that database, call it AOL. And then we're actually going to install it via command line just for, just to demonstrate. You could also just hit the install button via the GUI. And then we're going to go take a look at the registry um, just to see what it did. And I apologize that you can't really see it very clearly, but um, basically you see the database description is, is AOL, and then you see that the database path does indicate that uh, the actual SDB file we created was copied to that, that app patch custom folder. And uh, yep, just to confirm that it's there. And a quick look at the control panel. And you see AOL is listed there. So if you used AOL, that would look pretty normal. And then we'll just go ahead and uh, start up Putty and then switch over to the Kali box I have running and you see this session started and uh, that's our box. So again, so easy. Uh, noob IR person can do it. Not, I'm not, I uh, have no offensive background, so. Uh, anyway, I mentioned this earlier, SDB Explorer, uh, another command line tool you can use to create, install, and analyze SDB files. Doesn't copy to the uh, SDB folder. Doesn't add to the add remove program list. Um, but I did have a demo of that as well, but we'll, we'll skip that for time's sake and, and because uh, the, it was hard to read up there. So uh, hardening against shim abuse. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do. Um, so you can disable the shim engine via group policy, but that's a pretty bad idea generally because Windows is designed for it to be on and eventually things will start breaking if, if they don't immediately. Because, um, yeah, the, things are shimmed, uh, you know, every time you turn your computer on, you just, you just don't know it. Um, you can change, you know, to bypass, to, to, to harden against the UAC bypass, you could change the UAC settings to always notify. That's super annoying. I don't think anyone's going to do that. Uh, run Windows 10, please. Uh, the patching shim doesn't actually work in Windows 10, and the uh, UAC bypass doesn't work. Um, and then they, Microsoft did release this KB uh, specifically addressing that UAC issue, but the, it's an optional patch. So if you're running Windows, you know, eight or, or, or previous, and you probably don't have that installed. 
Suffice to say here, though, you know, there's there's not a lot you can do to, from a hardening standpoint. Like it's just it's built into Windows. There's no like central management system for shims. There's there's not a lot you can do. Um, one uh, idea that was discussed by Willie Ballantin, um, colleague of mine out of Denver, and then John Tomzak at BrewCon in uh, 2015. Um, so hashes of SDBs files tend to be unique. You know, I had a test set of SDBs from 500 hosts. There were like 2,000 some unique hashes out of them. Um, but the individual shims within those shim databases uh, are not unique. Um, and so those can be hashed and compared to others. And then you can also, you know, you can use that same idea to actually build like a gold image SDB file and deploy that out to your whole network, your whole, your whole system, all your systems. Uh, and the idea would be you could whitelist those gold images and then watch for additional changes. But, you know, this, is, this would be pretty hard to pull off, I think. You know, most organizations can't get asset management right. Why would they be getting shim database management right? Yeah. I wouldn't expect that to, to, to catch on, but I, I think it is very interesting uh, concept and one of the few ways you can think to actually maybe get get your hands around this problem. So detecting malicious shims, you, you know, monitor SDB and set exe using you know event logs, EDR, sysmon logs. Um, look for other known SDB installers, etc. You can monitor uh, those two specific registry keys that would get modified uh, during installation. You could alert and inspect all custom SDBs. Custom SDBs in my test set made up roughly 10% of all shim databases. That's not, you know, that, that could still be a lot depending on the size of your network, but it's still a lot more manageable considering that um, up till now we've not seen an attacker, uh, you know, reconfigure a Windows default shim database. And then again, as mentioned earlier, you can use the program telemetry event log to, um, or you can monitor that, uh, which is what I did in my little test bed. 500 hosts, roughly 170,000 events I was able to extract out of them. Um, filtering down by the fixed name is when things got interesting. Uh, out of all those events, there were only 774 events uh, that used that inject DLL fix and only three applications that actually caused those events to occur. Disable NX, which disables DEP, uh, had zero events. Run as admin had 50 applications. You know, it's still more manageable. And then redirect EXC only had two events, and I'm pretty sure this is actually a Drydex infection because Drydex used um, that UAC bypass, uh, and that's the actual event log right there that you see. Is, is, it's just right in line with what you'd expect from a Drydex uh, UAC bypass. Got to do a little more digging to confirm that, but... So hunting for malicious shims, it's probably going to require you to acquire all those SDB files and then parse them. Um, I mentioned Willie Ballantin earlier. He created python-sdb. Um, it's a set of scripts that, that is what I used and has, has um, been pretty helpful for me throughout this process. Um, a lot of different avenues you can go, go through to actually hunt for these malicious SCBs. I already mentioned custom SCBs only being about 10% of all SCB files. Uh, so that helps right there. Uh, you can look at fixed name, executable file name, like what the app, what the SDB says it's, it's shimming, vendor name, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is the same list I showed you earlier. These are all worth your time to look at and say, what is, what is using inject DLL? Like, what is using disable Windows Defender? Because if the answer is you know, anything but you know, zero, then it's, it's worth your time to look at. So in my little test bed, I did just that. I looked at inject DLL first, custom SCBs using inject DLL. There were like 15. And the first one I looked at was, was this. Um, so search protect by conduit is like a, like a potentially unwanted program, you know, pup. Um, but, and so it's, it's a commodity, you know, adware type of thing, uh, but it's using a shim to inject its DLL into Chrome, Explorer, Firefox, Internet Explorer, 
software removal tool and software reporter tool. Uh, and what it does is um, it actually, in those browsers, prevents you from changing the home page, prevents you from uninstalling search or, uh, conduits, other applications, because they make a lot of different like unwanted toolbars that get bundled with other things. Uh, and then by injecting into like software removal tool, it, it, it tries to prevent you from uninstalling its other uh, products. It's, it's, it's kind of ingenious. Uh, it's an ingenious way to uh, accomplish this. Um, something that I currently, own, a, a TTP that, that I currently only associate with like advanced commodity malware or, or like targeted malware, it's just being used like for this stuff. So uh, worst case scenario, like what, what, what are we preparing for uh, by detecting and hunting this stuff? Um, if an attacker was actually able to modify sysmain.sdb, which already contains hundreds, thousands of shims, um, if, it, if, if an attacker could insert a new malicious shim in there, like that's going to be really hard to, to, to uh, find. Um, I... On my 500 host test set, you know, it took me like a full day to parse those. It was kind of ridiculous to think that you might have to do that, something like that, to, to parse um, each and every default Windows shim database. Uh, that's kind of scary. And there, uh, there are, I've seen a, a project on GitHub that basically says it can do that, but I haven't tested it. <clears throat> but we're pretty sure uh, that ability is coming or has already been developed. Uh, we just haven't seen it yet. Um, and then, again, this, you know, Fin7's already done this, but if, if you combine that altering since main.scb with the fact that you could have a shim that contains, you know, Metasploit shellcode right in the shim, and then it persistently, every time you boot your computer, just automatically executes out of a legit uh, process, that's pretty scary. Um, I think, you know, I've only worked at Mandiant for eight or nine months now, but almost every engagement I'm on, pretty, pretty much attackers are just using the standard stuff, you know, Windows services, scheduled tasks, run keys, because they, uh, that's all they need to do, you know. Uh, but if it becomes that easy for an attacker to use this, that's, that's relatively hard to detect, like that's, I think that's pretty terrifying. <clears throat> so recommendations, I mean, there's only so much you can do, uh, unfortunately, but patch, I mean, run Windows 10, patch for that UAC bypass. Um, I mean, it's just good advice always. Um, local admin hygiene, so installing an STV does require administrator level privileges. The harder you make it for an attacker to get those, those privileges, you know, the better off you are. Again, just general good advice. And then threat modeling. What I mean by that is that this is all scary stuff, but uh, this shouldn't be your number one priority if you can't detect those other things yet. If you can't detect a new scheduled task that um, or a Windows service associated you know, that, that's obviously like Metasploit or Cobalt Strike. Like, um, and you know, my previous employer, you know, we weren't detecting this yet. So I'm not saying you should all be there already, but it's something to work towards, right? <clears throat> And then uh, detect what you can. Like I said, I pointed out some things that shouldn't be too hard to detect if you're collecting event logs, if you have the ability to monitor for registry changes. Um, test those detections uh, like thoroughly. Uh, try to break them, try to get around them, and then hunt what you can't detect. And there'll be a lot you probably can't detect and that you'll have to hunt for. And, and again, maybe you can't do that right away, but it's something to, to think about. So quick summary. Clearly, uh, both targeted and commodity threats are abusing the ACI shims. It's not just targeted malware. It's not just APTs or fin groups. Um, and it's not either, on the other end, it's not just adware. Like, uh, it's the whole spectrum. Uh, and usage of this technique is going to increase over time, I suspect, uh, as more organizations get better at detecting the other stuff. Um, at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. There's really no perfect situation here. There's no perfect way to harden against this. 
there's no de perfect detection. So um, that, that, that sh but that shouldn't deter you from uh, doing what you can to make it harder for attackers to use this technique. So wrapping up, um, special thanks to Willie Ballantin uh, and then my boss, Phil Keeley, and my wife for putting up with me the last month as I prepared for this. Thank you. So any questions? I'm not a reverse engineer, so keep your questions easy. Um, my question, uh, if I'm getting this right or not, mm -hmm. I just want to double check. So my observation from this is that basically any DLL or shell code probably injected into process by using, using this shim technique mm -hmm. is currently not detected by AV solutions. Is that right? <sighs> and if it is, then I just want to like kind of brainstorm here why, mm -hmm. like is it because the AV products are actually trusting the process mm -hmm. and if the process is legitimate so we don't really care what is important? I important. think that, I do think that AVs have trouble parsing shim databases and in detecting shell code that's actually within the shim itself. In my examples, where I actually just had the DLL sitting on the desktop, you know, it's gonna detect that. So if, you're, if it's relying on, um, if the shim is relying on something on disk, besides the shim itself, you know, that very well could be detected. But in the case of Carbonac, I don't think anyone was detecting that at the time because the actual DLL was stored in the registry, you know, and I don't know. Depends. Uh, so, the chip, so it's already on the system, it will modify their database. Process to crash. I don't believe so because you know it's already been patched. It's already been injected into, and. Um, but I thought it was loaded into the process when it starts. Right, it's in memory. So you so the registry points to a database, but you've modified the database later to not actually have their code. Process starts, launches, it follows the route to the database and gets invalid information. What would happen to the process? Hmm, good question. I don't know. And uh, I've yet to ex encounter that. And, uh, but my assumption would be that nothing would happen because you know, what was in that shim database, that the actual shim itself was already injected into the running process. But I don't know, good question. Is that it? All right. Thank you.
Wow. Well, uh, thank you everyone for coming, sticking around to the last talk of the day. Um, I'm sorry that you were misguided enough to end up in this one. <laughs> so, um, this is missing the forest for the trees when server hardening isn't enough. I hope it's clear enough that this is not a server hardening talk, that this is, um, well, a lot of other things. But um, a little about me, I do the boring side of cyber. I deal with GRC, so all I'm doing is government regulatory compliance. For military aerospace, I do a lot of checking boxes, a lot of reminding people to close port 3389 all the freaking time <laughs> that it's, it's you have a VPN like why but no uh, we'll get there in a second um, <laughs> um, so you you'll see right here my uh, there's a hashtag for this talk and then there is uh, my Twitter handle and I'm gonna get to right now why I have a hashtag um, my soapbox for a second uh, me, I would get great questions from all of you, but what I have seen is that uh, women, or pretty much anyone who doesn't look like me, typically gets a lot of, but have you thought of this? If they thought of it, then they would have put it in the talk. So, um, kind of out of solidarity, I, I chose not to do questions. Tweet me, subtweet me, shit post me, I don't care, but I'm not gonna be offering questions now. In the same vein, if there's a, if I talk too fast, if there's an acronym or concept you don't understand, um, I want this to be inclusive. I want people to understand what I'm talking about. So you can tweet me, I can answer it later. You can heckle me, you can yell out, elaborate, explain yourself, idiot. I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, no one takes me up on that, which I know is not because I explain myself well. Um, so goals. What I want people to get out of this talk, um, show red teamers, blue team concepts. Um, I think there's a little too much of a divide between those sides. I mean, we all care about security. Why is it? It's a, it's a stupid divide. Um, we all agree with that, I'm sure. Um, and then, this is an interesting one for me. Show blue teamers, red team concepts. I am diehard blue team because I, I don't do any of the pen testing, but I actually, for this talk, I made an exception. I installed Kali, and I'm going to have some red team demos. Um, for you red teamers, it's gonna be embarrassing, but what I wanna show through this talk is there are some things out there that are way too easy to do, and us as blue teamers just don't realize, like the way gaping holes that are in our environment. We, we have no freaking clue, and it's just, it's embarrassing. Um, I wanna demonstrate how not to threat model, hopefully also how to threat model, but um, I think we as an industry are notoriously and just dangerously, criminally bad at threat modeling. Um, so I wanna hopefully fix that a little bit. I'll explain threat modeling um, as I see it and also blue teaming and red teaming as I see it in the next slide. I'm gonna help you convince management of some things. Um, honestly, part of why I did this is because I just wanna show management this talk and be like, look how easy it was for me to do this. Now listen to me, idiot. Um, I, I, I wanna make it easier so you don't have to learn these, these things. Um, and then make your job easier through all of these things. Um, I wanna give you some pathways in my mind to think of security concepts a little easier. Yes, I'm trying to put way too much into 50 minutes, but um, we'll see. So, hardening basics. I already said that this is not a hardening talk, but if I'm gonna talk about when, how you can miss things with hardening, I really need to, um, talk about hardening for a second. There's a little bit of satire here, but the reality is this is what it comes down to. Principle of least privilege is that an account shouldn't be able to do anything that account shouldn't be able to do. Yes, um, it sounds silly, but it really is. If user only needs to get X file, he shouldn't be able to get Y file. It's that simple. Machine, if this machine is a file server, it does not need to have 
IIS installed, it doesn't need to be answering on port 80 or port, port 3 if all it's doing is SMB. Um, talking about SMB, don't use SMB 1 or 2. Encrypt all the things and patch all the things. I mean, this is hardened, uh, there's STIGs, there's all those things, I'm not getting into that, but what I'm talking, this is what hardening comes down to. You shouldn't be able to do something you shouldn't be able to do. Boom. <laughs> Um, so I, I promised that I would talk, oh, is that enough? No, obviously if I thought that everything in that talk, in that slide was enough, I wouldn't be doing this talk and you'd all be happier. But, no, it isn't, I answered my question. I'm gonna give a quick caveat before I get into the fun stuff. There are obviously a lot of other things than server hardening. I'm not gonna talk about every single thing you need to do for security, but what I'm really talking about here is how we can get so myopic, how we can get so focused on one thing, on one exploit, on one task, that suddenly we miss, that an attacker would never even do that because they don't have to. So I'm gonna try and get you as a blue teamer to think a little more like a red teamer here and hopefully vice versa. Um, so I'm not talking about any of those things, duh. Um, I'm gonna be talking about hypervisor misconfigurations for the most part, and I'm gonna be talking about how you can use those misconfigurations to get an active directory. But as I go, I really want to focus on, this isn't just an active directory in an ESX talk. This is a threat modeling talk. This is a how we can set our priorities right talk. And it, so if you don't use active directory, don't just tune out. There's something interesting here. I don't promise that, I just hope there is. So, threat modeling, I promised I'd talk about that for a second. So, it, it is basic threat modeling is know what you're protecting and know what you're protecting against. Uh, I wanna back up for one second. Um, if you follow, if you look at the hashtag, you follow me on Twitter, or you go to my, um, my website, you will see the slides. So if you're fervently just writing down what's here, it may be easier for you to get the slides there. It may not do, do what helps you, but just wanted to remind you that I will have a link to the slides at the end and you can also find them on Twitter. So know what you're protecting, what you're protecting against. Very important. Um, always be thinking about that. Don't just say, oh no, Meltdown Inspector. I'm gonna protect against this. Think, how would an attacker actually use this against me? And why do I care? What would they try and get with that? So the defender's dilemma, as it traditionally stands, is that an attacker only needs to exploit one weakness, but a defender needs to protect all weaknesses. I almost see it to you're, you're in a boat, and for you to sink, you only need one big hole, but as a defender, we need to be plugging all of them with only limited fingers. We're gonna sink. I, I really think that that's a flawed way of looking at defense. Um, now, if you're Google, if you're a huge company, that might be different. I deal with a lot of small and medium businesses. Um, our, the largest company I deal with is about 8,000 8, people. That's smaller than a lot of what you guys are talking about, so take this with a grain of salt. But I like to think that we should think of the attacker's dilemma. The reality is that a defender only needs to make it too expensive for an attacker to exploit a target given the value of that target. We don't need to close every single hole. We just need to close all the holes that the person's gonna use. We, you know, we, we don't have to be thinking all the time about all these complicated MFA bypass methods because the reality is a lot of the, the boxes that we're protecting, someone's gonna say, oh, let me try and do it. Oh, they have MFA, let me skip that box. They're probably gonna move on to the one that you didn't put MFA on because they're there, they really are. So, a defender needs to make it too expensive for an attacker to exploit a target given the value of that target. Um, and I say homebrewed sec, I say that I wrote that, the reality is a lot of people have said it in a different way, but I like, that. Th that's my own phrasing. Um, it's not a unique idea though. So red team demo, again I am not a pen tester. Um, and the point here is that it took me about three days to learn from installing Kali to learn how to do these things and it should not be that easy. So um, also, um, the slides are online. And I've already tested these and unfortunately a couple of them are a little uh, blurry given the, the screen, but. So, 
I'm going to start this one and then I'm going to explain it. So right here I have Nmap open. Now you can't even see it up there, but what I'm searching for is port 9440. Now the reason I'm searching for port 9440 in this network is that I Nutanix. I'm searching for Nutanix. This is one of the first things I do because a lot of small businesses are using it. It's a great product. The problem is if you're deploying something that has about 18 different passwords, you're not changing them all. You're especially not changing your ESX passwords. Um, I, I have a client that has um, oh, something stupid like 30 or 40 Nutanix boxes and um, they none of them none of them, they've changed the default ESX password. So now, oh look, they have Nutanix. I don't necessarily care, but what the IPs are, because now I'm gonna say, okay, let's see if they're using ESX as opposed to their native hypervisor, which is Acropolis or Hyper-V. Um, and this is really simple Nmap, it's just Nmap IP range P9440 open unprivileged. So let's see. And it only took 30 seconds to scan 255. Oh look, so I have a list of about eight ESX hosts. What can I do with that? Well, this is gonna be one of the most, the, the quickest demo slides. Let me go there. Let me log in with root in Nutanix 4 slash 40. It worked. That should not work. We know this. Um, we know we should change passwords, but yet, that worked, and I'm not a pen tester. I don't need to be a pen tester because we're leaving stupid things like this open, and I guarantee you in your environment have something stupid like that. We do. Um, so now, I'm gonna do something. Now, I'm, I, again, this you might think is basic, but we have a lot of customers that refuse to buy server 2016. They're still using domain controllers that are server 2008 R2. Fun. Um, it's really common in manufacturing because we don't want to spend the money to upgrade. So what I'm doing here, I'm going into ESX. I just attached an ISO. Um, you could use a lot of different tools. I use Pogo Stick. It essentially just allows me to edit the registry before boot. And what I'm gonna do, so I've attached that, I've set it to go into BIOS. And in here I've now pivoted to my, my test lab because I'm not just breaking things at a customer. So, um, Right there, I just re reset the server. And, and this is something that worked at a customer. I just didn't want to demo this there. So I'm going to move the CD drive up. So it boots first. Takes me a little bit to find the plus button. Found it. Now I'm going to restart. And I'm going to boot into Pogo Stick. Now, you could use the Windows Boot CD for this. Um, I find this easier. Um, I, and, and I have linked to this tool. But what I'm gonna do here is, um, a lot of people don't realize that it, Active Directory has a local admin password. It's called the Directory Services Restore Password. So, right now, I'm, I'm just going through and I'm going to um, default out that password so that there is, it's just blank. So now, yep, do I want to write? And it, it again, you can't do this in 2012, but again, there's a lot of, a, a lot of environments where this works. So now I've, that's taken a little while. You can't even see it. So now, with that, I'm going to boot into that directory services restore mode that I just mentioned. I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna edit the VM. VM options, I'm going to change the boot delay so I can actually hit F8 to go into to safe mode. And I'm hitting reset because instead of uh, restart because I can, it's my test lab, and also because I'm really impatient. So go down, directory services restore mode. And again, none of this should work. It does work. It does all the time, but this stuff should not work. Me as a non patent tester shouldn't be able to do this, but it's gonna boot. And I, I have a domain controller here that is gonna give, let me log into the local context, which is scary. Switch user dot backslash. 
oh look, <laughs> domain controller shouldn't do that. I don't know how to type administrator, so I correct it, log in. Preparing desktop, that's scary. So I'm gonna start up ADUC, Active Directory Users and Computers, and I'm going to establish persistence. I'm gonna put a little uh, nugget in here. Pwned, because why not? And then some nice guy is gonna see that in the logs. So now, let me get some passwords. So I, lo I log back in, now I'm using RDP. I'm going to use NTDS util to copy out the the uh, ntds.dit and also the system hive so that I can crack some passwords. So this is a small database so it takes about 30 seconds. B sides LV or no, B sides Vancouver here. Export, then I use WinSCP to, or I copy it out, then I use WinSCP to put it up in my Kali box. I go over here and, and um, Again, this isn't the point of it. I just want to show how easy it is, so I'm not demoing how to do this. There's a couple good, good resources for that. So ls, I just want to make sure I'm in the right directory. I have all the right files. Let's go into Active Directory folder, make sure I put ntds.dit in system. And ntds.dit holds all of, the, it's the Active Directory database. It holds all your usernames, all your password hashes. So now, secret stump. Output to passwords.hash in a large database. This would take, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. In mine, it takes about 30 seconds. Reading and decrypting hashes from AD, blah, blah, blah. Exports now. I'm going to go over to Hashcat. Um, and I'm running this in a VM so I don't get to use my, my GPU. So I do a couple things to speed this up, but it, it's gonna take again way quicker than it should. I type it wrong, <laughs> type it right. And it helps when you use the right file, but I included it anyways because it only added five seconds. So boom, um, now you probably, I don't know how well you can see that, but oh no, my password, you can see it. It says Hunter2. Now, how long, oh no, now everyone knows my password. The secret's out. Um, so why, why that demo in a threat modeling talk? Because the reality is me as a non pest and tester, I was able to get password hashes in 15 minutes using misconfigurations that I see all over the place. People pretend it doesn't exist. If you think it doesn't exist, then you probably don't have proper asset monitoring, um, and you don't. So um, lessons learned. This first one, I don't think enough people consider. Consider your hypervisor admins as administrators on every guest VM they can access. So true story, there is a customer we work with that only has one IT guy. Well, they have multiple shifts, so production needs to be supported. So regular IT guy gets in there at about 10, leaves at 6.30. So someone has to be there at 5 a.m. So some guy from quality is given domain admin, that's scary, but also is given, I think we've actually removed that, but they're, they're given full admin access on VMware, and why? Why do they have full admin access on VMware? Well for one big reason, and that's because if they have a power outage, they need to be able to start the VMs. You can auto start VMs. Do not give some guy from quality admin access, but now you have to treat him like a domain admin. He is a domain admin because he could do this. Now, said guy also happens to have um, a tool. Uh, I, we found a uh, folder on his desktop called hacking tools. Kind of scares me. That's a re real story. Um, change default passwords. Again, that is a real thing. <laughs> Segment your networks. I should not be able to find your hypervisor and your storage. I was just saying, I hope you explained to your customer that one IT guy never goes on vacation. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, that's bad too. Segregation of duties is very important. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of issues here, but 
again, I deal with small and medium businesses, so it's a little, little different of a threat model there, but yes, you can't really do vacations, which causes other issues. Change default passwords, segment your networks. Now, I, from VPN, should I be able to get to your storage nodes and your hypervisor? I shouldn't be able to see that. That would prevent it really freaking quick. Monitor privileged accounts. Um, you should notice the moment that something changes in your domain admins group or any privileged group. I don't care if that's the accounting group. You should know. You should be able to check that against a change request. And please upgrade your OSs. We know this. But hopefully someone uses this presentation, gives it to their CIO and says, use this. This is how we're going to get justification to upgrade our OS. There's a hundred other reasons to do it, but the fact that you can just zero out admin passwords in 2008 is, is, is my favorite reason. Um, and you can, and that's a feature, not a bug. Ugh. Um, so blue team demo. Um, and, and this, again, I'm not doing anything exhaustive. I'm just gonna show you some real quick things that could have prevented this aside from what I just mentioned. Um, really quick PowerShell to check all of your domain controllers in their last restart. Just, and, and again, the script is up there. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's just, I'm trying to show how easy this is. You don't have to have a SIM. You don't have to spend a million dollars on whatever Google just released, whatever their tool is, I forget. Um, but it has Splunk really scared. Um, <laughs> but this just says, hey, has active, has, have my domain controllers, anything in the domain controllers are you? Has it changed in the last day? If so, email me. That's not hard. I'll show you how to automate it in a second. Now this check AD group change. Check all, all what I consider the privilege group. There's a couple other you could add, but for brevity. Um, and just for each group, if it's changed, email me. Really easy. There's so many different things that you, you say, oh, we don't have logging, we don't have monitoring. You know, in a day, you could do most of what you want to do with your SIM with some PowerShell scripts. Now, email is not infallible, but it's something. Do it if you don't have the money. Do, heck, do it if you do. I mean, if you need to do these things as add-on because your SIM takes so long to load or isn't querying it right. Now, now, this is actually one of the most simple slides here, but what I really like about this is that everywhere you look online to s use task scheduler for a PowerShell scheduled task um, has for program and script, you have to go C, Windows, PowerShell, Power. If you just type PowerShell.exe and then your script, boom. It's so much easier than what Google tells you. I don't know why people want to make our jobs more difficult, but we, we're masochists. I know it. So that was really quick, but what lessons can we learn from that from the blue team side? Do not wait until you can afford product X, being a SIM or an EDR or some sort of logging tool. Do not wait until you have that to start monitoring. You do need monitoring. I don't care what you do. I don't care. You, you need to monitor something, and there are so many easier ways to monitor and cheaper ways. You don't have to write Python. You don't, PowerShell is a pretty easy language. I mean, get dash AD users. What does that script do? It gets users in AD. It's, it's, it's a very verbose, very understandable language. I don't want to minimize the skills needed in coding, but PowerShell is a scripting language, not a programming language. It's real easy to do. PowerShell is awesome. Automate your reporting. But I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm a little scared by the, the security automations, the, the, the trend towards that. Um, I don't do it. Um, be, in lo I have small enough environments, I don't have to. It, it always scares me, all of the uh, false positives that we could be automating and breaking certain things. So um, I say consider automating defense actions. Consider it carefully. Um, threat model and prioritize in everything you do. So always automate reporting. Never m make someone's first task of the day to go in and check, check, check. You can automate that. Come on, we need to use our resources effectively. We don't have enough of them. Let's not spread them thin. Use them for the things that you want to make sure are done right for defense actions. But automate your reporting. So um, I, I've, I've talked pretty, uh, pretty quickly here. Um, but 
I'm, I'm going to spend uh, spend a little more time on on <coughs> drilling drilling the point home for a moment. So we're almost done. Breathe. I've talked quick. I've given a decent amount of information. TLDR. Now I'm surprised how many people tend to not use Reddit um, and don't know that TLDR is too long didn't read. Um, you guys must. I don't know, be more professional. I don't know how you get by without using Reddit, but I do, so TLDR. Um, <laughs> do not focus on the trendy exploit of the day. The reality is, why is someone going to use Meltdown in your environment when they can get it on 3389? Or another true story about really poor threat modeling and really poor user education, walk into a customer site Say, I'm here to meet with the IT director, and I'm not a social engineer, but I intentionally say IT director and not dude's name, because I want to see how far I can go with this. They say, oh, he's in a meeting. I know he's in a meeting. I ran a little early. They're like, would you like me to sit you down in, a, in front of a computer? Yes, ma'am, please. I don't offer. I don't, I don't ask. She sits me down in front of a computer and says, would you like me to log you in? Yes, ma'am. Now, luckily, it was just it was an unprivileged account, but I'm I'm in on a Windows machine, um, in an environment, and that that happens way too often. I have too many situations where I'm sitting at someone's computer, and then someone next to them looks over, and says, "You're not John." I'm like, "I've been sitting here for 30 minutes. How did you even notice that I've been sitting here? I just stole all your company data." So, do not focus on trendy exploit of the day when. The easy thing's going to work. And then in the, in, it doesn't even have to be the trendy exploit of the day, but think threat model. Think about what the easiest way for an attacker is, is going to get something and go, attack, protect against that. We have a CISO who was just in, he came into an environment that just had never spent any money on IT, never spent any money on security, but now they cared because of government contracts. So now they have to be compliant. So the, this guy just keeps hounding on hard drive encryption, hard drive encryption, hard drive encryption. They don't have it anywhere. I'm like, that's, that's great, but there's like a hundred other things to do. And I'm like, so to me, if, you're, if your number one fear is hard drive encryption above, you know, segmenting your network or changing admin passwords or not making people local admins, then you tend to think that, that if you follow that down, that means how, are, how is someone going to exploit not having encrypted hard drives? They're going to steal a goddamn hard drive. That's the only, that's, you have to steal the hard drive. So then you would think that physical security is their number one fear. Then why, for example, at this particular customer, do they not lock the server room door? Well, they don't because two reasons. One, because the thermostat is on the other side of the wall. And, and if you close the door, it's going to overheat in there. Now, the IT guy used to be the maintenance guy, so he could have just moved. Heck, I could have punched a hole in the wall and dragged it to the other side, for that matter. But uh, So then, too, be, they didn't because the IT room that's on the other side needs to be left unlocked so that maintenance can take out the crash. Just put the stupid trash can on the other side of the wall. Like, But you're so afraid of, of, of hard drive en encryption. You, you're so afraid of theft. But no, he's not actually afraid of theft. Someone told him that you need to do hard drive encryption. He read it. He knows it's easy. But sure, it is easy. Sure, you can do it. But the reality is focus on what someone's actually going to do. Focus on threat modeling. Think. Don't just say, checkbox, cool, done. You, we, we have to think about things. We have to prioritize things. And like I said, we as an industry are really shitty about that. We as an industry are really good at saying, look at new trendy exploit. Why would I even use trendy exploit if I don't have to? So you have to think, what is the easiest way an attacker could exploit? Fill in the blank. I don't care what it is. If you're afraid of Meltdown Inspector, and you're afraid that people are going to get stuff from memory, then there's a 100 other ways they could get things from memory. Protect against those. And nine out of 10 times, protecting against fill in the blank, protecting against the other thing is going to be easier because protecting against Meltdown Inspector requires re-architecting the entire way that your systems work. It does. It's the nature of it. But protecting other kinds of 
uh, other kinds of memory exploits are much easier. So again, no one's going to use these things about against you because they don't have to. I really like what um, the last speaker was talking about because he's like, you know, the reality is in the wild, this exploit that I just told you about probably not going to be used because they don't need to. And attackers are smart. They have limited resources. We have to think like them. We have to be thinking, okay, what are they? <laughs> Well, they don't want to do, make their jobs more difficult. If they do, then yeah, but <laughs> um, focus on the difficult only once it's difficult to do the easy thing. That, that's, that's, I mean, a huge, a huge part of what I'm, what I'm talking about here. It's just, we, we, we need to be smart. We, we are smart, we're just not focusing. So um, once you, you just, this makes your, can make your job so much easier. And, and the reality is there, like I said, there's a hundred different ways to do what I've talked about. There's a hundred, hundred different ways to monitor. There's a hundred, uh, there's a million different things to monitor. Um, but just, just, you know, don't start focus, focusing on let's do every single, let's monitor against every single thing on MITRE when you're not even doing DNS logging. Like, let that be your first log you ingest. Don't think, how am I going to protect against every single thing on MITRE? Well, let's, let's calm down for a second. Like, um, so, um, like I said, I did talk much much faster than I should have. Um, but um, resources, um, there, there's a quick one on AD hardening. Um, the, this, uh, the second one is actually really interesting. Installing Kali on Windows subsystem for Linux, it's what I ended up doing. And it was, it was this really strange inception in that I've, I didn't realize you could do this, but I installed Kali on just from the Windows App Store, which was fascinating, um, really fascinating. And then I, um, I, t I, I installed Remote Desktop. Um, I forget which flavor. It's it's in in there. But then I opened up MSTSC. I opened up RDP and went to one two seven zero zero one port thirty three ninety, and I had just RDP'd to my own box. I didn't know you could do that. It was like the coolest thing I've ever done. I'm like, whoa. And then later I opened up SSH to this Kali box inside of my box. It's not a container. It's, it's kind of a container. It's Windows subsystem for Linux. So I just, I change it to a non-standard port. I go 2222 and I, I used WinSCP to, from my Windows box to get into my Windows box. It just blows my mind. Um, it, it, and then um, this, the, the next one here, um, the uh, offline windows and registry, uh, password and registry editor, pogo stick, there's, you can use the windows boot CD, but this one's really cool. Um, it's just easy, it's lightweight. Um, and I, I know we want to live off of the land, but I'm not a pen tester. There's probably, you could probably tell me a hundred ways I could have done what I did easier. It was still way too easy. Um, this one, I just ran into this talk at um, B-Side San Francisco, Dale Meredith, um, building a mobile pen testing box. It's really, really funny there because he, um, the EC council was selling their like advanced pen testing box for some stupid amount of money and he's like, oh no. And he went down through Amazon and figured out what it would cost to make the same exact thing for like 120 bucks and they're selling it for like $800 <laughs> with no extra features. So that's really fascinating. Um, and it has a touch screen and a keyboard and it's really small for like 120 bucks, which is, uh, the, the, I, I loved that. And there's a bunch of Batman puns in there, which was awesome. Um, and then auditing Active Directory passwords so that you don't have to just download my slides and copy what I'm doing. Um, you can see exactly what I copied. Um, and the whole point with that demo was that it shouldn't be so easy. Um, maybe that's what I should call the talk. Don't make it easier than you have to, dumbass. Oops, um, and then cover photo, just want to give credit there. So, 
there. Um, like I said, if you want to subtweet me, you want to shit post, you want to do whatever, you want to say, why'd you just waste 45 minutes of my time, there's my Twitter handle. And um, you can find the slides, homebrewed sec, homebrewed sec, short for homebrewedsecurity.com forward slash talks, or uh, you can go Twitter, you could probably find a hundred different ways to get there. And um, thank you everyone for uh, sticking through. Have fun at the party.